We're going to get started. It's 9 o'clock. Uh, Mr. Wright is going to start as soon as I tell you one thing I forgot to tell you a moment ago. If you need Wi-Fi, the code is on your table centerpiece. And now, without further ado, Mr. Wright. Thank you. See, uh, Lav Lavalier work all right? Everybody can hear me? Uh, I'm not very tech literate, so I'm always glad to have someone who uh, knows how to do this. About 15, 16 years ago, uh, my wife and I started to, to worry about what we needed to do for our daughter when she aged out of school at her, at her 21st birthday. She was just entering high school. And uh, we very quickly found an elder law attorney that could help us draft the legal documents, will, special needs, trust. And I got to admit, being embarrassed to it, uh, at the fact that it took us 15 years to do that elementary step as parents of a special needs child. But we went searching for a financial planner that could help us plan for our daughter's future, and we couldn't find any. And many years later, I realized the reason we couldn't find any was because in Colorado there were none. So I was a mid-level executive with an aerospace company. I have a, uh, an engineering degree. And one day, um, I was reading Wall Street Journal and saw an article that said that there is a scarcity of certified financial planners that work with families that have someone with a disability, which I knew. And the light bulb went on, and I thought, oh my gosh, this is so obvious. So I walked in, work, and quit, and started a financial planning practice with the intent to focus almost exclusively on special needs families. So I went, uh, as I was starting my practice, uh, I went to the College of Financial Planning, realized there was no educational curriculum uh, for special needs financial planning. And as I became, you know, uh, a practitioner in the business, looking around, I found there was no training I could turn to. The only training that seemed to exist was two insurance companies, MetLife and Mass Mutual, trained a small portion of their uh, agents into the very basics of um, special needs planning. I also found that there was no common definition of special needs planning. It was one thing to an attorney. It was something different to a life insurance agent. It was something different to a special ed teacher or a social worker. And so I, I found that myself facing a situation with a fragmented and disconnected disability services system that was like putting together a jigsaw puzzle without the picture on the box. It was worse because not only did you not have a guide in how to put the puzzle together, you had to go on a scavenger hunt for puzzle pieces. And when you got home, you found some of the pieces were missing, some didn't fit, and every now and then someone came by and took a couple of them away. And so I began to, as an engineer, and I'm used to thinking systematically, and I'm used to thinking in terms of risk reduction, which is crucial for our children, how do you do special needs planning? I was baffled by the fact, uh, where did I put the little clicker? I was baffled by the fact that there were no financial planners that worked in this space. By the way, that has changed in the last 12, 13 years, but it's changing very slowly and it's not changing fast enough. Because there's uh, 40 million people in the US with a significant disability. And a significant disability means that the disability is significant enough to affect health, quality of life, or independence. 40 million people. There are five million with intellectual disabilities, six million with brain injury, five million with dementia or stroke, 12 million with mental illness, which is, by the way, the, by far the toughest challenge in special needs financial planning, and 12 million with physical disabilities, either a sensory disability such as blindness or a mobility impairment. About one in six American families, 21 million, care for someone with disability. Now, a, a large number of that population, of course, is uh, an adult child caring for their frail uh, parent as my wife and sister cares for uh, my mother-in-law who turns 100 two weeks from now. 
in the world of intellectual disability, 72% of the people with intellectual disability live with the family. And I talk in Colorado that we're a family value state, which means that what the state uh, does is it wants families to take care of their own so they don't have to pay for it. So that's three and a half million people with intellectual disability, autism, Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, and a plethora of more exotic um, disabilities such as DeGeorge syndrome, Cree du Chat, Cornelia de Lange, Prater Willi, et cetera. Significantly, 25% of those who live with their families, with their parents or a sibling, are, live with someone older than 60. And until last year, that was my daughter because I'm 68. So there's going to be a, a real social issue here when a, uh, a generation of parents starts to pass away. And because more than half of the people with an intellectual disability, absent a chronic or an acute medical condition, will outlive both of their parents. For example, it's not uncommon in my practice to have a husband and wife in their mid-40s with perhaps a 12-year-old daughter with autism. Autism by itself is not life-shortening. So that girl can live for perhaps 70 more years. She may well outlive both parents by 20, 25 years. It's a problem that most people don't see coming. So, as I started to think about how to take care of my daughter. That's my daughter, that's Meg, Tiny Dancer. And so when friends ask my wife and me what we want for her, we say, well, we want her to have friends, a job, and a home. We want her to be happy. We want her to have the life she wants for herself, which, by the way, I could say for my other two children. What it looks like in life is different, but that, that simple statement is basically a parent statement about what they want for their child. And we want her to be safe and cared for when we're no longer here. So starting with that premise, I felt like I had to develop my own idea of what special needs planning was. And being a systems engineer, I kind of approached it systematically. In fact, as an engineer, I tend to over-engineer things, and I have parents telling me that all the time. But that's fine, because I'd rather over-engineer than under-engineer. So to me, there are four components of special needs planning. Life planning, resource planning, financial planning, legal planning. And how do you integrate it into a practical plan of action? Life planning envisions a person's rightful place in the community. It's friends, job, home, taking care of special needs. The resources are what's needed for making the life plan possible. And I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about things such as if, if the goal is employment, what kind of education, vocational training will be necessary so that the person is employable? It also includes some touchy-feely things like how to teach life skills or teaching life skills, particularly important if the child's going to live on their own. Well, financial planning is about how to pay for the resources while maintaining eligibility for government assistance. So it's about how to provide the lifetime financial support and how to fund a trust. And of course, legal planning is about leaving a legacy to it for a child that outlives you, making sure your wishes are carried out and your child is protected. I learned very quickly when I started practicing that no one size fits all because there's a tendency in the business to focus on the nature of the disability. We label people. So there's, there's developmental disability, and by the way, I prefer to use the word cognitive impairment. And I'll tell you why. If you look up in a dictionary, the prefix DIS means a negation of something. It means a lack of something. It means a denial of something. Well, my daughter doesn't have a lack of abilities. She just has some challenges. Impairment means a lessening of something. So I tend to use the word impairment because Meg does have some limited uh, intellectual capacity. We all have impairments. I'm hearing impaired. It means I hear, but I hear less than uh, I did when I was 20 years old. So as I look at the, the nature of the population of people with disabilities, I very quickly got away from looking at 
whether the person had a developmental disability, a physical disability, or mental illness. Because those labels stereotype people. I also was aware that the nature of planning, I've always done age-appropriate planning, so what we, I do with families depends on whether the child is a minor. By the way, when I say child, I mean a relationship. I'm, I'm, I'm my dad's child until the day I die. Well, I should probably, for eternity. But I talk minor, adult, and senior. But the most important element I found in financial planning was the potential for independence. And that's a continuum from those that will require 24 by 7 care, like someone with Rett syndrome or Cornelia DeLang, to someone capable of pretty much full independence but with accommodations. And that will typically be people with physical disabilities but normal cognitive function. But in between, there's a population of people, especially in the intellectual disability area, that are capable of living in the community semi-independently if they have adequate planning, adequate supports. And it's this population in the middle. It's, it's the families that have someone like my daughter that they want to live independently. They're going to face the biggest cost, the highest, the greatest challenge, and the highest risk of failure. And planning for someone to live in the community with an intellectual disability is a challenge. And I'm going to tell you how I meet that challenge, and especially with how I meet it with my daughter later. So, my daughter, about three or four years ago, four years ago, I think, announced that she wanted to live in her own apartment. She lived with us at the time, because she had seen her older brother and sister move out of the house, get, get their own apartments. She saw some of her peers with Down syndrome. There's about 12 adults with Down syndrome in the Denver area that I know are living now independently. And she wanted, she was, she was wondering, why not me? And, and that's a good question, why not her? So immediately the argument starts with me and my wife. Because uh, dad's willing to try this because Meg wants it, and of course the mother is worried that something will go wrong. But we, as we began to work on it, it became obvious that it was easy to underestimate my daughter. In fact, I think we easily underestimate our children's ability to understand their world, to make decisions, and to learn and grow as they move out on their own. I also learned that the desire to live independently is stronger than I had realized. And I also realized that supported independence is more affordable than I imagined. And as a financial planner, that was significant. And I'm going to come back to uh, independent living briefly in the following chart. But as I moved through this, my early years of doing financial planning, I, I developed some principles that I think guided the way I went about it. First was a value statement. A person with a disability has a right to a good life, an appropriate place in the community, and the right to make decisions about his or her own life to the extent capable. It was easy to make to say this, it became a little bit harder to follow it when Meg said she wanted to live independently because as a parent I was worried about what could go wrong. But I do believe this is a fundamental principle in special needs planning. Also learn that we have to focus on a person's capabilities and not the disability and that relates to another bullet on this page. You have to understand what government policy is for people with disability. The government policy, and I'm talking about Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, state services, is to take care of the life-sustaining needs of an individual, that's basically health care, and to support the person at somewhere at or below the poverty line. It doesn't get any better than that. And those of you who know the numbers, SSI, the most common support for someone with a disability, $733 a month is only about 72% of the poverty level. So what gets a person if they're on SSI to poverty? Well, it's public housing assistance if you can get it, but since the federal government's not funding any more HUD Section 8 vouchers, the only things available in my community are the reversions, and that is the vouchers that come back because someone can't use them. There's low-income energy assistance, but you can't get that unless you have low-income housing assistance. 
and there's food stamps. That's as good as it gets. And when I work with special needs families, one of the myths I'm trying to debunk is the myth that the government will take care of your child. And it's a shock when parents realize that. And they, oh my God, what do you do? But it led me back to this idea that if you want to create the best possible life for your child, you focus on the child's capabilities. You don't focus on the disability. Because if you focus on the disability, not only are you focusing on the lowest common denominator, but also you're basically focusing on providing your child a life in poverty. We need to plan across the child's entire lifetime, especially for those children that are likely to outlive us. My daughter will certainly outlive me. She's 30 years old, and I'm 68. The life expectancy of a child with Down syndrome now, absent of medical conditions such as Hertzsprung syndrome, the life expectancy is 70 years, and that's a median age. There's no way I'm going to outlive my daughter unless something unanticipated terminates her life early. Retirement and estate planning for parents is essential. And retirement planning is a subtle one that's easy to overlook because uh, when a person retires, their income drops for most people. And whatever has been saved, whatever has been invested, whatever has been set aside, that's as good as it gets. And so as a person enters retirement, if they have a special age child, I want to know then how are you going to take care of your child in your retirement years. And we always have to have a contingency plan for the premature death or disability of either or both parents. So it was an issue much earlier with my wife and I because we, were all, we both of us are healthy. I wasn't too concerned that we would die, I would die of a heart attack or something like that. My real fear was that we'd get killed in a car wreck together. And so I had to develop, start to develop plans. What would happen if my wife died? And that was, by the way, the, the real challenge because she's the primary caregiver. But what happens if both of us die? And I'll come back to that when I talk about a letter of intent. So, it starts with life planning. And what does life planning consist of? Social life. Friends, spirituality. And I want to... I'm sorry, I disconnected the wire. Help has arrived. If I do this one more time, I'll just go with the handheld. So when I talk about social life, one of the things I wanted to highlight was spirituality. This is easy to overlook. My daughter, as with people with Down syndrome, has no concept of abstract ideas. She has no concept of theology. But she has an acute sensitivity to a welcoming and loving environment, and she loves to go to church. So part of our life plan for our daughter is something happens to my wife and I. How does Meg participate in her faith community? It's independence to the extent of one's abilities. And that can be limited by affordability, especially for lower middle class families or working class families. It's a job or business to be proud of. It's a home of one's own. And it's very importantly establishing the circles of support to last a lifetime. And it's also taking care, obviously, of special needs, that is mitigating the effect of the disability. I'm not going to cover this slide very much because you attorneys know this. Uh, but I will point out that just as in the legal aspects of uh, special needs planning, the $2,000 Medicaid asset limit My aim is not good. The $2,000 asset limit dominates the financial planning aspect of special needs planning. And most states use for their Medi disability services program Medicaid eligibility criteria. So it's important to understand the Medicaid regulations in your state. It turns out in a conversation last night, Georgia has a rather interesting system uh, for reviewing first party special needs trust and determining eligibility. Colorado has an abysmal system. It's a vicious system. If those of you here who aren't attorneys who want to come back 
and ask about um, government programs. We'll do that in the Q&A period. I'm happy to come back to these charts. But what do families want to pay for if they want a better life for their child? Supported independence is one, and especially life skills mentoring, a companion or a caregiver, a residential environment, and assistive technologies. I'll talk in a second about what we've done for our daughter, because she is now living independently. Purchase of a home, investment in employability, and professional services for a child who outlives their parents. The most important of the professionals that will perhaps play a role in your child's life, one's going to be the successor guardian, which may also be a, a, a limited guardian, maybe an advocate with privacy waivers, a care manager, a caregiver, and of course a trustee to uh, husband the money and distribute it appropriately. My daughter, we moved her to an apartment last year in March, and she's thriving in independence. She wanted it so much that I told her, I said, Meg, you're going to have to take responsibility. And she has done that. She wanted to make it work. And she will tell me sometimes uh, when I pick her up to take her someplace, um, she'll, she'll say, I've been watching my purse. She wants me to know that she's taking responsibility. She also has been learning. I should have, I'm stupid. I, I shouldn't have been surprised at this. But she's been learning new skills as she's been in her apartment. She now is totally self-sufficient on meals. She prepares her own meals. And she has done something which is kind of painful for a parent, but it's what independence is all about. She started to break the parent-child uh, dependency. So I'll tell Meg, I'll say, Meg, would you like to go out and have uh, uh, dinner tonight? And she'll say, I'm all right, which is Meg speak for go away, Dad because she wants to cook her own dinner, which is usually something with cheese, bread, you know, the four food groups, you know. But this is what caused me to realize, Meg is low functioning, or at least she's labeled that on the Down syndrome spectrum. She was tested in school as having an IQ of 60, which is turning out to be wrong. Why? Because Meg's not very verbal. She has trouble articulating what she thinks or wants or feels. And because she has trouble expressing herself, there's a tendency to think that the lack of expressive skills equates to a lack of cognitive skills, and that's wrong. Meg understands her world a lot better than she can express. And as I began to realize that, I started to wonder as a society, have we underestimated the capabilities of a vast population of people negligently labeled, cognitively disabled, developmentally disabled, intellectually disabled? So I have learned from my daughter's experience that I think independence is possible for most people with Down syndrome, and certainly probably possible for people with, on, on the autism spectrum. What will really limit the disability isn't so much cognitive skills as much as it's going to be medical or physical problems. When I work with families, I tell them you have to write a letter of intent. If something happens to you and something has to take over care of your child, you want them to know what you know about your child. You want them to be able to see your child as you see them. You want, to know who the, they want to know, you want them to know who the key people in their child's life are. One of the most important sections in my letter of intent for Meg is if something happens to me and Eleanor and my son and my daughter have to rally around to make sure Meg's situation is stabilized, they know who they have to contact. It's, I, in our letter of intent, there's a week in the life of Meg. It describes her routine, describes important people in her life. So when she goes to work at the art crystal, it, um, the contact information there is for her employee buddy, Mary Flanagan. The current planning arrangements we've made, what happens if something happens to us? Where to find the important documents? And of course, you, you have to periodically review the letter of intent with the people that will come after you. And I ran into, as a financial planner, and you financial planners and attorneys, you know, familiar with this, and that's 
the family meetings that are common in affluent families, especially those with dynastic wealth. And I learned that concept of family meetings is a powerful one, especially in these families, because it's not unusual to have three generations involved in the child's planning and support. It may be a generation of grandparents who are willing to help the parents. And who do parents most commonly turn to when they start to think of who's going to take over for them? They think of the other children. They think of the brother and the sister. And so consequently, multi-generational family meetings play a real role in special needs planning. Three or four years ago, it was the first time we sat down as a family, all five of us, Meg, her brother, her sister, my wife and I, and we went over Meg's letter of intent. And we've sat down every year since because it's been changing because of the change in her circumstance. And one of the ghosts that I wanted to put to bed when I reviewed the letter of intent, uh, Meg's letter of intent with them, was I didn't want David or Rebecca to feel that Meg would be a burden on them if something happened to us because they have their own lives. And I didn't want them, we wanted them to be involved in Meg's life, but we didn't want them to feel like they had to be, you know, 24 by 7 parents. So we were willing to describe the life plan we had for Meg. Who, who would be her guardian or her companion uh, if we weren't there? Who would be her trustee? The key people that we have identified that will be in Meg's circles of support as things go on. And last year, it dawned on me to put another ghost to bed. I got to wondering if Meg's brother and sister, David and Rebecca, wondered if all of mom's and dad's money would go to Meg when we passed away. And that raises an issue of fairness, fairness to all of the children. It also raises a potential concern of what happens when families want a brother or a sister to look out for the special needs child and all the money's going to go to that child. Do they feel somehow treated unfairly? For the first time, I was willing to share with my, brother, uh, my older son and daughter what our family net worth was and what they could expect as an inheritance if something happened to us. I also thought of a couple of other letters to write because I'm in a family, kind of a traditional family from my generation where I take care of all the legal and financial matters and Eleanor takes care of all the decisions for Meg's care. And it dawned on me that if I died, Eleanor is going to face financial decisions that she doesn't even know are there and doesn't know how to face. So I wrote a letter to Eleanor. If I die, here are the decisions that you're going to face. And most importantly, here are the professionals that I know and I trust will serve you well. Our, she knows our estate planning attorney. We've worked with Ken Olson for 15 years. Here's a financial planner I think you can go to. Here's an investment manager I think you can go to. Here's a real estate broker if you want to sell the house. And then I thought, well, what happens if something happens to me or Eleanor together? And I wrote letters to David and Rebecca. If mom and dad die, here's what you need to know. We already have taken care of, here's what we want for Meg. But here are the decisions that you're going to have. For example, if you inherit dad's IRA, what are your options? And here's who you can go to for advice. Here's a financial planner. Here's an investment uh, advisor. Here's a real estate broker to sell a house. So what I didn't want to have happen was something happens to me and in that crucial two weeks after I've dropped dead from a heart attack, things start to fall apart for Meg and things start to unravel for our children. And especially that period of 10 days after the death of a parent is crucial in making sure a special age child, uh, their situation is stabilized. And I also have done one other thing, and that is in my wallet I carry a little card that says, well, actually it's, it's out of date now, but it was up to date through March of last year. I've got to change this card. 
It said there's a special needs child at home. Please contact, and there's three contacts listed, my wife, my uh, daughter, and my son. Because what happened, I, I collapsed in my front yard one day about four years ago with what I thought was a heart attack, what my neighbor thought was a heart attack. And so they called 911, the med techs arrived. And so immediately, one of them's putting oxygen on, the other is fishing for my wallet. Well, why was he doing that? Well, um, he, first of all, he wanted to know who I was, but secondly, he wanted my medical insurance. And I thought, I'm gonna put a card in my wallet so that that tech sees and can turn over to the sheriff's deputy. There's a special needs child, somebody's gonna have to um, make sure that they're okay. When my daughter wanted to live independently, I had to think my way through, what's the support network? What keeps her safe and in her home? And so I developed what I thought was the nine challenges. And by the way, I do a lot of speaking to parents, parent groups. Now, this is what I spoke to the Down, National Down Syndrome Congress about last week. The title of the presentation was Independence Works. So here's the nine challenges. And if you think your way through these nine challenges and develop a plan of action to meet them, what you have then is the nine supports for independent living. And I'm not going to go into them, but we'll say the most important, obviously, is life skills. And it's not just the task skills of preparing a meal or doing laundry. It's also the empowerment skills of self-assertiveness, communications. Communications is terribly important. The ability to tell somebody what you need, what's going wrong, or what has happened to you. The two most important of these challenges are safety management and protection from sexual abuse. Because a failure in these two domains is tragic. And when you think your way through the nine supports, human support, live in, look in, or neighbor, becomes the solution that you can't solve by any other means, by teaching your child or providing assistive technology or whatever. So my daughter lives in a two-bedroom apartment. We very early on made the decision that we would want Meg to have a roommate, a young woman. And we wanted the young, a, a roommate because what we really were afraid of and what my wife was obsessing about was the threat of sexual abuse. And we weren't worried about the random predator. Meg's living in an apartment complex with four buildings and 100 units. We were worried about the groomer. And that's why we chose that we would want Meg to have a roommate. And so Charlie, who's a woman, young woman, she's a retail clerk, doesn't make a lot of money, and Denver has a terrible housing market, a terrible rental market for young people. A one-bedroom apartment now, the median rent in Denver is about 800 a month. We're approaching cities like Seattle, Austin, um, Washington, D.C. And so what the arrangement, what, what the apartment costs about $1,430, and Charlie pays 430, we pay 1,000. So Charlie gets subsidized rent, which motivates her to be in the apartment. We have a companion for Mig. It's a win-win. Charlie was told your only duty is to call us if there's something we need to know. Your, your duty is not caregiving or anything. It's just let us know if we need to know something. We had hoped that Charlie would eventually befriend Meg and they would become buddies. That hasn't happened. And even though that's kind of disappointing, that wasn't part of the bargain. What we told Charlie is, you just look out for Meg's well-being and let us know if we need something. So in the definition that we made when we structured this agreement, it, one of the elements of it wasn't, Charlie, we want you to be Meg's friend. We told her, you have your own life. And that's okay, because Meg's happy, and, uh, and we're comfortable as long as Charlie's there that we, the safety aspects can be managed. Again, I'm not gonna talk about this in an audience of attorneys and trustees, but if there's someone here who's not one and who wants to talk about a special needs trust, hit me in the questions and I'll come back to this chart. Uh, but I will say one thing about the special needs tr uh, trust. 
I run into families and they think that because they've got a special needs trust, they've done special needs planning. And I tell them, you know, you're, you're just like the erstwhile cook that thinks that because she's bought the pot, she's cooked the meal. If you have a shell trust or a pour over trust, you haven't done special needs planning. In fact, I commonly run into families that have set up a special needs trust and they've done nothing to fund it. So it's kind of like driving a car. If you drive a car, the salesman on the uh, lot will give you a little 15 minute introduction to the controls and the dashboard and then it's up to you. You have to learn how to drive, you have to learn how to maintain it. What I run into with families is they've got a special needs trust, haven't got the faintest idea what to do about it. How to fund it, how to manage it. And that gets into, when I talk to families about, these are the decisions that you're gonna to have to make if you've got a special needs trust. Now the attorneys are gonna tell you the pros and cons of inter vivos versus testamentary. And I generally believe that uh, despite the extra money, a special needs family should get an inter vivos trust especially if there's grandparents or someone else that might want to leave money for the child. Revocable versus irrevocable. I like revocable because you can change it because if your child's gonna live 40 more years, you know, things will change. And I realize that when uh, my wife and I are dead, our trust is gonna convert to irrevocable. But there's the issues of trust funding, investments, residential property. Financial advisors can help with that if they understand the, the the, the circumstances and the challenge. There's also the selection of trustee, trust protector. It's called in some states, I don't know what you call it in Georgia. Uh, in some states it's an advo trust advocate. I call it trust protector. And remainder beneficiaries. And so what I want families to do is think their way through these things. When we went, uh, my wife and I wanted to first set up our special needs trust. It was back in 2000 or 2001. And being a fairly forward-thinking person who tries to think of all the questions that needs to be asked. The first question I had on my list was, how much money do I need to put in the trust? And uh, so I go sit down with a prominent elder law attorney in Denver, uh, who actually served for several years as the president of the Colorado ARC and the Denver ARC. And uh, so Kent's explaining to me um, what a special needs trust is, and then he says, uh, do you have any questions? And I said, well, how much money do we need to put in the trust? And he said, you know, an attorney doesn't tell you that. You figure it out yourself. And so I began to realize that um, there really was a huge gap here in planning for my child's future. Because if you have a life plan for your child, and if you don't know what it costs, you don't know if it's, it's affordable, and you don't know if it can be made to happen. So one of the things I started to focus on as a financial planner was how do you estimate lifetime support. And ABLE Act, by the way, uh, I'm not going to talk it here because I think you attorneys know it, but I will say one thing about the ABLE Act, and that is one of my fears when it first uh, came out was that there would be financial institutions that would want to start collecting this money and wouldn't explain to the families a couple of the drawbacks of the ABLE Act, the $100,000 asset limit and the Medicaid payback lien. I do believe for most families, especially, uh, especially uh, middle class families, the ABLE Act is a good first step before you start funding the special needs trust. But if you have a medically fragile child, you're not going to want to put $75,000, $80,000 into it and risk having of your money and risk having the child die, which by the way, I have seen happen. And now uh, Medicaid has a lien on all of that. So there are some some issues of advice that financial planners or institutions uh, should give to families so that they can understand what an ABLE Act is for, its drawbacks, and whether it's appropriate to them. I think for most families it is appropriate, but for some families it's not. Special needs financial planning usually involves two plans. It, it's a plan for the child. How do we provide for their lifetime support? How do we fund a special needs trust? How do we properly title assets, asset transfers and bequests to make sure the child doesn't get money knocking them off SSI, Medicaid, state services? But there's also a financial plan for the family because we have to address affordability, especially 
how much the parents can provide in fairness to all of their children. When you talk about retirement and estate planning for the parents, adequate insurance. And one thing I used to always do, if the family had done estate planning, I wanted a copy of their wills, their special needs trust, if they had RLTs or anything like that, I wanted those, because I wanted to trace the distribution of asset transfers and bequests in the case of the death of either or both parents to make sure the estate plan executed as it was intended. Because it's not uncommon to find families who don't get around to filing the TOD forms with their investment bank, uh, investment company, or the POD forms with their bank, or even the life insurance death benefit forms. I've seen so many families that never fully implemented the estate plan that a competent attorney set up, meaning they probably in our state spent $2,500 for a plan that's not going to execute properly. And the penalty, if it doesn't, is the possibility that the child will get money that will knock them off of government assistance. In the case study part, following the break, I'm gonna actually show you what an estimate looks like, and I'm gonna show you kind of a model life plan. Uh, but some basic principles. First of all, there are three types of expenses in the way I do it. Expenses anyone might incur, like an apartment rent. Expenses caused by the disability, and for pro professional services not provided by the parents or family. And of course, the lifetime expenses less the child's income, either earned or entitled, that's the money that has to come from someone else, either the parents or the distributions from a trust. And most parents will support their child out of current income and assets for as long as they can. And then the trust will fund. This is a common thing, and the life insurance companies, they usually work it this way. Um, we're gonna fund the trust when you die out of life insurance. It's a good tax efficient way of doing it. But one of my early clients back in about 2005 came to me and she was 80 years old. Her name was Barbara. And she had a 38-year-old uh, son with cognitive impairment from an unknown cause. Back 12 years ago, I ran in, the most common situation I ran into was autism. The second most surprised me. It was people who had an, a cognitive impairment of an unknown cause, and usually they say, oh, that was an oxygen deficiency at birth. And now that we've mapped the human genome and we started to connect you know, genetic structures with some of these really obscure um, intellectual uh, disabilities, such as uh, the George syndrome, we're beginning to realize that uh, there's probably been a lot of people who were diagnosed as, oh, they had an uh, oxygen deficiency at birth, and it turns out there is not a chromosomal defect like Down syndrome, but a genetic defect like 22Q11, which is the George syndrome. But anyway, the... Uh, how did I get off on that? Anyway, parents will usually support the child out of current. Oh, back to Barbara. So Barbara was 80 years old when she came to me. And I do what financial planners do. And finally I asked, I said, Barbara, what do you want to have happen here? And she said, I need to lay it all down. It's kind of a poignant moment when a mother finally has to admit that because of declining health and declining stamina, she can't take care of her child anymore. And it taught me something that when I work with families, I have to have the conversation, do we need to consider that you might need to start delegating the responsibility for your child's care to someone before you die, which means that we have to have some mechanism to pay for that. Now there's a variety of insurance products, like life insurance products, where you can have an accelerated death penalty or you can, have, uh, you can borrow on the cash value. But I wanted to debunk this myth that the the only way you, that you know, people fund a special needs trust is, is at death from life insurance because some families, uh, dad gets a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. And if anybody's ever been through that, you know that the problem is the wife is gonna try to take care of that father, that, that husband and that father for as long as she can. She's gonna try to keep her spouse in the home with her for as long as she can. And if she has a special needs child too, it's gonna become overwhelming faster. These things happen in life, and I want families, you can't plan for everything that can go wrong, but I want families 
to be aware of what could go wrong because they've got, and they may at some point need to confront it. Or maybe it's the mother who has a debilitating stroke and now dad has to take over the care and because he's been fairly distant from the problem all those years, he doesn't know what that mother is doing. I, that was my, actually my fear in our family. I wouldn't know all of what Eleanor does to take care of Meg. So when you estimate financial support, focus on the high cost items and you'll see this on the Excel spreadsheet I'm gonna show you. Don't worry about pets. Don't worry about clothes. Worry about things like apartment rent if you, if you want independence. Worry about things like higher education if you want your child to be employable, which by the way, higher education can be college, can be two year associate degree, it can be vocational training. But worry about those costs. Don't worry about the nickel and dime things. Also, watch with the life plan. The life plan tells you when things will happen. The resource plan tells you what has to be paid for. So watch for those years when something changes, an item of income or expense starts or stops or changes significantly. And because it's really tedious to build a 40-year estimate for someone like my daughter, um, I'm not going to go through every cell on a 15-page Excel spreadsheet and make sure it's dead nuts accurate. And why? Because there's no such thing as accuracy when you start to get into multiple years. I would tell families what we're looking for is a reliable estimate. It's an estimate that's a basis for decisions, but it's not accurate. You want the best possible estimate. It's based on the life plan, the resource plan, not a guess. Actually, by the way, I do do some guessing because if the child is three years old, we have no concept of prob uh, realistically of what their life is likely gonna be like 22 years later. And so I, I will do some ballpark estimates for very young children. But when I, I'm working with a family where the child is about to age out of school or already has, now I want to get really serious about estimating that child's lifetime support. We update it periodically when things change. I tell families that, well, if we're not doing an, an accurate estimate, what, what are we doing? And I say, it's like playing a par 60 hole of golf. How long is a par 60 hole of golf? 13,000 yards? which is going to be about 10 miles. You can't see the green when you take the driver out of the bag on the tee. All you're trying to do with your first shot is get it down the fairway, reasonable lie for the next shot, reasonable distance, and you keep playing the hole. And when you play this par 60 hole in uh, life, there's going to be balls that go in the rough, and you're going to have to play it back into the fairway as, fat, as efficiently as you can. There may be a ball out of bounds. You'll have to recover from that. But if you keep making steady progress, if you keep hitting good shots, sooner or later, the, the green's going to come into view. What's the green? It's having a life plan for the child that will work. What's the ball in the cup? It's having the resources to make sure that life plan executes. And I tell families when I explain this to them, when you play this par 60 hole of golf, remember one thing. You may not be the person who puts out. The greatest uncertainty, and always as a, when I estimate this, I'm always worried about what can be wrong. But the greatest uncertainty for, to our children in estimating lifetime support is the threat and cutbacks in government assistance. Because only the most affluent families can afford to go it alone. Even in our family, we rely heavily on the fact that Meg gets supported living services through the home and community-based Medicaid waiver program. How much money is needed for lifetime support? I hate to cite a number because I'm always afraid parents will run off and use it without any other thought or analysis. But generally, when I was working with families, I would it wasn't unusual for me to come up with a number between two hundred fifty and seven hundred fifty thousand dollars at the high end, usually because we were going for support independence, perhaps buying a condominium. There were families that came came in at zero. Why? Because they couldn't afford to do anything. They were going to have to rely on what the government provided. There was no other uh, money available. And so the things in the second bullet were the things that used to drive the estimate up. The biggest one was not eligible for benefits. And by the way, found very quickly, shouldn't have been a surprise, 
Affluent families don't want to have anything to do with Medicaid. Don't want to have anything to do with SSI because of the issues of control, access, reliability, quality. So affluent families don't need a special needs trust. They may need, may need a disability trust, but not a special needs trust because I found most multimillionaire families don't have anything to do with Medicaid. For one thing, the health care is abysmal because of the dramatic underpayment of providers in that space. Investment in employment programs, purchase of a home, professional services for, for, those that, uh, for a child who outlives their parents. And also there's private therapy. So many families are desperate to create a, a best possible life for their child that they will pay for private therapy because their Medicaid or the state won't. They'll pay for a speech and language pathologist. They'll pay for a life skills coach. They will pay for a job coach because that's how they, what they have to do to provide a best possible life for their child. This is the last chart, and uh, we do have time for questions. It's actually a little bit less than I meant. But when I first started to, to figure out how do you do special needs planning, the two insurance companies at the time that practiced in this space, MetLife and Mass Mutual, and Mass Mutual has since bought MetLife. I think most of you know that. So the MetLife Snoopy desk has gone away. It's now uh, the MetLife people, the Mass Mutual people. And basically, the insurance companies took care of the very basic elements of special needs planning. They trained their agents and, uh, you know, what the government assistance was, SSI, Medicare, Medicaid, the legal documents that they would need, the basics of a special needs trust. They would describe that, yeah, you need to think of guardianship at age 18. And this was pretty much the way uh, financial planners back in the 2004, 2005 timeframe, that was pretty much what you would get. What we've seen over the last 10 years is there are financial planners, there are CFPs that have been trying to, to move into this space. And what I call a practitioner, the level of skills there is planning for a higher quality of life, which means you're going to be addressing private pay support. It's going to be trying to estimate for the family the cost of lifetime support so you can evaluate whether the life plan is affordable. And by the way, what you don't want to have happen is embark on a life plan Parents die, and five years later, the trust runs out of money. That's one thing you want to avoid happening. In fact, um, I know those of you who are trustees here, trust officers, know that one of the things that you don't want to have happen is to have the trust exhaust on your watch. Trust funding, how much and when, estate planning, confirming the execution. I've also run into, over the years, um, that there is the expert practitioner. And the most common issue here is divorce. Because I would have, uh, on the average of once a year, one year it was three, women, mothers coming to me with a special needs child, and they were going to enter into a divorce. And it was always the mother. It was always the woman. And what I learned in this space is that there's an asymmetrical bargaining that happens. The man wants to strike, if he, assuming he's the child support paying parent, a good deal. She wants out of the conflict. And I have and not seen in the dozen or so women I've worked with, one that came away with what I thought was a fair settlement. I'll be very frank with that. So one of the aspects, the most obvious aspect that has to be dealt, dealt with in divorce with a special needs child is how much child support needs to be. And obviously, some of you will know this, you've got to pay attention to the effect of child support on SSI and Medicaid, because even though it's not taxable, it is counted by Social Security as the child's income. So divorce was a special problem. And also, that's, you almost never see contested guardianship for a child with autism, Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, except in one instance, and that's divorce you'll see contested guardianship there. But there's also structured settlements from uh, lawsuits because it used to be back a couple of decades ago if a special needs child was born, there was a pretty good chance that OBGYN was going to get sued. And so in the financial planning industry, there's a planners who know how to do structured settlements. Those are lifetime annuities. I never did it myself. I always sent 
someone who was probably going to need that to a, a colleague of mine named Greg Seal because Greg was an expert here. Because financial planners have a duty to confer or refer just like attorneys. And there was also in uh, the expert area working with the affluent families who really could afford everything they would want. And I've, and I've had one instance where I've had to work with a family office where they wanted me just for one aspect of the family's plan because family already had their trust their tax attorney, they already had their CPA for their business, et cetera. So there is the issue of, ex, uh, there is a level of expert planning. And of course, you really are validated in this space when you can qualify in court as an expert witness. And that's all I have for this presentation. What I'm gonna do in the uh, next session, I'm gonna show you uh, kind of a, just a rough, fairly simple life plan for a young woman named Angel Herrera who has affluent Hispanic families, John and Michelle, and they're doing a plan for their child. And by the way, I, uh, the disabilities knows no socioeconomic group. So most of the families I work with were middle class, they weren't affluent. But one thing I, it's really uh, interesting working with an affluent family is you can do anything you want to. You're not limited by the uh, affordability in terms of what the family wants for the quality of life as, as a child. So in my book, this is actually Angel Herrera case study is the first case study. In my book, the second case study is uh, a single mom, assistant librarian, who has a child with Asperger's syndrome. Assistant librarian, ergo not much money, which is the, a heck of a lot more common than uh, an affluent family in my, in, in my practice. The third case study was a working class uh, family couple, had a daughter who's blind. And the fourth case study is the worst planning challenge of all, the adult male with mental illness, type one bipolar disorder in this case. And I found when I was writing the book, and one of the things I did was I lined up for all the chapters, technical advisors to make sure it was right. And so I asked a, um, family support group in Denver, if I could meet with four families or three or four families to do this case study on someone with bipolar disorder. And they set me up with four women. Three of the women had sons, adult sons, with type one bipolar disorder, and one of them had it herself. And I'm listening to them tell their stories, and I'm thinking, I don't know what to say. There's no good solution in the space of mental illness I found. All you can do is the best you can. So with that, questions, and then we'll uh, take a break. Wait. And by the way, with the lights, I, have I may have trouble seeing some people raise their hand, but I did see you, ma'am. Right, right now we just have time for one question, but when you come back after okay. the break, we'll have more. Hi, thank you. I've really enjoyed your presentation. Um, when you're thinking about the nine challenges for supported independence, I was wondering if if that would change or if there would be some nuances in those nine for the scenario of dealing with uh, a person with bipolar disorder or mental illness? There are. If, if someone's mentally ill, then the question is, in those nine challenges, are there nuances for different circumstances, different disabilities? And there is, because for one, the obvious thing, and in in, uh, for those that are mentally ill, if their um, drug regimen, their, their therapy, their uh, daily... Um, pattern allows them to function normally in the community. You're never, no one's ever going to get, uh, probably ever going to get guardianship for this person. What's more commonly found in, uh, with someone who's mentally ill is uh, a power of attorney. Except there's one problem, and that is a person who has d designated an agent with power of attorney can revoke it. And I found that some people with mental illness will immediately revoke their uh, power of attorney when they start to go into a psychotic episode. Why? Because they're afraid they're going to get institutionalized. And so, but power of attorney, for example, is one is more common with people who are mentally ill than with people like my daughter with Down syndrome. There are other issues here. Uh, and obviously, one of the biggest issue is uh, medical needs. Um, if the child has serious medical needs, like for example, someone with Rett syndrome, first of all, with Rett syndrome, independence is not gonna be possible. Not gonna be possible. That child's gonna need 24 by seven care. But if there are serious uh, medical issues, then uh, either supported independence won't work, or they're gonna need a caregiver, not a roommate. 
some of the other areas, uh, assistive technologies, really actually turns out to be uh, a real enabler for people with high-functioning autism, especially people with Asperger's syndrome. Um, so yeah, there are nuances on all of these, but the uh, primary issue is going to be safety, and um, and that's a problem with uh, Down syndrome that almost, as I tried to think my way through it, there's no good solution uh, other than having Meg either uh, having someone living with her or somebody in very close proximity that can be automatically summoned. This is going to be a little awkward because what I want to do is show you a spreadsheet and I can't control it from here so my uh, person, my partner, will do that for you. So I'm going to be reading from the you know, kind of general statement of the case, which you have a copy of, so just follow along with it. And then, uh, and then I'll show you what the result is in the, uh, uh, as an Excel spreadsheet, the estimate of lifetime support, the trust funding strategy. So I want to run through this quickly so we ha have time. Uh, and I'm not good at running through things quickly, but I'll try. Uh, the Herreras, this is the first case study in my book. Uh, John and Michelle, John's 51, Michelle's 50. They have three children. Um, Josephine's a CPA, lives in Seattle, uh, Portland. Michael, 23, is an insurance agent, lives in Dallas. And their daughter, Angel, born with Down syndrome, lives with her parents. And in the book, this family uh, lives in Denver, Colorado, and that's because I know the state system so well. Angel aged out of public school in December 2015. By the way, the case study for the book was written in 2012. It originally goes back to a 2008 version, and I'm updated it for today. She's healthy, life expectancy 70 years. She has a moderate degree of intellectual impairment. She has weak abstract reasoning skills. That's typical of people with Down syndrome. But she has an excellent memory, and that is a strength of people with Down syndrome. They have almost photographic visual memories, and they conscientiously will follow a routine they've been taught because that's how they get through their day. And so she's a visual learner. However, and she has strong social skills. People with Down syndrome have a remarkable acuity to people's emotions. And she's trusting, she's eager to please, and she has no concept of stranger danger. That's my daughter. So on the second chart in your package, Angel circumstances, she gets SSI. Her primary health insurance is her dad's employer group plan. But eventually, because when she works, she's gonna start earning disability work credits and eventually she's going to qualify on her own record for social security disability. She's eligible for Colorado's Medicaid waiver program, Supported Living Services. She's also gonna be eligible for comprehensive residential services, but in Colorado doesn't fund those anymore. Colorado only provides residential support if there is no one else to care for the child, meaning I will never live to see the day that my daughter gets comprehensive residential services in Colorado. But I will maximize the supported living services to the extent I can so that she can stay in her apartment. John and Michelle are court-appointed guardians. There's no one in the Denver to take care of their child because their other two children live in other cities. Joe's gonna be the successor, uh, the personal representative of, of her parents' estates. Michael is the one they look to to care for their daughter. The parents want Angel to have meaningful employment, and Angel wants to live in her own apartment just like her brother and sister. The third chart in there is the family financial circumstances. All the numbers don't meet, mean anything except that the bottom line, this family is affluent enough to do with, to, to where the life plan for their daughter is going to be limited by her capabilities and not by money. So there are plans for Michelle's, for Angel's future. First of all, in the fall of this year, they're going to enroll her in the nearest uh, community college that uh, has a program for providing a certificate to someone with an intellectual disability. And there is a series of um, areas of study at Eastern New Mexico University, Roswell, uh, food service assistant, plant nursery assistant, veterinary assistant, and these programs are designed to give someone an intellectual disability 
a possibility of having a, a job that pays something above minimum wage. So she will go to ENMUR, which is a one-year program of fall, spring, summer, starting fall of this year, and then uh, spring and summer of next year. In the sum, uh, when she finishes in the summer at ENMU, she's going to come home to live with her parents. And the parents are going to start focusing on what is needed to give her a job. And they're going to hire a private job placement service to evaluate angel skills, to search for a suitable employer, to do pre-employment uh, training for her, and to do some limited amount of post-placement support. This is in part John and Michelle's plan to enhance, to hopefully find an, an employer willing to say, I think this is going to succeed. Angel is going to be able to succeed as, as a food service assistant. That's not the question. It's going to be the attitude of that employer. And I found this with my daughter. An ideal job for Meg would be a food service assistant at a senior center, at an elder care residence, because Meg has a remarkable acuity for other people with disabilities and, a, and an empathy for them. And a frail senior has special needs. And Meg is extraordinary around my 100-year-old mother-in-law. But try to explain to a nursing home, try to explain that to a nursing home who are worried that this child with Down syndrome is going to screw up and hurt one of their clients. The problem is, with employment is not Angel's capability, it's the attitude of the employer. And that's what John and Michelle are trying to address. So she will be hired as a food service assistant as a result of this employment placement, $10 an hour, 20 hours a week. That's about as good as it usually gets for people with an intellectual disability. In January 2019, John and Michelle will test the possibility that Angel can live on her own with supports in an apartment. And they will rent a two-bedroom apartment with a, a companion with a roommate. And two years, if Angel is successful in this, they will consider buying her a condominium for a more permanent, stable residential situation. Angel will become eligible for SSDI eventually on her own work record as she earns the credits necessary to qualify for SSDI. She's not, she has only two other issues. She has no issue with medical uh, disability because Social Security regulations presume that Down syndrome is totally and permanently disabled. The only issue she has to worry about is the substantial gainful activity. But because of Angel's limitations, her chance of earning, what is it, $1,060 a month, her chance of earning that much money is pretty slim. Although, I do know some people with Down syndrome who flunk SSDI eligibility because they do earn more than the SGA. Uh, because I know several that work in grocery stores and they've climbed the union scale, they've got union benefits, and they're not eligible for SSI, Medicaid, or state services. That's an interesting challenge. They're tweeners. They're, they make too much to get government services, and yet they're still vulnerable enough to need help. So they're in between being able to take care of themselves and getting government assistance. It's a tough playing challenge. So Michelle will retire and file for Social Security when she reaches age 62, and that will create a Social Security benefit for Angel on her work record. John will retire, coincident with his Medicaid eligibility, but he won't file for Social Security because he's going to wait until age 70 when he gets the 32% uh, bump. Also in 2030, Angel Special Needs Trust will convert to an irrevocable trust and begin to make distributions. Why? Because I face this myself. I want to test drive everything before I die. And, you know, y'all who are trustees know this. Most banks want some, a minimal amount of money for a trust. Wells Fargo wants a total of a million dollars of family financial assets before they take a special needs trust. Even the regional banks in Colorado usually want three or four hundred thousand dollars. But I can still go to a bank. Colorado State Bank and Trust, by the way, is a very good bank in this space. And I want to go to them and say, look, I fully intend to fund the Special Needs Trust. Here's the long-term plan. I'm going to start incrementally funding it now, but I'd like to work with you. 
I'd like to work with you. I'd like for you to get to know my daughter. I'd like to feel uh, comfortable with you. I want to test drive everything. And that's a good reason for starting to incrementally fund a special needs trust and not waiting for the life insurance to pour in when you die. So John and Michelle will plan to transfer their parental roles uh, at Angels a, at, at their age 80. And because neither Joe or Michael lives in Denver, they're going to want Michael to make sure Joe's okay, but they're going to probably have to hire a professional guardian. And the case of Down syndrome, the brain chemistry of Down syndrome is very similar to the brain chemistry of Alzheimer's, and that is the amyloid B protein in the formation of the brain plaques and tangles. And consequently, people with Down syndrome will start to show a cognitive decline, probably, but not certainly, in their 50s. And so part of the plan is going to have to be that Angel early on can probably be okay managing her own routine with a roommate, but at some point she probably is going to need a caregiver. And of course, at some point, she's not even going to be able to live in her apartment. The caregiver probably will wind up in a Medicaid facility. However, since John and Michelle are emerging affluent parents, by the time 25 or 35 years from now, 40 years from now, when this happens to Angel, they will probably be uh, uh, wealthy enough to where they're not going to want to have anything to do with a Medicaid uh, care facility. They'll want a pet private pay for it, and they probably will be able to if everything goes well with John's career. John will die at 84. Uh, by the way, when he actually retires at 70, he will pull Angel onto his work record. When he dies at 84, that uh, benefit for Angel jumps from 50 to 75 percent. And I assume that uh, Angel dies at age 70 in the year 2065, and with that, we'll look at the spreadsheet. So, I think, can you all see this? I'm afraid, you know, I didn't think about uh, Excel with its 10-point font. So I hope you can. Oh, I, let me get my laser pointer, and I can probably do it better that way. By the way, I learned very early on when I was uh, doing public speaking, the audience can tell when you're nervous because you start doing this, you can't focus on anything. Well, anyway, in the spreadsheet that I built, um, I can enter the father's and mother's age, the child's age, and these bold numbers are years when something changes, when items of income or expense start or stop or change significantly. And I have a space here for angel's income. And because it's an Excel spreadsheet, if I get a family with, uh, it says personal annuity here, that would be uh, for a structured settlement out of a tort lawsuit, I can uh, change that, uh, that um row or add a row for child support or whatever else the child has. So I track the total income. By the way, uh, if any of you starting to, to look at the uh, detailed numbers, I don't think you have the spreadsheet, but th th these numbers were in error because when I was uh, calculating that Angel would probably have her SSI decked when she was in college because she's getting room and board, so naturally her SSI gets decked. But I I uh, decked it for the entire year and not for the four months that she's actually there. So in this spreadsheet, as I was looking at it last night, I was thinking, oh man, you know, I should have double checked this a long time ago. Um, so here's the expenses, the three categories. And so Angel's income, less the total expenses, is the money that's going to have to come from Angel's parents or her trust. And what you're going to see when I do, uh, go to page uh, sheet two on the spreadsheet, uh, I've got the trust funding and trust distribution uh, plan. And all of those years uh, when John and Michelle are supporting their daughter out of com uh, current income are zero for that trust distribution. And so here's the items of expenses. And so based on what I was telling you about, when Angel... Uh, Angel you attorneys will know this. To keep the SSI from being uh, decremented, it's appropriate for the parents to charge their child rent for renting a family home. Perfectly legal. So at least for these years when Angel is actually living with them and not off at college, they're charging her rent. But in this year, these, this is the two years where Angel is going to live in an apartment. And 
you don't have to scroll it back up, but you'll find that one of the lines on the income line uh, is angels, roommates, uh, rent, share of the rent. Because, uh, and that's going to be this number here. And I treated that as income, but it's actually the roommate paying the $525 a month, if I remember correctly, for her share of the apartment. So back to the expenses. This is working better than I thought it would. Thank you, sir. Um, here's the year when they buy the condo. And this is the down payment, the furnishing of the condo, and the moving expenses. The condo mortgage itself is down here. And by the way, Denver, a very expensive housing market. The median uh, price of a condo now is about $291,000. It is actually $6,000 higher than it was when I did this spreadsheet back at the first of the year. And it's going up at about 10% a year, creating a major problem for uh, support and independence for people with Down syndrome or Asperger's or whatever. So here's the various things. Uh, John and Michelle are affluent enough to, pr uh, pr to hire an Uber cab driver for Angel's Transportation so they don't have to drive all over Denver. Um, healthcare, uh, this is out of pocket, um, for, primarily for uh, vision and uh, dental. Utilities, food, personal, all the normal stuff. Uh, travel, for Angel travel with family gifts. Why should not a person with a disability have money to give gifts to the people they love like everyone else? Why should they be treated differently? But that's all the government recognizes they need to provide is money for room and board. So the family's gonna have to provide money so the angel can give Christmas presents to her brother and sister, can give birthday presents to her mom and dad. Education, here's Eastern New Mexico University Roswell, a one-year program. And if you'll scroll down to the last chart, what you're going to see, what this is, uh, is John starting a special needs trust and paying the administrative fees for the trustee, but not the asset management fees, which are always decremented from trust returns. So if you scroll back up to the top and move over to sheet two, just uh, move horizontally. So you'll see that it just continues on. Um, here is where Michelle, or actually um, Angel gets an SSDI check on her work record. Actually, that looks like, uh, no, that's Michelle, 62. This is SSDI on Michelle's work record. If we scroll further and don't do it, well, actually it is here. Here's the SSDI on John's work record at 70. So you can see how it works. I'm doing autofill for a lot of things, so I'm not worried about small stuff, but I'm trying to catch the years when something changes. And this is what it looks like. Now, sir, if you can go to trust funding. Now, one of the interesting things about doing trust funding, when you have highly uneven uh, income and expense streams, things happen that are absolutely counterintuitive. So I had a strategy that John and Michelle would incrementally fund the trust $20,000 a year. And of course, that's within the gift tax uh, annual exemption um, for a couple. It turns out this trust will fully fund with just this contribution because when you incrementally fund a trust up front, you know, this uh, money can earn returns on investments, it's just like the way whole life insurance works. And it starts to accumulate for paying distributions in the outer years of uh, Angel's life when those expenses are going to climb. Every model I have ever seen for estimating lifetime support and trust funding for a person with disability is wrong, flat out wrong. Why? Because you plug in, I've seen the website that does this, I won't say the company that does it, you plug in the dollars per month for support. The number of years the distributions will be made, an assumption for inflation, assumption for rate of return, and any remainder amount you want. And it will tell you the amount to fund the special needs trust, and that's intended to be the amount of life insurance to, to uh, uh, buy. 
Well, what's wrong with that model? The first thing is the parents don't know what that dollars per month is. Is Angel's support going to be um, $2,000 a month? That's actually probably a pretty good number because she's reasonably well, uh, uh, ad she adequately functions. But parents usually don't know that, especially if the child is, is young, you know, grade school, whatever. But the other problem is I guarantee you the lifetime support for a person with a disability is going to increase at a rate greater than inflation, and especially it's going to increase around life transitions such as aging out of school, moving out of the parent's home into an apartment, the death of the first parent, and especially the death of the second. So you've got to do something on a time phase basis, or what you'll find is a, uh, a path of lifetime support escalating over uh, at a rate of inflation when the actual amount of money that probably be required is moving up in stair steps through the 40 years of a life. But anyway, back to the, uh, uh, this. Scroll down a minute and uh, you're going to see in this column under trust distribution something that pops up. And it's this set of numbers here. So, all of a sudden, Angel actually has more, uh, more money than she needs. What's causing this? First of all, uh, the condo mortgage has been paid off. The second problem is her dad started to draw Social Security. Not only uh, the fact that he's been making, uh, you know, uh, maximum, social, maximum taxable income for Social Security purposes his entire life, he's pulling Angel onto a very generous SSDI uh, benefit. And all of a sudden, she's got more money than she needs. So what happens here? Well, I won't give you the solution because this is going to happen in 20 years, and you'll address what's appropriate then. A first-party special needs trust, perhaps, to soak up the uh, excess cash so Angel could stay under $2,000. It could be that we do something very commonsensical that should have been done a long time ago, and that is the $2,000 asset limit was established and you elder law attorneys correct me if I'm wrong, in 1983, was never indexed to inflation. And we need to adjust that number and get it indexed to inflation. Otherwise, what you'll, you'll, you'll have this $2,000 asset limit haunting Angel until the year of her death in 2065. So anyway, you've got to deal with this by some strategy. Uh, but... So you might view this model as a first cut at Angel's lifetime support. What will pop out is some things that uh, you're going to have to address, and that's going to be a conversation with Angel's family. When I did this, I actually had the condominium owned by Angel's trust, and consequently the trust was going to have to pay the mortgage. And then what happens when Angel has to move out of that condo, um, do we sell it? At that point, a huge amount of money is going to dump into the trust, probably adjusted for inflation, somewhere in the order of $800,000. And you know, you attorneys know what happens, and you trust officers, what happens when you grossly overfund an irrevocable trust, what do you got a problem with? Taxes. So that's something that pops up in this model too. And again, it flags for a financial planner and attorney issues the family's going to have to think about. They may not have to solve it now because it's so far in the future, but it will pop up the question, well, gee, who should own the trust? John and Michelle or Angel's um, special needs trust? So the bottom line of what I'm doing here is I'm trying to estimate the trust distributions based on that expense spreadsheet. I've got, oh, please uh, scroll to the very top and by the way, this is an out-of-date model because I've, I've since modified this to have four different years where I can vary uh, the uh, trust uh, returns because what I can do is set a very conservative return for the near-term years and a higher return uh, for the outer years. Uh, you always have to protect the principle of a trust uh, for the distributions for the immediate years. Any of you have ever run across Ray, um, I forgot his name. The guy wrote Buckets of Money, commonly used in uh, uh, managing portfolios for families where there is near-term money, mid-term money, long-term money, and you can invest them with different asset allocations. 
Uh, I don't think trust companies usually do this because it is a pain in the butt. But, uh, but I now, at least in the model, have allowed uh, different buckets of money for different time frames. A couple of things here. One is it turns out that John and Michelle only, this is a surprise. Remember I said earlier that I used to price out trusts that uh, typically hit two hundred fifty to seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, and so this one with only two hundred sixty is fully funded, and it's a very good quality of life. Well, what causes that? One is it was funded early. Two, John and Michelle are good wage earner, or John's a very good wage earner. So when he pulls a Social Security benefit, he pulls a very generous benefit for Angel. There's a counterintuitive thing here that more affluent families who are going to get more support for their child off of Social Security, their, the funding requirement that they've got to meet goes down. It's middle class families may be making only 70% of Social Security max will have a bigger challenge. A lot of counterintuitive things start to pop out when you do this. And that's where the conversations with, uh, on estate planning with the attorneys come in or with the families. And it goes back to something I said earlier. You're going to periodically update the life plan, periodically update this estimate. So as events come into view, you're responding to you know, what you need to. Anything else? I also pay attention to this remainder. And so I've used 70%, 70 years for Angel's um, um, life expectancy, which is median income, medium age. The life expectancy of someone with Down syndrome when Meg was born in 1985, December 23rd, she was a Christmas baby. It's a Christmas I'll never forget. Life expectancy in those days was 26 years, and it's now 70. And everybody says, oh, that's because of better medical care. And that's true. But it misses something much more important. It misses the fact that it was the children born in 1970 or later that had a right to go to public schools as a result of the All Children's Education Act, introduced in Congress by Republican Senator Joel Weicker, uh, can't remember his first name. It's that generation of people with disabilities that went to school and, and consequently there was an expectation that they would be in the community and not in an institution. There was an expectation that this generation of people like my daughter would have a job. And there's increasingly an expectation that they will live in the community in a home of their own. It is well established in studies that someone that leads a meaningful life, an enjoyable life, a quality of life, lives longer. And I maintain that part of the increase in life expectancy for people with Down syndrome certainly is improved medical care. But more importantly, it's because they live a good life and they don't die early of despair. Now the implication in this model is what happens if Angel's life continues to increase? Now bear in mind Having a 21st chromosome, excuse me, um, three chromosome 21 copies produces an abnormal brain chemistry that eventually does produce an early death. The oldest person who died with Down syndrome died, I think it was in April of, uh, of 2014, died at age 82. He's the oldest living person with Down syndrome known in the world. Who knows what Angel's life expectancy is? But one of the things I struggle with when I do estimates like this is how conservative to be. And by the way, one real planning challenge is when a child is medically fragile, and how do you estimate the life expectancy there? I had a client two months ago, the daughter had Rett syndrome, and there's no way to estimate the life support for a life, uh, the lifetime of a child with Rett syndrome. It could be from four to 40 years. So there's always, I do the best I can. There isn't, I can't always quantify what I'm trying to build into a plan. And, and families need to understand that. I can't predict the future, nobody can. But I, I pay a lot of attention to this 
the remainder value and how many more years will that support Angel if she does outlive her lifespan? I can have a conversation with John and Michelle to say, well, right now, um, the remainder value in this trust will support Angel for another uh, 32 months approximately. Is that conservative enough? Maybe we need to fund another year or two so that this remainder value can go for an extra five years. There's no good answer here. And you don't have to answer it right now. If Angel's going to live for 45 years, I can come back, or somebody can come back at some point and say, you know, maybe uh, things are going well. Maybe we ought to uh, build a little more conservatism in the plan. This is what I would call dynamic planning. And it's not the kind of planning you get when you focus on a person's disability. And last thought, and I'll throw this open for questions. I really wanted to thank David McGuffey for inviting me here. Because uh, I'm passionate about speaking to parents, but also passionate about speaking to professionals like you. Because I thank you for being here. As a parent, I can say this. I've been a member of the special needs community for 30 years. It's a tightly knit community, and it's a community of people who've experienced something that no one else in our population has experienced. It is a tightly knit community, and it's a community that knows they need professional help. And I thank you for being here, and I thank you in advance for your dedication, your honesty, your skills, and your caring to help this population. As a parent, I can say, I, we need you, and we need more financial planners. We need more really good trust officers because that's the future of our children. So anyway, questions? Oh boy, bored everybody. Oh, yes ma'am. So I have a question about this. Oh, by, by the way, I'm, David, am I messing up by walking around and the filming? No, okay. So I had a question about a child that works like you were talking about Angel and then is there any point at which her income affects her ability to draw on dad's social security, the CDB no. benefit. And the reason, and by the way, if I say anything and, and you elder law attorneys say, oh, that's wrong, speak up, because the last thing I want is people leave here with a uh, uh, incorrect information, but uh, social security disability income. Well, by the way, for Social Security itself, not SSI, you have old age survivor dependent uh, and dependent. So when a child has uh, a, a, a parent either die or draw Social Security benefits, if they're below 18, they can get a dependent or a survivor benefit, depending upon whether the parent's still alive or not. When they're an adult, they get converted over to an SSDI check. And the reason why that happens is it starts the clock counting for Medicare. So. But because Social Security, dependent, survivor, and disability insurance is an entitlement program, you're entitled to benefits because either you paid the taxes or your parents did. The fact that Angel works doesn't affect her SSDI. It does affect her SSI. And those of you who the older attorneys know this, it's a dollar for dollar decrement for unearned income like child support which is one reason why we get in some really interesting strategic issues with divorce. And it's a 50 cents on the dollar decrement for earned income. And of course, there's the $20 you get to keep uh, for unearned and $60 for earned. But basically, yes, SSI gets hit. Now, Colorado is a state where if you're eligible for SSI, you're automatically eligible for Medicaid. And I think about 30 states have that. The other states, you have to do two applications. So what I tell families you gotta watch for is you gotta watch if that SSI goes to zero because it can cost your child the Medicaid benefit which also costs them state services. Now you can apply for standalone Medicaid and that'll restore those services but families need to anticipate that. If dad's gonna retire, draw a big enough uh, check for the child to knock them off SSI, start the process now for uh, filing for standalone Medicaid in Colorado. Uh, what, the question I had was, uh, could we get either, either how, how could we get or make that spreadsheet if we wanted to start doing this kind of thing for <laughs> our clients? Because this is incredible, and I think it's a great tool. Okay. Uh, the question is, uh, can, they get, can you get the spreadsheet? We, we have everyone's email address. We can send it uh, with your permission. Yeah. I told David this. I said, you know, yeah, there's, I'm definitely afraid I'm, I'll give somebody, anybody who ever do 
complex Excel spreadsheets know that the bugaboo of formula errors or cell reference errors, especially when you have a linked workbook. Um, and I'm always fearful of giving out a spreadsheet that has an error in it. But I'm 68. I'm not going to do this very much longer. And I very much want somebody to take over for me. So yes, I'm, I, I, someone asked me a question about uh, the matter material here in my uh, presentation. Can they use it? Could they use, for example, the slides? Absolutely. I've copyrighted it, but I copyrighted it primarily because I didn't want someone to stop me from doing it. But I'm perfectly willing to give permission to anyone else. You, you know, use the slides in your own practice if you want. Just bear in mind that some domains of law are state law, divorce, family law, Medicaid administration rules. And so just be careful to modify anything for the laws in your state. But I'm willing to let you have this information because there's families out there who need your help. Al, what is your experience in taking your spreadsheet work and transferring it into commercially available financial planning software like a, a Money Guide Pro or a Nava Plan to do uh, stress testing, Monte Carlo analysis, and some of the other features that are available now? That's a good question because uh, this really ought to be uh, in you know financial planning software like Money Pro, and it goes back to something that really upset me. This is going to be a little bit of a rant. I've uh, I joined the Financial Planning Association when I got my CFP, and I've been for years trying to get the College of Financial Planning, which does the certification and uh, the training for the CFP test, to have an elective for financial planners who want to move into the space, and I have found them to be absolutely indifferent. I wanted to have the Financial Planning Association having a body of support for planners working in the space, and I have found them to be indifferent. I imagine if I went to somebody like MoneyPro and said, can you design some software to do this? I probably would find the same thing. There, there's 40 million people in this country with a disability. There ought to be people really willing to work in this space because there's a lot of people that can use, use the software, use the uh, services, but I, I found indifference. So where does that leave you? Uh, somebody who is a very good uh, Excel programmer who understands, well, in the case of Microsoft, basic language, or who actually can do um, macros, might be able to automate this to a, an extent that I have never been able to. And by the way, the only real technical issue with the spreadsheet that somebody needs to understand, those of you who know what NPV is, net present value, this is where you can easily screw up because the, the, the formulas for net present value are pretty sophisticated. Everything else is addition or uh, arithmetic. But yes, to answer your question, I would love to see this embedded in structured software with the kind of flexibility that you can uh, do if, then, else statements. I'm not technically good enough in software to program it myself. But I, if any of you uh, have access to somebody like a uh, 19-year-old kid, studying to be the next uh, Steve Jobs, sick him on it. <laughs> Anyone else? Then thank you. And I'll, like I say, I'll be around the rest of, oh, there's a question. Um, I'm curious, um, Gail and I serve as, as trustee for Special Needs Trust, so I'm curious, um, in this family situation, you know, they're gonna rely on the son to, um, it seems like, to handle a lot, and, and mm -hmm. maybe even the daughter. Um, do you encourage, um, and, and maybe it depends on the trustee, but we find so many times where they don't. I mean, the siblings just don't. And so do you encourage the families to go ahead and develop a relationship with the trust company or whomever's going to step in as trustee while the parents are alive, let the siblings meet them to, um, to coordinate. Because again, most of the time, we step in as role as family mm -hmm. when that primary caregiver's gone. So do, do you encourage that? 
Uh, yeah, um, and the question, this actually comes to a, a fairly complicated and, uh, set of family circumstances, and that is fa families are the ones that best know the bonds of love and loyalty that lie within that family. Are the siblings truly committed to the well-being of their brother or sister, or are they not? And of course, you've got single families, and, and they have really do need to look at the professionals. Um, in my experience in Colorado, I'll say this in my experience, and you trust officers speak out if you think it's wrong. Uh, I found most trust officers really uh, value having a letter of intent for guidance because they have discretionary authority and they uh, rely on the guidance of parents. And of course, the parents can write letters of intent that d would cause a trustee to walk away um, primarily because they're afraid of the, what happens if the uh, plan is overly aggressive and the trust is going to exhaust. But I, I typically found trust. I've, dealt, I've worked with you know, some really good people as trust officers. And uh, I guess there's you know, bad apples out there, but I'm not running into them. And of course, I have only a small sample space. But yeah, I, I believe families should really look to professionals that they can trust, whose honesty and uh, integrity uh, will serve their daughter. And for some families, that's, um, it, really, it really means they've got to do some due diligence. It really means they've got to know how to pick a financial planner or an insurance agent. They've got to, they've got to recognize the, uh, the bad apples. Now, tell families that one, a, a certain sign of a bad apple is overly aggressive sales. You want somebody you can work collaboratively and comfortably with, but that's a real challenge. Who, you want somebody on the team the four circles of support, there's the leadership team, which is usually family. There's the next level of team of people providing goods and services. There's the next level of team of people who are brought in on as-needed basis, like a job placement person. And then there's an outer circle of successors for those uh, already on the team, particularly the leadership. Building that circles of support is one of the most difficult challenges the family will face because it's going to have to be a, a set of circles that not only can uh, renew itself as somebody dies or moves away or whatever, it may have to be able to redesign itself if life circumstances change. There's no good solution here. Families just need to be diligent, aware, do the best they can. But I have um, had good experience of families working with trust officers that were really a part of the team. But nobody can replace a mom or dad. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Oh, let David get to you. Is there a national organization uh, for life skills coaches and job coaches, or how do you go about finding those services in your community? That's a really good question. Um, is there an association of life skills coaches? This has long been a real problem in the intellectual disability community. So you can see it. Go to Amazon.com and type in uh, life skills. You won't find you'll find very few books popping up. And the few you see will be for uh, young children, like preschool, elementary school, or they'll focus on an aspect of life skills, like uh, how to teach your child social skills in school. Uh, we just simply have never developed, and this is incredible to me because it's so important to our children, a body of, of uh, expertise, a body of, of literature for teaching life skills. And it's not just someone like a licensed clinical social worker teaching my daughter skills. My daughter is actually in a life skills program. And so it's 32 hours a year. It's an hour and a half a week. So um, that's uh, 48 hours a year. My wife and I spend three times, when she was living with us, spent three times as much with Meg in one week. What we really need isn't coaches to teach the child life skills. We need coaches to teach the parent how to teach the child life skills. And that's not out there. And I just go crazy with these advocacy organizations about, why don't you get it, people? I'm the one who needed to be taught. And I needed to be taught 25 years ago. 
I have gone through life with my daughter, learning things I wished I had known a long time ago. And when will I ever, as a parent, get to the place where somebody's ahead of me and I'm not stepping into a bucket because nobody warned me it was there? It's, a, it's one of the frustrations parents have. Anyone else? We want you to continue to interact with people, but I also want to make sure I get these bio, bios read so that you'll know who uh, these uh, experts are that have agreed to so graciously to come and uh, help us today. Uh, Howie Crooks, he is a friend of mine, uh, but he is also a nationally known elder law attorney. He is a former president of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys. He's a partner of the of Elder Law Associates with offices in Southeast Florida. He's also admitted to practice in New York as well as Florida. He's of counsel with Amoruso and Amoruso in New York. He splits his time between New York and Florida, uh, where his professional practice is devoted to elder law and trusts and estate matters, including representing seniors and persons with special needs and their families in connection with asset preservation, planning, supplemental needs trusts, Medicaid, Medicare, planning for disability, guardianship, wills, and so on. I'm not going to read all of the rest of it. Mr. Crooks is certified as an elder law attorney by the National Elder Law Foundation. Uh, he is also the current president of the New York chapter of NALA. He is a past president of the elder law section of the New York State Bar Association. He was selected as a Florida super lawyer and a New York super lawyer. And I don't know how you can be super in two different states. Uh, Bill Frazier is also uh, going to be with us on the next panel. Bill is a manager of the Special Needs Trust Group and has been with SunTrust Bank for 16 years specializing in trust and estate planning for individuals with disabilities. Uh, the Special Needs Trust Group is responsible for numerous relationships nationwide with individuals with disabilities and their families. And we will stop there. Uh, you get the idea. We've tried to bring in uh, some very well-qualified people to teach. And the last person on this next panel is uh, Patty Dudek. And Patty Dudek is also my friend. Uh, she is a principal of the Patricia E. Kafalis, I'm going to butcher that, it's a Greek name, uh, Dudek and Associates, and is the past chair of the Elder Law and Disability Rights Section of the State Bar of Michigan. Her practice concentrates in elder law, Medicaid, estate planning, estates and trust administration, probate, administrative law, and disability advocacy. Um, as Dudek's practice includes advising and preparing estate planning documents, including special needs trusts, one thing that uh, you may not know, uh, Patty is responsible for setting up numerous pooled trusts in the Michigan area, and she is revered nationally as an expert in special needs trust. Uh, Patty is a fellow of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys. She's been one since spring 2009, and she is a Michigan super lawyer. And I think she probably had to take a phone call, but we will have her up here as soon as uh, she gets back in the room. We will start this session in, well, we can start it now. But I will uh, remind you that if you haven't signed in in the back, uh, we can't report that you were here for CLE or for insurance credits. Uh, again, you will need to pay the... Uh, cost of that. We will bill you for it if you want CLE or insurance credit. Uh, I believe six hours of CLE is $30, so if you need CLE credits, that's what it will end up being. Um, the uh, certificates of attendance, if you want, just want them for yourself, they're on the table in the back. Lunch will be set out uh, shortly. It will be available for you to get during the next break. We highly encourage you to network during the lunch hour, get to know the people in the room because uh, we intentionally structured this as a multidisciplinary 
meeting, you've got trust officers in the room, uh, you've got uh, a CPAs, you've got insurance people, you've got financial planners, and of course you have attorneys. So please network during the lunch hour. Uh, I, this will be a give and take question and answer for the rest of the day, so if you have questions, please ask them. As I said not too long ago, don't worry about uh, how your question sounds. If you are concerned about it, uh, we can edit it out of the, the video. Uh, we're more interested in you learning and getting your questions asked than anything else, or getting your questions answered than anything else. So don't worry about how your question sounds. If you've got the question, I guarantee you someone else in the room does too. So why don't you be the first one to speak up and ask it? Okay, great. <clears throat> good, good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. As David mentioned, I'm from New York and, uh, and uh, Florida. And I'm going to be talking to you today about the trustee's obligations to the beneficiary. And the way I'm going to do that, and since David mentioned this is an unprogram-like uh, discussion, I'm going to um, plant some seeds for discussion, and then we've got Bill up here from uh, SunTrust Special Needs Department, uh, and he's a trustee, so he'll have a unique perspective, and uh, at some point we'll find Patty and we'll get her up here too because she has a lot of uh, perspective to add. What I want to talk to you about is a case that was decided at the end of 2012, December 31st of 2012, uh, the case is in the matter of J.P. Morgan Chase, and I'm going to get this case over to David so he can email it out to all of you. You'll have the case. Uh, the citation is 956 NYS 856. It's a surrogate's court opinion, and it was decided by a very well-known judge in the New York area, Kristen Booth Glenn. Justice Glenn was the dean of CUNY Law School for many years, and she then served as a Manhattan surrogate, and she has a lot of experience dealing with people with disabilities. And this was, at the time, a groundbreaking case. Uh, it was reported nationally, and the question, of course, is uh, what was the ripple effect of this case in, in other jurisdictions? Um, but it lends itself very nicely to the issues that we want to talk about today. And I'm, I'm going to read from the opinion at different points just because the verbiage that she uses so eloquently describes the, some of the astonishing, frankly, issues that are presented by this case and how they ended up getting resolved. And then I'm going to throw it out for discussion. So let me start with the introduction to the case. This case raises important questions about the obligations of fiduciaries, including institutional trustees, to beneficiaries with disabilities of trusts that seek to provide for the welfare of those, those beneficiaries. A review of the history of this trust and related proceedings places the issue in sharp perspective. This history reveals a severely disabled, vulnerable, institutionalized young man wholly dependent on Medicaid, unvisited and virtually abandoned despite a multi-million dollar trust left for his care by his deceased mother. It reveals two co-trustees, one who was personally involved with the deceased and who holds himself out as an expert in planning for children with intellectual disabilities, and one which is a major banking institution neither visiting or inquiring after the beneficiary's needs, nor spending a single penny on him. The history turns brighter after a, serendip a serendipitous Article 7, 17A proceeding, which is New York's guardianship statute for persons with developmental disabilities, where the co-trustees were called to task, educated about available resources, and hired a certified care manager to attend to the beneficiary's needs. That intervention, now after almost four years, has dramatically improved the beneficiary's quality of life and his functional capacity to enjoy what is now a near normal existence in the community. This history and the legal consequences that flow from it should provide a clarion call for all fiduciaries of trusts whose beneficiaries are known to have disabilities to fulfill their unwavering duty of complete loyalty to the beneficiary 
or be subject to the remedies available for breach of their fiduciary obligation. So when I first read this case, the notion that a trustee of a special needs trust that was created upon mom's death, funded with multiples of millions of dollars, that the trustee never took it upon himself to go out and visit with the beneficiary to ascertain what the beneficiary's needs were, was just astonishing to me. But then you get into these um, ideas and concepts, and Bill, this is where I'm gonna ask you to get involved and invite discussion. Well, a trustee of a trust. Well, in a traditional trust setting, we know the trustee manages trust assets, and they're supposed to do a really good job of that. But do we really know how the duty of loyalty extends to a special needs trust and the trustee of a special needs trust? What is asking too much of the trustee? Is it asking too much of the trustee to get involved in care issues, or is that somebody else's responsibility? And what could the mother have done differently here to assure a different result? Is this on the trustee? Is it not on the trustee? So let's start with that question. Bill? Um, thanks. So is that on? First, having the microphone on my head talk, today. Talk directly in. Yes. Yes. My Close. Yes. Good. Can, I, I would assume that my voice can kind of carry and people can hear me nonetheless. Um, so uh, when I first read about this case, this, this to me read as um, a parent's worst nightmare. I mean, this is everything that a parent um, plans for, tries not, tries to avoid at all costs. And I know there was a question earlier, um, or a point raised during Hal's um, discussion with regard to um, trustee who can be involved. Um, sometimes we have siblings that don't get involved, and then we act as the parents and what have you. And so, th at the tail end of, of your comments, um, one of the questions was what could the parents have done differently in order to try and avoid this? And I just want to try and connect those two pieces because it, it really works well together um, when we think about when we're working with our families on the front end to do some of the planning. Um, the, the two biggest questions that come up are who's going to care for my child when I pass away and how much is it going to cost? Um, how's presentation and I want that, that, that spreadsheet as well. Um, uh, really covers the the latter part of that, but who's going to care for my child? And so parents, that's their biggest concern. This is their greatest asset. Um, and what we try to get in place, or at least advise or counsel the families on on the front end, is to have a relationship uh, where there's a trust protector in place. Um, parents will often try and find um, a loved one or a family member or uh, some other individual that they know to serve as a trustee. Um, of course, that question will typically come um, early in the conversation and is always met with absolutely, I'll, I'll, I'll absolutely watch over Angel um, when you all pass away. Not knowing uh, that the, the burdens that come with serving as a trustee, particularly when you have your own family, um, can carry. And so it's an automatic knee-jerk reaction to agree to serve as a trustee, but then on the tail end, when the rubber meets the road, it can really, uh, we've seen, be very burdensome. And I know in talking with Bill, some of the situations that we've discussed in the past, it, it turns into just that. It's an overwhelming situation. So um, kind of a long-winded explanation uh, around the, the last point that you brought up, but uh, the trust protector um, arrangement has always been one that parents are receptive to where you've got a corporate trustee uh, that's in place to handle all of the administration investment management can be involved in the coordination but then you've got somebody that is uh, has a greater level of familiarity with the personal needs of the individual so that they can weigh in on some of the decisions that come for the personal care um, so uh, on the point of the trust protector, and then I set, does somebody have a comment? And okay, I'm going to put so, Bob on the spot and okay. get him to talk about his practice. On, on the point of the trust protector, though, we all need to be careful at, uh, as attorneys and others involved in the administration of special needs trusts, because there are trust protect provisions that will attempt to limit 
the duties and responsibilities Agreed. of the trust protector. And the one that you're describing, Bill, sounds like it would be one that is a more expansive set of responsibilities to look at the actions of the trustee or the inaction of the trustee. Is there a fiduciary relationship being created upon the appointment of the trust protector? Some provisions specifically go out of their way and attempt to create a non-fiduciary relationship to, to lessen the amount of responsibility that the trust protector has. I've seen language and drafted language where the trust protector is specifically um, uh, uh, relieved of any responsibility to monitor the activities of the trustee. So what if your special needs trust has that kind of limiting language? Can you then count on the trust protector to uh, see gaps or holes in the plan here? So yes, I, I, I wanna say I agree with Bill. Having a trust protector can be helpful, but you have to also look at the provisions in the actual document and what was the intent of the creator of the trust in terms of the level of participation of the trust protector. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. I mean, you've, you've, got to, you've got to make sure that that is well understood on the front end and that the, the responsibilities are well understood and that the provisions in the trust accurately reflect the responsibilities that people are willing to take on. Okay, Bob. Howie, I just want to uh, assume what David was thinking about here. I've got a trustee practice of my own in addition to my law practice. i am got about $45 million under management now, and I've gotten to the point where I'm going to be ready to hire another employee, and when I do, I'm going to be hiring a social worker type. Um, and I think that this is maybe an alternative to the, not that we don't, want to have trust protectors under certain circumstances, but those of us that do a good job as trustee, we don't really need to have the trust protector. We're out there doing what we need to do, and I think something else that parents would appreciate having is a trustee that understands that this is a social working kind of job in addition to all the normal financial things that you, that you go through on a regular trust. So I, I was just thinking that I'm actually um, a, the newest addition to the elder law special needs team at Shamless Bonner and Stoffel in Chattanooga, and I am a um, licensed advanced practice social worker with experience in um, special needs and elders. It's kind of a weird component, but as, as I was listening to what you were saying, um, I find that even parents need somebody to help them navigate through the systems, to understand the language, to figure out these kinds of things. And that's really what our practice has decided. Um, it's unique that they have somebody like me in the practice. But I see that that piece, because I'm not sure that a, that a trustee would know what the long-term care implications of being in a bed. I mean, I, I have a client right now who, gosh, what he really needed was a, an, a, a technology evaluation. He's had a massive stroke, but he can't physically do anything. Got that evaluation, and he emailed me the other day and said, the World Wide Web is now open to me. You know, it was not a, a, it was a small thing, but I think that it's a different process of thinking. Yeah, and, and, and if I may follow up on that comment, there is a body of case law that talks about when you do an estate plan for somebody, what obligation do you have to incorporate contingent supplemental needs trust planning into your documents? Whether you knew that there was a disabled beneficiary or even if there were no disabled beneficiaries at the time that the estate plan was created, what obligation do you as the estate planning attorney have to incorporate such provisions? In this particular case, the mom took that step. Her estate plan specifically provided for a special needs trust for the benefit of her son. But I think if you take it to the next step, it's what you're talking about, which is there are family members who are ill-advised and just don't have, I think it's what you were talking about, how like, I don't want to step into another bucket. Well, if you've never served as a trustee of a, a supplemental needs trust, then you're going to step into a lot of buckets. In this particular case, you had an attorney who was an expert 
in representing people with intellectual disabilities. This is not an unknowing individual. And then you had a corporate trustee in J.P. Morgan Chase. And so that's exactly the heart of the question is, what obligation do you have as, as, as trustee when it comes to the fact that you are the trustee of a trust for the benefit of a disabled beneficiary? And does that mean you have some additional requirements beyond just management of trust assets, making sure assets are productive and all of that? And this opinion by Judge Glenn answers that question very clearly and unequivocally, yes, you do. I, th I think, I, yeah, there's more. So uh, with this fact pattern, with this case, would it be an, uh, uh, an opportunity or an obligation of a corporate trustee to say, we, we can't interview or visit because we don't have the skills, but we need to hire a social worker, pay that social worker out of the trust assets to help us serve this beneficiary? So the answer is, and we just, you know, we're going to get to it. That is one of the things that Justice Glenn points out that if you don't have the expertise, and you're gonna hear an astonishing quote from Chase on that point, you have the obligation to hire somebody who does. Yeah, I, I, I would say, I mean, at a, you have got, at, as fiduciary, you have got to get engaged. You have to understand um, your clients. And if you don't have the capability, if you don't have, if, if, if you're in an, an environment where you don't have the ability to get out personally, which you should, then you have got to get people engaged and form a team so that the, the care needs of that individual are being met. And the fact that there's a, a multi-million dollar arrangement here and someone who is just dying on the vine in an institution um, it, with with no action on the part of the trustee is just deplorable, and I and I, you know, I, it's very frustrating to read this case um, because there's so many different things that could have been done differently, um, and, and to make sure that that individual was taken care of. And I think that it, you know, f from my perspective, um, if I were in that situation, if I were not able to get out to personally see the individual, it starts with a case manager so that they can at least provide an evaluation of the situation, provide recommendations, and be able to sit down and go through what are the needs of this individual, what is the team of people that we need to assemble. We have assets here specifically designed to provide for the long-term care needs. And we've got to assemble a team of people around this person um, at a minimum and have regular check-ins, monthly reports coming in. So one of the trusts that we administer, in the trust document itself, it requires us to provide for an annual visit and to provide for a care manager. Is that an option, or do you think that's a good option to actually have in the trust document? I do, but I also question whether a once-a-year visit is even enough. But, well, if you're getting, but I guess if I'm you're thinking getting, it would have maybe prevented what sure, happened. Sure, of course, at, at a minimum right. once a year. And then if you're getting regular reporting back and other ways of getting feedback as to the well-being of the individual, then sure. But you have a case here where you had two trustees, one an attorney and one a, a corporate bank trustee, who literally did absolutely nothing. I mean, we haven't even gotten into uh, the next piece that I'm going to read from the case goes to the amount of money in the trust and the amount of income generating during the relevant accounting period that the judge forced upon these two co trustees. That's how she backed into it. She forced them to file an accounting for a period of time to see what the income was and the assets. And then there's a, a, a statistic that I'll read to you having to do with how much of the money in this trust was spent on the care needs of the individual, and it is minuscule. I think what Chase is probably going to say to this is, our job is to manage these funds, and we did a great job at that. So the idea that we're in the business of hiring social workers is beyond the scope of what we would ever think we would want to do or have to do. But I also think that with regard to the attorney who was a trustee and who was supposedly an expert with uh, this particular population, 
One, I don't know if these two parties ever were communicating beyond, like you said, some regular maybe monthly report, and that monthly report probably just reflected the assets and the growth of that type of thing, not communicating as to the individual that this was set up for. So for me, I'm holding the attorney um, to a higher standard because, first of all, you're telling me and you're, you represented to this mother that this is what I do, this is what I know, and that is probably why she felt comfortable adding you into this whole um, um, plan for her child. But also I think that what, what we've, what happens so many times with people is that the idea of the work involved in trying to ensure that someone else is going to have a quality of life that we take for granted, that we have to recognize so many people, so many people are not committed to that. And you have to try to figure out who those people are on the front end who are committed to that. And that's a great point, and I think this is where we have to look at the point I was trying to make earlier about how the mom did a really good job with her documents, but in this particular case, it's not clear from the opinion what efforts she made to educate her appointed trustees and to give them information about how she wanted her son cared for when she knew that he was disabled that's why she set up the trust to begin with for his benefit. Patty, did you have something? I'm wondering if a trust protector would have been helpful in this particular case. For example, if there was a third party who said, okay, if the trustees aren't doing what they're supposed to do, we can have a meeting or remove. Yeah, we actually had a little brief discussion about that. Sorry. Uh, and <laughs> and the, the whole question centered around how much authority are you giving the trust protector or are you limiting the trust protector's involvement? So that may or may not have worked here. All right, let's move on. So after probate of Marie, that's the decedent's will, in the guardianship proceeding, this court, sua sponte, ordered the attorney and Chase to account as trustees of Mark's trust, noting questions have arisen as to whether the funds intended by Marie to benefit Mark had been duly applied for such purposes by her chosen fiduciaries. Schedule C of the accounting shows commissions paid to the trustees in amounts of 17600 to the attorney and 35000 to Chase. This is in the relevant accounting period, um, which I think spans something like five years. Significantly, Schedule G1 shows income on hand of $248,000. Distribution of income shows $0. So $248,000 in the relevant period of accounting came in. $0 was distributed. The statement of administrative expenses chargeable to income totals 29,000, of which the largest, largest items are the commissions paid to the trustees. So, you know, they got their commissions, they, they managed the assets, but they didn't do anything to, to look after the, the needs of the individual. Um, and then there were some taxes and other amounts that came out. The only amount that was paid for an elder care services, a care management firm, was for $3,525. And according to the court, this being the only money paid out for Mark's benefit in five years, that's 1.4% of the income on hand at the end of the accounting period and 3.6% of all expenses. On an almost $3 million trust, the money spent on the beneficiary over a five-year period and only because of the court's intervention, so I guess the court got involved and immediately said go hire a care manager, was approximately 0.1 of a percent. So this is, you know, all of this is going on. You've got a person who's severely disabled in the community with nobody quarterbacking this individual's needs or spending any money that the mom thought that she was preparing in advance to have available for the care needs of this individual. Now, so then the question is, well, what did the trustees know about this? Well, we know that the tr attorney trustee was personally involved with the decedent and knew the child. Okay? There's information here that in October 2006, the attorney brought a proceeding to have a guardian appointed on behalf of Mark. And apparently he had promised to do that to the mom. In support of his petition, he submitted affirmations from two healthcare providers. One described Mark as profoundly mentally retarded, suffering from autism, as well as nonverbal and engaging in numerous repetitive and self-stimulating behavior, behaviors. A second report 
provides a diagnosis of autism and mental retardation, noting that Mark was nonverbal and requires constant supervision and assistance with all ADLs, and as well that he engaged in frequent aggressive behaviors, including spitting, throwing objects, and hitting his own head. I mean, this is an individual that when you read the description, this is a person who required a significant amount of care and involvement, and yet there's nobody, but the money is sitting there and the trustees have it. So again, we're back to that same issue. Any comments so far, or I'll continue? So the thing that jumps out to me is that the point you made about the mother doing, doing the documents but no follow-up, and, and to, to her point, knowing who in the community does do special needs planning and does have a, a broad network of uh, care managers and that whole network that you need, it, it, this just screams to me doing a document is meaningless if you don't have the right trustee and the right uh, education for the people surrounding that person, if, whether they're siblings. And, um, but to her, to her point about Chase is going to say this isn't our responsibility, we manage the money, that's a CFP, that's a wealth manager role, that's not a trustee role. So to me, if all they're doing is managing the money, then why are they being paid a trustee's fee? They should be getting a commission or whatever they make on their, their, their fees for their wealth management, but not a trustee fee. So to me, it seemed like they were dropping the ball in terms of being uh, having an, an additional responsibility, which um, which wasn't happening in terms of reaching out to the community and, and finding out what the person's needs were. And if they were that egregious, then it's almost like uh, it wasn't just negligence, it was, it was gross negligence that they weren't doing something. Any other? So I'm not familiar with this case, but something that jumped out to me was I was wondering if any remaindermen of that trust had influence over the trustee or the attorney or a relationship with them that might have been the cause of all of this. So good question. He did have a brother who was separately provided for. So there was no commingling. It was a separate tr uh, sub-trust and, and, and with special needs language in it to preserve government benefits that was created for Mark who was the child with a disability. Um, the opinion doesn't talk to us about the role that the brother played, could have played. We don't know about the relationship between the two, but it is a good question worth exploring. Um, and, and I think how you alluded to it too, um, you know, what is the role, what, are the, what is the role of siblings and what, what set of instructions do we give them and is it appropriate to give them responsibilities and what about issues of resentment because the child with the disability got a lot of attention but the child who is not disabled did not and is it even appropriate to expect that they're going to get involved so we don't know that from the opinion i just want to add my two cents worth sorry there was a question earlier about um if putting a provision in the trust related to the required meanings would be a good idea or not. And I, I, just to answer a question from my own personal experience, I had similar cases in the past. So not only do we have the annual evaluation, but we also have a provision that requires the trustee or its agent, and we do not define who the agent is. So it could be a family member, but it could also be a care manager to personally visit the person. And we give the family the option of how frequently they personally visit the person. The most common one is quarterly, but sometimes they do monthly, it, it, whatever, it's on the family's choice. But then the visit with the person with the disability has to take place out of the sight of caregivers. So that if there appears to be a dispute between the individual beneficiary and their caregivers, they could speak candidly to the person. And that's a very um, uh, compelling statement to put in there. And, and we really struggle to force the trustees to do it. But it's interesting to see because most abuse and neglect of people with disabilities can frequently happen from their caregivers. 
And so this allows there to be that discussion. I also just wanted to mention that um, we heard earlier about these wonderful letters of intent. And part of what I used to tell my folks to do, I'm not used to, I still do, um, with the letters of intent is give those to other people, including siblings and friends and family, so that if they get alerted that something doesn't appear to be happening that was in the letter of intent, sometimes the way to resolve the dispute is an advocate on behalf of the beneficiary comes and says, well, I have this letter of intent and it doesn't seem like you're doing what you were supposed to be doing. Can we fix this? And my question was, did the guardian who got appointed for this young man start this? Is this how it got to court? The way this got to court is that the attorney who was a co-trustee of the trust had promised, and I'm about to read language to that effect from the opinion, the mother that he would seek guardianship. And when he sought guardianship, the judge was insightful enough to realize that, wait a second, you're seeking guardianship, there's a trust over here, and she backed into it by, because she didn't really have jurisdiction over the trust, but she required an accounting of their use of the monies, and when she saw the numbers, she realized that this person was not being properly cared for. I mean, it really was a case of, of uh, that's why I spoke so highly of uh, uh, Judge Glenn, where she saw something that not everybody might have seen. They could have just gone through the guardian proceeding and said, well, okay, you're telling me you need a guardian appointed here. I'll appoint the guardian. You got to trust. So that means that this person's, you know, has a pool of money and is being well cared for. But she saw through that and she backed into it by imposing a requirement that really was not otherwise there. I suppose there could have been an appeal on, you know, you have no right to request this accounting, but that's not what happened here. All right, moving on. I, just, I may have missed it, but did you say where the beneficiary lived? Was it in a facility or? Uh, I didn't say it, but I do know that the beneficiary lived in a, an institutional okay. setting. Okay. At the initial hearing on September 18th, 2007, where Mark's presence was excused, the attorney revealed that although he was applying for guardianship as a result of a promise to Mark's mother on her deathbed, he had not seen Mark since Mark was six years old. I think he's like 16 at the time of this opinion. When Marie brought him and Charles, Mark's brother, to the attorney's law office, the attorney had never visited Anderson, the facility where Mark resided, to ascertain Mark's condition, nor, more critically, his needs. Nor had he inquired of the staff about any unmet needs, also revealing the existence of Mark's trust and his position as co-trustee, the attorney admitted that he had not expended a single dollar on Mark's behalf in almost three years. I, the judge, adjourned the hearing to permit the other co-trustee to appear. Subsequently, a representative of Chase came to court with the attorney in response to my instruction. Chase's quote-unquote excuse for inaction was its lack of institutional capacity to ascertain or meet the needs of this severely disabled, institutionalized young man. If the bank lacked such expertise, I noted, they should obtain the services of someone who could assess Mark's situation and ascertain his needs. After some initial missteps, the attorney and Chase retained the services of a certified care manager with extensive experience with people with intellectual disabilities. So there, that's what we talked about. Could the trustee have gone out and hired somebody if they didn't have the expertise? And that was exactly the argument that Chase made. It's like, look, don't look at us. We don't have the expertise to do this, but so is there an obligation when you're acting as a trustee of a special needs trust to say, wait a second, either we're not the right people or you better make sure that we have the ability to hire the right people in order to properly care for this disabled beneficiary? Howie, one of the questions that elder law attorneys are always asking themselves is, who's my client? They're doing this intense evaluation on the front end before they ever take it. Is that something in the special needs trust context, is that something that the trustee should be asking, can I, t can I handle this matter? Can Do I have the expertise to go out and evaluate the beneficiary? Do I, if I don't, do I have the authority to hire someone to help me under the trust as it's currently drafted? Is, is that something that you think trustees should consider on the front end before they accept the role? Well, clearly, I think the answer is yes, but in terms of like if you have a different source of payment, which I don't know why you would necessarily because usually the 
S&T funds can be used to pay the costs and commissions of a trustee. But if there's ever a question about who your client is, similar to the planning that we do for the elderly and government benefits planning and children that we deal with and overbearing children and overintrusive children, are they only interested in the assets or do they really care about mom or dad? I would argue that in the case of a supplemental needs trust of which you're acting a, as a trustee, you have the obligation to act in the best interests of the beneficiary who's disabled. I, 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 don't, I don't know if I really care like who signed a retainer agreement or what other kind of documentation or paper trail you have or who else you may feel an obligation to. And I think that this case is, is supportive of that position that you clearly have an obligation for the care needs of the individual. And if you, don't, if you don't think you can meet those needs, I think you had an obligation here to resign or speak up and say to the, you know, um, to somebody, like the Chase could have reached out to the individual attorney trustee and said, you know what, we got appointed here, and by the way, this is reason to discuss with a corporate trustee in advance, I'm drafting the trust, do you have any special requirements before I put you in there? That would have been a good time to know that, hey, we don't really handle these kinds of trusts. Um, but they could have reached out to the attorney who has experience with intellectual disabilities and representing those clients to say, hey, uh, this, is not our, this is not our expertise. Do you have the expertise? And let's talk about division of responsibilities. And that goes to your comment about cross-communication. What kind of communication was had between Chase and the attorney? And it's not clear from the opinion. Allie, I, I would love to put a little spin on what we've been talking about. What do you do in a case like this if you don't have millions of dollars? Because usually we don't, in my experience. I've got one case where I'm the trustee. The guy's got about $100,000 in trust. And just to give you a few examples of the things I deal with on practically a daily basis, he's always in these domestic disputes with his wife and he gets arrested, or he's driving without a license and he gets arrested. And then he wants to go pay the court costs and he has to take some sort of 150% loan, I'm not kidding, 150% interest on this loan, and he's not paying the electric bill and now he's got bed bugs. But we only have $100,000 in this trust. So what is the trustee's responsibility and what should the trustee do in a case like that? Well, they should call Hal <laughs> and figure out how they're going to make all this money last for the life expectancy of the individual. But the harsh reality is that we all know not every case is sufficiently funded to properly care for an individual with disabilities. So I don't have a better answer than that other than to suggest that in some cases, Perhaps a pool trust would be helpful. I know that in low asset cases, we tend to think of using a pool supplemental needs trust, so that might be another way to approach it, but it's not gonna change the fact that there's still only $100,000 in assets and the person has needs that can't fully be met by government benefits. Yeah. So I, I, I had just two quick questions. I'm sorry, go ahead. Why, thank you. Um, well, actually, they weren't questions, they were statements, I guess. Um, the question about who is the client and should they look at that ahead of time, I think I agree 100% with you, Howie. It's not about who the client is. The issue is competency of the person accepting the job. And if they're not competent to handle it or don't have capacity and aren't willing to hire someone, they should just decline the representation. But also, the attorney drafting the document who checks with them and says, you know, are there provisions you want in here? The attorney has a similar obligation to say, hey, look, there's some obligations in here you need to know about and how to handle them. And then my third one is to the statement that was just made about the pool trust or someone with a small amount. I was going to also suggest the pool trust or the charity that runs the pool trust will often also act as a trustee of the um individual trust, or they will act as agents of the trustees for even bigger ones. So for example, in this case, the bank could have hired the uh, them as their agent to do some of this for them, and they can be creative about how they respond to it. Yeah, no problem. Um, so coming back to the $100,000 trust with the gentleman with domestic issues and bed bugs, you know, in my... First of all, first comment, welcome to the party. I mean, th this is the world of special needs trust. Um, you're you're going to see a lot of uh, things that will really raise your eyebrows. 
I would say that um, inaction is far more detrimental. Everybody, document everything. Communicate, this trust is not gonna last your lifetime. We've gotta meet these needs. We know that they're critical. Continually document the fact that the trust is depleting. Um, the comments about going to a community trust, I think that's great. There's a process involved that comes with that that doesn't stop the need today. So, I mean, it's, it's a good option to look at for an end result down the road, but it doesn't stop um, that need immediately. Being able to document every, and justify your decisions and make sure that that is captured in writing and to the extent that you're able, get that information out to your client, the beneficiary, the representative, having somebody sign off acknowledging that communication and having that in your file. Um, unfortunately, we as trustees, we find ourselves in situations where we have to protect ourselves from a liability standpoint. It comes with it. Um, and that's it's particularly when you get into um, trusts that are depleting, uh, there's a great opportunity for that liability to come back. So um, documentation and, and reasonable action justifying the, the decisions that are being made is the best you can do because it's not going to last forever. My question is about, it's twofold really, what are the implications of the attorney who's drafting the trust and doing the planning for mom then nominating himself essentially to be the tr a co-trustee? Um, is that frowned upon? Is that a good practice? Who's doing that and what's your experience with that? And then secondly, I've, I've had some resistance in my clients uh, to naming corporate trustees um, and, and then even a higher maybe level of frustration with clients who are, when I then say yes and now we need a, a, a corporate trust protector um, and, and who, if someone doesn't have extensive family to draw upon that's reliable, who are you all recommending in those roles? Great, great questions. Um, How about we raise hands if you're including yourself in the documents? Okay, so let me take a crack at the, uh, there's a few other items though worthy, I think, of addressing there. If I'm asked to act as a co-trustee of a, uh, or a trustee of any trust, I get a document which essentially states by the person asking me to serve in that capacity that they understand that I was the attorney drafts person of that trust and that there you know, may be an appearance of impropriety or potential for conflict, but I understand that, and I am choosing to nevertheless ask this person to serve in that capacity in case there's ever a problem down the road. I just don't want it to look like I infused myself into the process. I really want to document well the fact that other, even the document actually says, other alternatives were discussed uh, and those options were considered, and I have still chosen to ask this attorney to serve. So I think you may wish to consider doing something along those lines. The other thing is, are you gonna allow yourself to be a trustee? You're gonna allow yourself to be a trust protector? I do find that the trust protector is the one position that is so difficult for so many people to fill. Um, we like to have it be somebody who's independent, and a lot of people struggle with who that person can be. So here again, invariably, I end up getting asked to serve in a variety of different trusts uh, as the trust protector. But having said that, I've had cases with Social Security where the fact that I was the trust protector saved the day with a one-page exercise of trust protector, particularly with a change in the POMS, where I had a 2010 trust that wasn't reviewed by Social Security until 2013, and by then, I don't remember if it was like the companion or travel expenses provisions that changed. So when I wrote the trust in 2010, it was a perfectly fine provision. By then, the POMS came out, and then it wasn't okay, and I had already changed my language, so my new trusts were okay. My beneficiary called up and freaking out, saying that I drafted a, 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 a defective trust to my paralegal. And her benefits were being suspended by the end of July of 2013. And what, what, what were we gonna do about it? And I, of course, paralegal comes running into my office. This is what she said, and I'm freaking out. Like, oh my God, I drafted a defective trust? What, what did I do? 
And when I realized and looking at the trust that it was the old provision and I had to actually guess because I hadn't spoken to the Social Security representative yet, then I did speak to the representative. She verified for me that it was exactly the issue I thought it was. Literally took me five minutes. I didn't have to go back to court because I was the trust protector. And I just said, I'm taking out the bad language and I'm putting in the new, sent it over to the uh, Social Security office, and guess what? Her benefits were not suspended. So I think it's incredibly powerful to have these roles filled. Howie, you mentioned uh, co-trustee relationships, division responsibility, decisional roles. A lot of parents view um, a, a structure where they retain decisional responsibility for quality of life, and the corporate trustee invests the money, administers the trust, makes distributions. I realize that's going to raise questions, particularly for a corporate fiduciary, limiting their fiduciary responsibilities. Would you describe how a corporate fiduciary would view this, the disadvantages, and what needs to be put in that trust so that the corporate fiduciary is comfortable serving as a co-trustee with a parent? I, I'm going to, I think that's right up Bill's alley. So, we... We see corporate or um, co-trustee arrangements, um, and on the front end, when the planning is taking place, it's really having an in-depth conversation about what the responsibilities are, who is going to handle what aspect of the numerous aspects that go into <clears throat> caring for the individual. If we, so it, it comes down to the language. We want to make sure that everything is documented properly. <clears throat> um, and I, I appreciate Howie's uh, comments earlier. If the trustee has got some, some language that they want inserted into the trust, you've got to reach out to them and get that information. I think this situation lends itself perfectly to, to that comment. Um, you've got to make sure that everything is clearly defined. And if, the resp if, if it is the duty of the corporate trustee to only administer uh, the terms of the trust, uh, handle the investments, and has no obligation for the care needs, has no input, then that should be very clearly defined and have language in there that the corporate fiduciary has got no liability for the failure to act on the part of the co-trustee. Um, now that can get uncomfortable because at the same time, you know, I, I think about my, if, if I had a trust like this um, on the books, I would still, in my mind, feel obligated to make sure that that individual, the, the needs are being met. Um, what if I hadn't heard from mom and dad for a while? What if mom and dad were injured? What if they went on vacation? What if, you know, they were in the hospital? There's something, you know, it... So I think that there's still a, a duty, and I mean, my God, particularly after you hear this case, I mean, you, you, you're, you're, chills you. So I could see doing that, but there's still some caution that has to come with it. And having that language um, very clearly implemented into the trust is going to be critical. And the planning on the front end, the conversations on the front end, documenting everything is going to be critical. I just wanted to add uh, another comment about who's acting as successor trustees or potentially as trust protectors. We have, at least in my state, we have a lot of charities, organizations who will act as paid advocates. What that means is they will act as rep payee, they will act as agent under a power of attorney, they will act as guardian, and they will act as trustee or trust protector on behalf of the person with a disability whose family um, is not around. Um, and they don't charge nearly as much as a lot of caregivers do because they usually have a case manager on um, call anyway. So like our um, our Alliance for the Mentally Ill will do it, our UCP does it, our Protection and Advocacy does it, and it's a really nice way for them to bring in funds for their charity, but it's also more cost effective for a lot of people to be paying them $40 an hour for their social workers who know the system better than you know, some care managers who are more used to working with folks who have a traumatic brain injury or geriatric care manager or something, so it's another suggestion. Okay, 
uh, continuing on, there's two more parts of the opinion I'd love you to hear, and uh, then uh, another final point about a trustee's obligation to the beneficiary that I'd like to just throw out there. So here, this part of the opinion talks about the care manager, and this is a really a happier part of the, the opinion, uh, talking about the benefit that the care manager had once she was brought into the case. So she reports on Mark's pharmacological regime at the same time that she recommends an independent neurology consult with a non-Medicaid neurologist and a speech evaluation to determine appropriate augmentative communication devices and purchase those devices. So I, I thought that was very interesting right there because we know about the provisions in a supplemental needs trust that says you can spend the money even if it will reduce or diminish government benefits. Well, she determined that a non-Medicaid neurologist was warranted here. It doesn't really say why, but that was her recommendation, and that's a really nice way to see how provisions that we put in the trust are actually taken and used by other professionals in order to accomplish a good result for the beneficiary. Significantly for the issues presented here, care manager reported that Mark currently takes Keppra 500 milligrams, which is covered by Medicaid, however, this medication causes adverse reactions, including physical aggression, agitation, frustration, and vocalizations. Kepra SR, which is an extended release medication, causes fewer side effects, but is not covered by Medicaid. Now, how would anybody know that if you didn't have the necessary background to evaluate a person's uh, pharmacology regimen and realize that the wrong iteration of the drug was being administered and how many times we hear about that about people in nursing homes and all the different kinds of drugs that they're on and nobody's really doing a coordination of the various types and what is the implication of taking this one on that one. Uh, she goes on to recommend the purchase of a personal computer and computer programs for Mark's room, an electric synth synthesizer and or electric keyboard, gift certificates for restaurants and clothing stores, a playground system, and outdoor chairs previously requested, a one-week vacation to Disney World with two staff members on duty 24 hours a day, and a recliner chair with, eight, uh, with massage capabilities. So this is the result of having brought in the care manager. The needs of the individual are finally being met. And if you wanted to read more happy stuff, uh, there is a, a timeline from July 2009 through September of 2012 that the judge goes through at various points of the progression of the care needs of this individual and how they were consistently met by the uh, active participation and the care needs that you know he needed were actually being addressed. All right, so this is the uh, final conclusion of the opinion, and then one other point. As this history de demonstrates, once the trustees were required to make themselves knowledgeable about Mark's condition and his needs, and the availability of services that would enable them to provide for those needs, they began and continued to use funds from his trust for the purposes his deceased mother anticipated and so deeply desired. The history brings into sharp focus the obligations of trustees, both individual and institutional, to the beneficiaries of trusts they administer when they know or should know that those beneficiaries have disabilities and have medical, educational, or quality of life needs that can and should be met from trust income. It is fundamental that a fiduciary takes an obligation beyond those imposed by ordinary relationships or transactions. In the off-quoted works of Just Judge Cardozo, her responsibility is something stricter than the mere morals of the marketplace, but a pinctilio of honor the most sensitive. This is no, the only judges could write this stuff. This is no less the case for trustees who have an unwavering duty of complete loyalty to the beneficiary of the trust to the exclusion of all other parties. So the judge agrees with that position. The Mark Trust empowers the trustees with absolute discretion, gives them latitude to withhold or pay out income, and in the event of an income shortfall, to invade the principal for the care, comfort, support, and maintenance of Mark and his descendants. And there's the, uh, there's, so Mark's descendants, I guess when Mark died, it was to go to his descendants. However, the words absolute discretion do not insulate the trustees, even trustees of lifetime trusts as here, from liability. Uh, 
Article 6.1 purports to absolve the trustees from a duty to account except for a final account. So the trust specifically accepted out an accounting requirement and she made them do it anyway. And here's what she says. That violates public policy and cannot be enforced. And she cites a, a third department case in the appellate division in New York. Whereas here, the beneficiary is a person under a disability and no one is protecting the beneficiary's interests. In an accounting, the court can assess the trustee's failure to take reasonable interest in an action on behalf of Mark. The trustees left Mark to languish for several years with inadequate care, despite the fact that the Mark Trust had abundant assets. In so doing, the trustees failed to exhibit a reasonable degree of diligence towards Mark. Courts will intervene not only when the trustee behaves recklessly, but also when the trustee fails to exercise judgment altogether, even where a trustee has discretion whether or not to make any payments to a particular beneficiary, the court will interpose if the trustee arbitrarily or without knowledge of or inquiry into relevant circumstances fails to exercise the discretion. That is sadly precisely what occurred here. So there you have the parts of the court's decision, a really, um, as I say, groundbreaking decision in this area, and uh, hopefully this is a case that will be cited elsewhere uh, around the country. I uh, just have a few minutes left. I want to uh, mention another obligation, and that is, what about the obligation in terms of spending the money of the trust and the pursuit of government benefits? If the trust can afford services, does the trustee have any obligation to pursue government benefits? Why don't I invite comment on that before I tell you about another New York case that answers that question at least in one direction. Anybody feel yes or no? Depends on the language of the trust. Let's start there. Um, I would say that and there are cases where we need to document that we have, particularly around housing, that we have explored whatever benefits are available. Um, like typically with housing, if we were to look at Section 8, we know that there are long wait lists. So in order to justify the distribution for a home, having that documentation that we have at least explored benefits, um, because typically, at least the documents that we see, are going to instruct the trustee to contemplate whatever benefits are available, then we want to be able to say that we have explored um, the benefits. And if the benefits are not there and available at the time to meet the needs, then we can document that and then justify going out and making the extra expense. Patty? Um, I think this is a thorny issue because Medicaid likes to say they're the payer of last resort, and quite honestly, the trust kind of trumps that. The, the, the trust says don't pay unless you've gotten everything you can from public benefits, so I think there's some tension there, but I agree it's going to depend on the terms of the trust and if you can document that you tried, but I also feel very strongly that trustees of special needs trust all too often get a denial and concede defeat and then privately pay if there's enough resources rather than appealing the denial or appealing the appropriate amount, duration, and scope of services. So if the system says, okay, we're going to pay for two hours a day when they really should qualify for six, all too often the trustees, as opposed to considering themselves as an advocate and hiring an attorney to appeal that, will just pay the difference. So I think you have to have a real close... Um, uh, line. I think um, I have a provision in my trust that actually requires the trustees to defend the trust and to authorize them to hire someone to appeal these decisions because all too often what happened was the trustee, there was an imploding provision that said, oh, if the government benefits go away, you can implode and distribute to the contingent remainders. This was a third-party trust. And all too often, if Social Security said no the first time for SSI or something, those kids wanted to implode and distribute to them. And so I had to put these provisions in there to have the trustees defend. They, I think they need to be more aggressive advocates. I would oh. agree. I'd, I'd say that there's a time to fight and a time not to. You've got to look at what the... Are you trying to be good or are you trying to be right? And Patty's always trying to be right. Sorry. <laughs> Rob, that's right. I sorry, I messed that up. Patty's always right. Um, 
you know, so I, I, I don't want to stray away from this because I think this is an important aspect of the conversation, but I do want to get, just backtrack real quick. In terms of the drafting of the trust in the case that we've just gone through, um, how many of the attorneys in the room go through the motions of describing the nature of the disability in very, very great detail on the front end? Is there a reason why? I, I have done that in some trust, but usually I don't. And actually, I got a call from someone who was a beneficiary. It was a trust drafted by another lawyer. And that beneficiary was outraged that her private information had been uh, divulged to her siblings. And so I, I think you've got to balance that a little bit. I, I, I would say I, I could understand that. And it's got to be written tactfully. Um, as a trustee, reading those and getting trust like that is very helpful for us because it really paints a clear picture of what we are dealing with here. And in the case of corporate fiduciaries, everybody will, will understand this and acknowledge people don't stay in their role forever. Trustees change, your trust officers will change. And so having that information in the trust so that when it's, okay, John, you are getting this account now, let's go over it, you get the document and you can go through and that, that preamble of information is such an attention getter to the new person they can immediately be drawn in. They can never say that they didn't understand the nature of the disability. Um, and, you know, I think that it, it really illustrates that the funds are likely not enough to last the lifetime of the individual, which, you know, leads to the fact of supporting, um, seeking out benefits. Okay, I'll let you, so I'll let you wrap up, Howie. We're yeah. out of time on this. So, how did this court decide? And I'm going to send you two additional documents. The Lorenzo decision out of New York was reported in the New York Law Journal on June 25th, 2013. And then an article titled Analyzing the Unique Duties and Obligations of Special Needs Trust, written by a colleague of mine in New York, Robert Friedman, and several others. And from that, this talks about the Lorenzo case, and I'll just close with this. A trustee also has an obligation to secure and maintain the beneficiary's eligibility for and receipt of government benefits. This obligation was highlighted in a recent decision by Judge Laura Jacobson in a case, the Lorenzo case, involving a corporate fiduciary and an individual fiduciary. The S&T was funded with $422,000 in March of 2003, but only 3,253 remained in the trust by June of 2009, so about a six year period, after the trustees spent $60,000 per year on the disabled beneficiary. So not a case of not spending the money, but spending the money perhaps too aggressively. The corporate fiduciary failed to oversee an application for Medicaid benefits for the beneficiary and instead relied upon the individual co-trustee to obtain Medicaid benefits, another non-communication situation, and to determine what services were required. Judge Jacobson surcharged the Bank of New York as co-trustee of the SNT and ordered it to return $176,000 to the trust for breach of fiduciary duty for failing to make decisions based on the long-term needs of the beneficiary that would extend the life of the trust for as long as possible. The trustee failed to obtain public benefits and that failure caused trust assets to be depleted. And I happen to know that the reason for this is that New York has an extensive home care program and rather than seeking the benefits from home care under New York's Medicaid program, they just paid privately for the services without ever really uncovering that rock. And in this particular case, there was trustee liability for failure to pursue the government benefits. I'm sorry that we are out of time. I have to share with all of you, I loved this discussion. So thank you for all of your participation. Lunch, lunch is available out in the uh, lobby area. You can grab yours, bring it in here. We urge you to network. Um, Howie was gracious enough to come up here. He has a very busy speaking schedule. And I think he has other commitments he, both uh, last week and next week. And he has uh, four kids to go home to. So he's going to be catching a plane. If you want to talk to him, just be understanding he's on his way to the airport. You might, one way to think about the rest of our program is the good, the bad, and the ugly. <clears throat> We're going to start first. Patty, 
uh, and Mr. Wright are going to join me up here and we are going to be talking about distributions. Uh, and I've asked uh, Mr. Wright to join us because he can give us the parents' perspective. Uh, we have trustees in this room who can give us the trustees' perspective and we can give you uh, the attorney's perspective and, and the public benefits perspective. But then after we finish, uh, there'll be another break, but then at 2.30, uh, you'll get DCH's perspective. That's uh, Georgia's uh, Medicaid agency. Um, one of the things that you might want to consider, though, is that HMS is a private contractor who does the trust review, and they're going into more and more states to do special needs trust review, so it's not really just Georgia's perspective. It's the perspective of... Uh, a group of uh, lawyers who work for states and may be coming to your state if you're not from Georgia. I know they have the N North Carolina contract. Is that rain? Is that rain? <laughs> it's, it's, it's light applause for uh, you. Yay! I was I was wondering if if people were applauding applauding early, but. Um, they have the North Carolina contract. I believe they have the Alabama contract. I know they've bid on the Tennessee contract, although they don't have that one yet. Uh, so you're going to want to hear that perspective as well. And then the ugly, uh, we don't always think about what best practices are, but we've got uh, a number of people who are going to talk with us about best practices and the do's and don'ts, what you should or shouldn't do. Um, and. Uh, hopefully they'll help keep us out of trouble so that hopefully we won't do anything that's ugly. I'm going to go ahead and introduce our other speakers. I've already introduced uh, uh, Patty Dudek and uh, Hal Wright, but uh, I know Bill Overman's going to have the roving mic in this next program, so I'm going to introduce him. Uh, Bill Overman was uh, certified as an elder law attorney by the National Elder Law Foundation until retiring from private practice in late 2008. He's a founder, charter member, and past president of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys, as well as a charter member of the Academy's Council of Advanced Practitioners. And he has uh, an AV rating in Martindale. Uh, he works for HMS, and um, he's ma actually made our job much easier. We used to have trouble getting a response or getting any kind of word back on whether our trusts were uh, presenting a problem with DCH and now we can actually get an answer and if there's a problem we can get it fixed early. Thank um, you David. Bob Feckman, you've already heard him, I drafted him to give us some answers. Uh, Bob is a lifelong resident of Indiana, he graduated from Northwestern University with a degree in music and a major in economics and received his JD from Rutgers School of Law. He also attended the University of San Diego's Institute on International and Comparative Law at uh, Magdalen College, Oxford University. Um, and which years were you in the American Boy Choir? So we may ask him to sing for us later. <laughs> uh, and then Mr. Uh, Al Secor, um, I've known of Al since I was a very young lawyer and trying to learn uh, about trust law and went to one of his CLE programs where he began the process of educating me so that I actually understood what trusts were. That was more years ago than I'd like to admit. Uh, Mr. Secor joined FSG Bank in November 2014. He serves as Senior Vice President and Trust Officer. Prior to starting a banking career in March of 1995, he was in private practice of law for 29 years, emphasizing probate and estate planning and state and federal taxation. Uh, he has an LLM. Uh, I will tell you that anyone who practices uh, trust and estates law in Tennessee has probably uh, made the track to sit at his feet and learn from him. He is revered in Tennessee and we've asked him to come uh, today as well. So, with that as a start, let's talk about trust distributions. And one of the things that we might want to think about first is what do the parents really want in terms of trust distributions? And, and you also know from 
30 years of experience with Meg, what would Meg want if we're going to make this trust work to enhance her quality of life? So, so it's a tough one. In fact, from the previous speakers, I was saying, thinking there's several real problems here, but one of them is uh, the trust that doesn't have enough money, and that's pretty common. And so how does the, the trustees or the parents uh, prioritize the spending? And, you know, obviously life-sustaining uh, needs need to be met first, but that's a poignant situation when you have a trust that's underfunded and there's no way it's going to last for a beneficiary's lifetime. And I think sometimes that that's where parents can uh, really benefit by having a corporate uh, co-trustee. I've found that a lot of families aren't good at budgeting. And they aren't, uh, and the natural parental desire to do what they think their child wants um, is also kind of encourages overspending. Um, I, I really f do believe that if you have a substantially funded trust, you need a corporate fiduciary. Most families can't manage in a substantial investments well themselves. The corporate fiduciary will do so much better. But also I think that uh, a lot of families just simply don't, uh, aren't disciplined with spending money. It's a, be frank, that's a problem. But the other half of what David asked is what does Meg want? Here's a dilemma that uh, I think both Howie and you know, Bill alluded to, and that is what happens if Medicaid or state services is not adequate? Uh, and this will crop up with Meg because uh, she's in her own apartment and she's independent, but if she moves to a, a state residence, She's going to lose that independence. She's going to be under 24 by 7, close supervision. And so if I, I'm dead, my, my wife is uh, dead, or we have a corporate trustee, I think the right thing for Meg is going to be keep her in her apartment. But there is that issue of how do you, what's a trustee's obligation to seek out government assistance uh, first, especially when you can quantify the cost of government assistance versus private pay, but you can't uh, quantify the cost of something so intangible as the pride of independence. There's no really good answers here. Um, I, I, I really, I guess bottom line would say, I really value the discipline a corporate fiduciary can bring to the party. And one thing that uh, can be hard to uh, for families to assess too is, you know, if you're looking over a long period of time, is the trust going to run out of money? Um, somebody needs to know that. And I'm on the board of the Colorado Fund for People with Disabilities, and we do a spend plan for all the beneficiaries because Medicaid requires it. And the danger of a spend plan is always something that spending money on something that wasn't allowed for. But um, I, th I really think that between the letter of intent of family rights, the estimate of lifetime support, that's probably something that will help identify when the spending is too aggressive and the danger is running out the back end. Because I know one thing that uh, I don't want to have happen, that Meg, through no fault of her own, she's lived independently for 20 years, and then somebody shows up one day to take her out of her apartment and put her in a state residence, and she doesn't know why. Patty, you... I've been drafting special needs trusts for years. How many pooled trusts have you actually set up? I don't know. That many? <laughs> Not too many to count. Um, I, but I also administered lots so as trustees. What is the tension between the parents and the trustee, or the tension between the trustee and the attorney that might be representing uh, the parents? Okay, so the first question was the parents and the trustee? As the trustee is having to look at the spend plan. The trustee is having to think about keeping enough money in this trust for the probable lifetime of the beneficiary, taking care of needs over the long haul. And you might have a beneficiary or a parent of a beneficiary who is wanting to spend like Santa Claus. 
That's a big problem, especially um, in my experience, I have a real problem with that with D4A trusts where the D4A trust was funded from a settlement account and the family seems to really struggle with the idea or notion that those funds are not family funds. They're the funds of the individual beneficiaries and how you balance that. I think it's a continuing struggle. Um, I think that there, you have to instill upon the family, the parents, that their legal obligation to support their child does not go away, even if their legal obligation to support their child is being handled primarily through SSI. Um, they still have to do it. I think the sole benefit of rule is something that you have to uh, really struggle with. I think a, one way I've learned to deal with that tension is to do a care plan and have it approved by the court ahead of time. And therefore, if there's a big deviation from the plan, um, we have a judge to make the bad guy versus the trustee um, as the bad guy. It helps a lot. But, the, you know, that, that will always be a continuing struggle. I think what, what we just heard was so compelling to me and what, what drives me every day, and that is a lot of families I represent fought very hard to get their kids included in special ed. And if they went through a due process hearing through special ed and or federal court, that's a gut-wrenching experience. I don't know how many of you have worked with families who've been through that experience. Please raise your hands. So we got, we have quite a few. It's expensive, it's gut-wrenching, it's very difficult. If you go through that process and you achieve more independence for your loved one, those parents feel very strongly and aggressively about maintaining that independence, just like as we heard from this wonderful dad next to me. So I think the tension will then sometimes be is a corporate un trustee doesn't understand that. They are um, trying, they are objective. They're not close to the person. They don't understand how to quantify this trauma that the family has been through and why it's so important to keep that in place. And quite honestly, I think I have that same problem sometimes with siblings. They just don't get it. And that's, I believe, Sorry for anybody from a government entity, but I believe, at least in Michigan, that is the intent. They will make it as hard as possible for the family to access the services to maintain the person in their existing living situation. And so the siblings get tired and they say, okay, you can move my sister to this group home because that's all that's available. When they don't know, they have an appeal right or they, they could litigate that. And when you, the attorney, are the one saying, well, fight it. That's what mom and dad wanted. They're saying, you want to fight it because you're going to be the one we hire and get the fees. You know, so the, that tension is so, so difficult. Um, we struggle with every day. And I think that's why, again, the letter of intent is so important because at that point, the intention of the grantors to protect and maintain independence is primary usually in those letters. And if a judge is looking at a dispute between the corporate trustee and maybe the advocate for the beneficiary about what the spending allocations, they're going to look to the intent of the grantors. That is the standard in every state in the country. So there is clear and convincing evidence of their intent in this letter of intent. It's They're going to have to fall back on that. And if it means you deplete the trust to maintain them in their living arrangement, so be it, because that's what the parents wanted. You brought up the fact that you sometimes have to remind parents that they have an obligation of support. I think that was one of the things in the Hobbs case, which I'm sure everyone has either heard about or, or read. And I'm sure that was something in the North Carolina uh, trust trustee guidelines or special needs trust guidelines um, where I was talking about the documentation, the additional documentation that uh, you would need to provide to the North Carolina Medicaid agency if you were uh, going to pay a family caregiver. By the way, speaking of the Hobbs case, if any of you have not looked at the Hobbs case in detail, and I can't remember now how I ran across it, but I ran across, uh, it may have been the court's website, where the various briefs were filed, the amicus brief from NALA, but what was most interesting were the briefs that were filed on behalf of the U.S. government, because there were a lot of things that were included in the Justice Department's brief that did not make it into the case itself and the case discussion. There were some things in there where I think you'll understand a lot more clearly why the Hobbs case came out why it did. 
Just to interrupt, if those of you who are not familiar with the Hobbs case, uh, our colleague David put that in his materials on page 14. The site is there in a summary. And one of the things that happened in that case is the parent, the mother, was providing what she thought was substantial care for her child, uh, and the state took issue with the amount of money that she was being paid as a caregiver. How many of you have worked with a uh, parent who, was, who felt like they were providing more than the uh, normal level of parental care and felt like the trust should reimburse them? And that's, that's a real tension that you have because if you're worried about depleting the trust, uh, paying a parent th you know, thousands of dollars per month, which is probably what they want, uh, really uh, can cause the trust balance to start coming down rapidly. A lot of times I do that, though, intentionally. Um, I call it legally laundering the money. And what we'll do... <laughs> I'm leaving it, now. <laughs> don't leave. I mean, it, I wouldn't do an outrageous amount, but I would pay the parent, and I, including in payment of the parent, create a third-party special needs trust, and part of the parent's wages are going to go to maybe their employee benefit, which is a life insurance policy, which will fund the third-party trust. So our point is to defeat more of the payback and provide for actual liquidity when the parent's not there because we may be paying, paying the parent less than fair market value for the services. And when mom or dad is gone, you have to pay more. So it's, it is a tension, but it's not always a bad situation if you can justify the issue is if you don't know the facts, it's going to look like you're laundering the money. I can hardly wait till we get the Michigan project. You're not coming to Michigan. You're not invited. <laughs> well, Mr. Overman, if you were speaking for North Carolina. Uh, absolutely. Well, actually, I'm speaking at the national level for HMS Trust Services, not for okay. any specific well, state agency. How's well, that? if you were speaking at the national level for HMS Services, there, you all don't know the joke behind that, but um, <laughs> if you were speaking for them at the national level, what kind of evidence would you want the trustee or the attorney representing the trustee to provide to justify payments to a parent, uh, distributions that's to That's very easy. A case manager's evaluation. That's, that's the best documentation you can have because what your case manager will do is, as part of the evaluation, they will show you what it would cost to go out in that community and get those equivalent services. And as long as the documentation shows that you're not paying the parent more than it would cost to get those services at market rate, as far as I'm concerned, there's no problem. Okay, you can come back to Michigan now. That, of course, is my personal now. opinion. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Bill. Can you pay the equivalent rate to a parent as what a trained or skilled nurse would command? If that came in and it was the level of care that would require a trained or skilled nurse, we would want to know that the parent has the ability to provide that same care. Now, what's interesting about that is, let me think which waiver program it is in Georgia. Uh, I think it's the ESPDT program, which is, I mean, most states have a program like that. That's one of those programs that over a period of time, the benefits decline. And the reason that those benefits decline is that the focus of the program is to train the family to provide the services that would otherwise require a qualified caregiver. But in my personal opinion, on behalf of HMS Trust Services nationally, of course, okay, um, as long as we have some documentation that that parent, that's the actual service they're providing and they've got the knowledge and experience to do it, there is not an issue. And in particular, what we've used in similar situations is private duty nursing seems to be one where we fight with our state Medicaid offices about a lot. Do you guys have that same experience, private duty nursing? Okay. And the definition of private duty nursing is not a really high definition, quite honestly. They don't pay them a lot of money, and they really fight with you about the hours. So what we've what what happened was... This was a child, they had um, private duty nursing, they reduced the private duty nursing doing to budget cuts, so we just let the parents do it because the state said parents could do it. 
And then the trust paid the parent the same rate we were paying under the waiver, and we relied upon that, and it was not a problem. Now, this is one of those cases where I would say you have to choose your battles wisely, because if you agree to that at one point, they're going to do that all... They're going to backtrack what they pay all the time, so you may decide to appeal it first, but that's really good documentation if it was a problem later. I want to, I'm going to pick on uh, Bob again because he uh, serves as a trustee. What are your thoughts as a trustee when you're seeing a request for these funds that, that may very well deplete the trust more quickly than you would like it to be depleted? Well, as you know, I'm very concerned if it's going to deplete the trust too quickly, but I have quite a few cases where it makes a whole lot of sense to me to pay the parents as a caregiver. It's usually mom, let's face it, and she was working before the child was injured, and now she can't work outside of the home because of all the care that the child requires. I don't see why we wouldn't pay her. I usually go uh, a lower rate than would normally be expected to be paid to a third party because... Well, it seems more palatable to me to the agency when we when we present that to them. A couple of tips from my practice. We always go through a payroll company to pay the parent. Uh, there are lots of reasons to do that, but it's also easier for us. And then, of course, you know they're building up their own Social Security account, which is one of those fringe benefits that Patty was mentioning. And, um, oh, I forget now what the other tip was. I'll think of it in a minute. Do you, do you provide employee benefits for them? Um, yes, we do. Uh, it depends on the case and how much we're willing to spend, but you just made me think of the other issue, which is that when we're going to pay a parent, we almost always get with our accountant and go over some of the issues because I'm not an accountant. I can't tell you what he's talking about, but something about fringe benefits, and I can think of one case where we've got mom paying rent to live in the house that's owned by the child because that way then as an employee, she can have some fringe benefits and some of the things that we're doing to help her that would otherwise cause her to pay income tax are now not causing her to pay income tax. I would, I've got a case right now that uh, there was a question there, but let me say this before we get to that. I've got a case right now where it made sense to spend a substantial amount of money on caregiving and an individual was uh, severely injured in a motor vehicle collision and there was a uh, effort on the part of the family to provide the therapy that would allow this individual to recover and there are some kinds of injuries where intense therapy uh, as soon as you can start providing it will give you the greatest hope of recovery and um, so I, I think there are always going to be situations where even if it's going to deplete the trust um, a sense of hope and a sense of uh, urgency would cause you to move forward and do what is in the best interest of the beneficiary. And there's a question here. So uh, I have two clients that have situations where they have two trusts. One is a child who was already had developmental disabilities and then had a reaction, a bad reaction to a drug that was part of a national drug settlement case, which has some kinds of special trusts that ended up having to be managed by the probate court in North Georgia. And the, the parent comes to me and they say, look, we've got plenty of other assets. We've provided for our child. She's still a teenager. This other trust is a pain in the neck to manage. Can't we just spend, spend everything down on that, get rid of that trust? And then uh, we'll have these other trust assets that can last longer. And the, in the second case, it was the father of the child died and left his pension to the child. The mother came to us. Uh, we had an attorney set up a, a, a 4DA, tr a self-settled trust. Um, it it's, uh, creates a lot of tax issues. The mother runs a company. She's well off. She says, look, I want to I wanna spend this one down so we don't have to hassle with it. Does that, that make sense? Yes, hell yes. That's what I mean about legally laundering the money. Absolutely. You always, I have, I couldn't tell you how many clients I have who have a D4A or a D4C trust as well as a third party trust. And there's no reason why there has to be anything left in that D4A trust or D4C trust when the person dies. None whatsoever. So if there's a third party trust, why would you access that trust first if you could access those others and spend it down so there's not a, uh, a lien? And quite honestly, I'd feel very differently about that if there was some provision in the law that said when you pay the state back 
that money for what they've expended for Medicaid, that goes back into the state coffers to be used as match money for additional Medicaid dollars. But that's not what happens. In my state, it goes to hire more attorney generals to fight with our families who are doing appropriate legal planning and people like Bill Oberman on there. <laughs> <laughs> But I absolutely, it was a good question. I encourage you to do it. How, how many of you, uh, when you draft a uh, D4A, also draft a third party trust or vice versa so that uh, you typically provide both? Yes, I do. I think it's malpractice not to. And then you, you would, in most cases, tell families to spend the D4A first. I had a question about uh, the new ABLE accounts that are out there. Um, I know that it, you'd only put in 14000 in a year. Could the special needs trust, the D4A, uh, put money into that ABLE account to let it grow tax-free and use, just use the fact that you can spend the money tax-free on benefits instead of incurring the income tax in the D4A? Yes. Social Security has clearly said yes, and the nice thing about it is once you fund the ABLE Act account, the ABLE Act account can be used for in-kind support and maintenance without a reduction in the SSI purposes. So for a person who's on SSI whose family doesn't have enough money to buy a home to assist in bringing down the rent to make it cost-effective or can't get a voucher or housing assistance, they could use the ABLE Act for that, which I think is the primary good thing about the ABLE Act. It is the one thing that people don't understand about the ABLE Act. Me, Patty, I know you can't see me, <laughs> is that there is a payback requirement. Somehow that has not been published well by the disability community. When you have a trust paying a family member, do you do any sort of a written personal services support contract? And have you ever used and are you allowed to use a lump sum contract? A lump sum contract? I wouldn't do that. Um, I have drafted uh, contracts between the trust and the family member, and I've also had situations where the trust just decided to pay the family member because the trustee decided to, uh, that that was the uh, best use of money to help the beneficiary. Um, I'd have never done a lump sum payment out of a special needs trust. I've done it for Medicaid planning I, when it was in the person's assets, like they came into a small amount and we just paid in advance for a year, but I have always had an agreement. It may be a simple agreement, a page long or whatever, but always my, an agreement. My fear, especially with a uh, self-settled trust, is that you might violate the sole benefit rule if you did a lump sum agreement. And so I would pay someone by the hour as they do the labor. But So if you have somebody who's over 65 and they don't want to use a pool trust because of the issues, um, I have done the lump sum payment as prepayment, and we've not had a problem yet. My question is about the ABLE Act. Uh, there's two questions. One, does anyone know when Georgia is going to enact the enabling legislation so we can get them here in Georgia? July 1. It was July 1. admitted, it was, or I mean, it, it passed. I, okay, so it's in effect now. Oh, the fantastic. Okay, and the other question is, can the uh, disabled person themselves, who might maybe works, contribute to their own ABLE Act? That's what I thought, okay. I have two more thoughts about employment. Uh, one is, I often have the, even if it's a parent, I have them keep some basic timesheets. Um, just like you would if you were doing contract work for a regular employer. So I don't see the harm in that. And then you asked about a, a lump sum payment. I've never done that either, but I have kind of done the opposite on one case. We have a case where we, we really don't want to spend a lot of money because we don't have a lot of money. And so what I've done is a deferred compensation agreement with the grandmother who's the caregiver in that case. She's keeping her time records. And if we find out that the child is sick and is going to die any day, we're going to pay her. That's brilliant. I love that. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out about the hourly records, why that's really important. A lot of my clients are on Medicaid and receiving services through Medicaid. We have like four different Medicaid programs. So you have to keep track of the hours anyway. So you can't supplement the hourly rate, but you could pay for uncovered hours. So we have to also keep track of what hours are not being covered by Medicaid so we don't have any problems of duplication of services or anything like that.
By the way, there have been some cases, and I'm trying to remember, I think they actually came out of, I want to say Massachusetts and maybe New Jersey, where there had been lump sum caregiver payments, and the person being cared for passed away unexpectedly. And the agency went after it by saying it was an uncompensated transfer, basically, and the courts agreed. I would also just suggest, similar to what you did about the deferred comp thing, it's not exactly the same, but if we have a D4A trust with a payback, we will often give a power in there to the trustee that at any time they are aware that the lien exceeds the amount in the trust, they can pour it into a pooled trust to defeat the lien for the smaller accounts because we have 100% retention in our state. Um, and so we'll do that a lot, especially if there's more than one family member who has a disability. Um, so, you know, we have, I have families who have fragile X or um, Huntington's disease where a lot of people in the family have the same disease. That's a way to defeat the payback in our state. Can't do anything about it. Well, now, you, you do remember that that issue about the over 65 transfer originated in Georgia, don't you? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, and in Georgia, trusts uh, do not uh, retain, uh, D4Cs do not retain funds right. to defeat the lien. Michigan! <laughs> <laughs> oh, Another. we're getting questions all over now. The oh, that's right memo that we provided and by the way it will be on my website uh, tomorrow so if you want to distribute it you can if you want to put it on your letterhead I would appreciate you know attribution but you can put it on your letterhead uh, what I would ask is if you find any typos tell me uh, since I do my own typing uh, but the memo kind of divides distributions into a few different types well some that are relatively safe, some that are unsafe, and some that are uh, that you can make, but they're going to possibly cause a reduction in benefits. Um, and one of the things that we've given you is the Special Needs Alliance's trustee guide. So with that, um, Patty, why don't you tell us about the unsafe distributions? What would be an unsafe distribution? Um, we have an issue in Michigan, I'm sure it's no surprise to any of you, that we have problems with transportation. <laughs> there is no real method of accessible public transportation, primarily because the big three will not fund it. They do not want accessible, e easily accessible transportation affordable for people with disabilities in our state. So it's very difficult to get people um, around in um, Michigan, especially we have weather challenges as well. So transportation is supposed to be covered by our Medicaid waiver and our state plan. And it says, it medically necessary transportation to and from a doctor's appointment or other medically necessary services. Well, I don't know about you guys, but all my folks who go to a workshop, the workshop's paid for by Medicaid and is considered a medically necessary service. So the transportation to and from is supposed to be covered. However, our waiver says that it will not allow for the payment or purchase of a vehicle in the, in the name of the beneficiary or the provider. So if the person's in a wheelchair, there's really no way to get them around. So one of the gray areas where we would probably violate the rules is that we would the trust would purchase the vehicle. Our Medicaid waiver pays for the accessibility modifications to the vehicle, it's, but only one of our waivers pays for it, not all of them. So you'd have to do that, have them put the van or the lift on and all of that stuff, and then they would reimburse the trust or whoever we put the name of the vehicle in the mileage for providing the transportation but the actual purchase of the van itself had to be from the trust. So those kinds of dicey, you gotta know the rules and play around them is, is an important one. We didn't really talk a lot about, um, do we spend something on a potential life improvement without really a, a good uh, feeling that it might be successful? And I think this is gonna be a problem in the future and it's gonna show up in drugs because there's a lot of research going on about how to block the effect of a, dis, of a genetic defect on the, res, the physiological results of the person. And a lot of these drugs that are in tests or in research, there's no guarantee they'll work. But I guarantee you, 
if you have a, a parent of a severely disabled child, if there's any hope that a, a drug could alleviate something like uh, the George syndrome or um, Rett syndrome, a parent is going to desperately want that. And because it's not proven, in all likelihood, the uh, Medicaid authorities are going to refuse uh, any reimbursement. I think the, in the area of, of drugs, we're going to see more questions arising about do we spend money for uh, a benefit without really knowing if it will work? We have that same issue related to a lot of aquatic therapy. Aquatic therapy seems to be something everybody wants, especially if the person who the therapy is being sought for is a minor who got a large personal injury settlement and suddenly they need a pool at the house for this therapy. Um, that's one of the other real dicey ones. Um, we have done it. Um, the, we get a prescription. We get an OT and PT assessment before we do it. We, um, we might have already, they might have already had a pool, but we added on heat in a uh, like a ramp or that equipment to put the person in to lower them into the pool. Um, so that's another one we have a lot of dicey issue with. But I think you're so right. People want to see a return on their investment. And you don't always know if you're going to get a return on your investment when you're working with a person with a disability. And another one I think we're going to struggle with is education. Michigan's very lucky. We are the only state in the country that has special ed from the ages of 0 to 26. Um, and so it's mandatory. Another reason is come on up to Michigan. But um, a lot of folks want their kids to have the life experience of going away to school. And we've had some challenges where the trustees, and I'm sad to say it's frequently a corporate trustee who says, I'm not going to pay this tuition for this person. They're never going to graduate. What's the point? And I think we're going to have to fight some of those fights out in the future as well. But Medicaid has to pay for the attendant care to go to the class. Parents don't think in terms of return on investment. See? <laughs> may, I, let me ask you this, and then we'll, we'll the get to this question. <laughs> if we shift and start thinking about dignity, and let's say Meg's not working, and so we're trying to figure out how do we give her this sense of dignity and independence, uh, there's a temptation to give Meg cash and allowance, and yet we know that that would cause a dollar for dollar reduction in benefits. How do we get around that? Uh, we actually, Meg does get an allowance. And so my uh, wife and I, or it's mostly my wife, uh, we plan out Meg's week. And so we know what activities she has. And we'll give her money to pay for those. Uh, and she likes to pay f uh, for her own way. Why? Because she watch, watches everybody else do it. She wants to be like everybody else. So, uh, yeah, we do disperse uh, an allowance to her every week. We don't, we were uh, talking at lunch about uh, uh, a um, mother who gave her child a credit card. And there was a limit on the credit card, and the ch child expended all of the money in the first month on the limit. Because she was so proud of having the credit card, she not only, not only bought things for herself, but all of her friends. Uh, you know, people with Down syndrome do have impulse control, and, and yeah, I like to pretend that Meg's like everybody else, but that's not true. Uh, we do uh, put boundaries on what she can spend. And, and a minor allowance of $30 a month is never going to uh, get her to the uh, uh, income limit on Medicaid, not with the minimum wage she w makes. Uh, there, there really is a crying shame here, and that is... Uh, most people, the unemployment rate for people with intellectual disability, there's statistics all over the map. But I think that if you try to average it, it's going to be on the order of 70, 75 percent. And those that do have a job are at minimum wage. So usually it's not too hard to uh, keep a child below uh, a $2,000 limit unless you do something really dumb, like uh, uh, allow them to inherit a, a, a bequest from a grandparent. One other issue that I, I come into, and this drives me up the wall, but it's more of something in, in y'all's uh, area, and it crops up in disability, and it's not so much, I, I talk a lot about a child, but I also have run into situations where I'm dealing with a brother who has a sister that's disabled, and uh, so they file for SSDI, and, and as you all know, 40% of SSDI applications are uh, turned down. And it seems like the Social Security system is waiting for you to appeal because 
because of the, of the people that do appeal, half of them win the appeal. So it's a system uh, biased to turn down legitimate claims. Uh, and so what happens? So somebody appeals an SSDI determination, and a year later they finally win the appeal. What does Social Security do? They pay all the back payments in one lump sum and knocks the person off their benefits, and unless you've got a spin plan or whatever. I run into this, and it just makes me insanely mad because it's a system that seems designed to hurt people. He's right. Way around that, have a loan agreement with the trust or the parents who are paying for the basic needs during the time of the appeal so that when they win the lump sum payment, the parent or the trust gets reimbursed. We do that quite frequently. But to go back also to David's point about the limitations on wages, I frequently, I, I have a lot, a lot, a lot of clients who volunteer, and they volunteer regularly. One of the things they love to do is the meal on wheels. They love to be the one who runs from the truck and drops it off to the person. They get a hug. They get their food at the time. I really encourage you that it's not always the paycheck. It's the meaningful activities and interactions with people that can give them that dignity. So I would encourage you to encourage the people to volunteer. There was a question over here. Actually, I had I had a question. It was back of ways, but uh, what do we do with the sibling trustee who feels like the beneficiary's needs are met completely and entirely by the public benefits program, sees no need to even evaluate the need for, for distributions, uh, and is more concerned with the payout at the end of life, which would be for him and his brothers. I use the letter of intent to guilt them into doing it, and if they don't do it, I remove them. And that and I make it clear to my clients, if it's a third-party trust, that that's a role I will take. It's written in there I, if, as a trust protector. Because as you said earlier, the disability community is an extremely tight-knit community. Everybody knows everybody. And if they're involved at bingo at the ARC, or if they're involved at whatever, at whatever organization, and they show up that one day and they look dirty, or their clothes have holes in them, or the staff were rude to them, I get a phone call. You know, I, when you've worked in the community that long, people start to know, and they're like, what's going on with Johnny? I want to check into it. And if they don't follow that letter of intent, which, again, is clearing convincing evidence of the intent of the grantors, which the court must honor, you can have them removed if they refuse to do it. Frequently, you end up working on an agreement. Um, Howie, when he asked everybody to raise their hand if they include themselves in their documents, didn't follow up and ask where, what capacity... Uh, I never include myself as trustee unless uh, after uh, naming a number of other options they just don't have any more and they uh, come back to me. I'm happy to serve as trustee of a trust some other lawyer drafted, but I'm, I'm very careful about serving as trustee on one I draft. However, I almost always name myself as trust protector, okay. and in that situation I would remove the trustee. Can, can re re comment. It is so common to see in a, a third-party special needs trust that um, you know a, the, one of the siblings is named as a successor guardian by the parent uh, if they die, and there's also those same sibling or siblings are remainder beneficiaries of that trust, and it's obviously a con the potential conflict of interest. And somebody brought that up at um, our lunch discussion. It's so common in families, and I'll, and I'll caution families that. Always be wary of a conflict of interest, but they know their family ties of loyalty and um, love better than I do, and I'll leave the decision to them. But I will bring up anything that looks like it could potentially be a conflict of interest down the road. However, sometimes conflicts of interest arise in strange ways. I had one client where the daughter was going to be the successor guardian and the remainder beneficiary of her brother's uh, special needs trust and then she had a child with special needs and I, it, statistically you wouldn't think this happens but over a 300 million population nation yeah it does happen so um, it just bottom line I guess you can't guard against everything I was I was wondering about um, it's kind of the opposite of this it's where parents of a child with a disability, and the parents are aging, needing care. Um, now I know there's the uh, where you can put the money 
into the special needs trust to make the parent eligible for Medicaid benefits. But I was wondering if, if in any of the conversations that you have, I've seen elderly parents who don't get the care that they need because they want to fund their special needs trust. And I wonder if there are any conversations about that. Every day. And quite honestly, at least in my state, we... Our DD waiver is pretty rich. There's no waiting list. So if the person's developmentally disabled, they qualify for services immediately. They may not get everything, but they'll get some services. And so what we have is a lot of parents who are codependent on their kid with a disability, and they don't want to um, do what you did, which was to do the trial run, to test drive it, to have Johnny move out on his own when he could come back and forth for visitations because they like having Johnny there because Johnny's helping take care of them, carry the groceries in, cut the lawn, maybe that kind of stuff. So that is a tension that we uh, I discuss with our families frequently. But like lots of disabilities where their child might have some type of um, psychiatric disability or whatever, they don't, sometimes the parents are in denial. And that would be in a, a time when you would suggest maybe bringing in the circle of support for the entire family, maybe the other kids, maybe a clergy member, maybe the neighbors who have seen the deterioration so that we can plan together our Disability organizations have been um, funded for a grant called After I'm Gone, which is to get the parents to work on just doing situations so that when they're gone, they know it's already been taken care of for their loved ones. And that would be an opportunity where I would try to get the case manager in to try to do that kind of conversations. But it's a tough one. If you, uh, w The model in my office is, is you cannot help people who will not help themselves. And you cannot force people to take help if they're not ready, but you can make strong recommendations and say, when you're ready, I'm here, and kind of cajole them. But there's real no perfect answer to that, sadly. There was a, a case we handled not too long ago where there was a, some balancing. A parent went into a nursing home. Fortunately, it was in a state where we could fund an over-65 pool trust sub-account, but they didn't feel like they needed all of the money, so they put some money aside for a disabled child and uh, that kind of balancing I think is, is what sets you apart as an advocate and gives you the chance to really drill down and, and figure out what's going to enhance quality of life for this elder and their special needs child. Patty, you mentioned earlier the pool and um, I have a pretty strong opinion about that. Uh, we hardly ever do it. I don't know how often you all do it, but there are just so many extra costs involved with the pool. The not only the cost of the pool, but then you got to have the fence and you got to have the cover and you've got to treat the pool every year. And we even had a case where one of the other kids almost drowned in the pool, uh, which could have made a second personal injury case for us, but that's not what we want. And so we just, the last time I got asked this question about the pool, we went out and we priced the private pay therapy and a membership at the YMCA. And a membership at the YMCA for the next 20 years with the private cost of the, of the therapy would be well less than we were going to spend on the pool. So I have a thought about that, but I also want to spend a little time talking about buying houses because I get that all the time. And I'm sure we all have some horror stories to tell about the way these people keep these houses and the issues that come up with the houses. But I want to tell you one of the best things I've done is I hired a company and I use them like a bank would use their property management department and they go out to these houses once a year and they look them over and make sure that everything's being handled properly in the heating and air conditioning department and the painting and the roof and the all of that and then if we have problems with the houses where maybe they have termites or they need a new roof or they have bed bugs because we do have that a lot the property management people are able to tell me what we really need to do, and not just what the parents want to do, but what we really need to do. And then they can act sort of like the general contractor and hire the subcontractors to come in and do the work. One of the pool trusts that I originally created in Michigan was created by a housing organization. And their purpose was to be able to develop affordable housing for people with disabilities and maintain it. 
and that is their role. They will act as the property manager and they will do it for their pool trust beneficiaries, but they'll also do it for third party or first party trust. And they will do that annual assessment. They will, um, they know the rules because the people who started this charity were an organization that created the relationships between our state and the group homes when we first started closing the institutions years ago. So they know the zoning rules, the plotting rules, the water configuration rules. So all of that is very helpful. But what I really like about it is because they're in charge of lots of different property and they're sort of acting like the general contractor, like you said, they are getting collective purchasing so that they have better deals of the people who are providing those services than I could get individually for the consumers. And I think it's a great option. And I think um, people don't consider it as much as they should. It's a great, great option. One of the things that we've given you in the materials is a list of many of the uh, things that can be purchased or services that can be purchased, which we consider to be safe. Um, and Patty also has a, a list of her own uh, on her website, and I did not separately print Patty's web uh, list, but I've seen it. Um, anything that is going to be an exempt asset the month following receipt is going to be safe. Anything, any service that you're going to consume is going to be safe. Um, Anything basically that's not cash, food, or shelter uh, in most cases should be safe. Um, some, uh, the biggest problem, just to, to reiterate, that I have with doing that is services when our Medicaid system pays potentially $8 or $10 an hour. I don't know about you guys, but we're having a hard time with keeping and maintaining good staff to provide the most intimate, important services a person could use and our families want to use the trust to supplement the hourly rate and you cannot do that it's a medicaid prohibition to the providers what you can do is provide extra training you could pay for an extra week of vacation you could pay for an ira for that person you could pay for hours that are not covered and what i would do is frequently pay a higher hourly rate for the hours not covered that we were privately paying to kind of get it up but you need to be cautious. I know our colleague Bridget in um, Arizona said they're not allowed to even do that. They can't pay. So whatever the Medicaid agency rate is, that is the rate that the private uh, trust has to pay. So that's one of the more dicier issues. What Those of you who are attorneys uh, who draft trusts or advise trustees, what are some of the things you do to try to maintain a relationship with the person who is going to be trustee if it's not you, so that you don't have to go back and fix a broken trust later. Any comments? Very quiet. Interesting, Bob. I've got, a, <laughs> I've got a letter that I give to the trustees when uh, it's going to be a family member usually. I call it the trustee instruction letter. I know that's creative. Um, but I've been adding more and more language to this letter over the years about all the trouble they can get into if they manage this trust improperly. And I had a case where, just to give you one example of the bad things this grandfather did, he spent most of the trust money buying shares of his own closely held business. And of course, when I didn't know about this, and when we went to do the accounting to the court, and it's a good thing the court was involved in this case, uh, of course he had a hard time explaining that, and we had a hearing, and the judge threatened to have him prosecuted. And so he did manage to return the money to the trust, but um, almost went to jail. So I've got a little paragraph that even says you might end up going to jail. So I don't know if that's the answer you were looking for, David, but I'm, I'm, I'm telling them it's a scary thing to be the trustee. My instruction letters to my clients invariably get longer every time I have a new client. Uh, it, it's just amazing uh, all of the different things clients can do to break the plan that you've tried to build for them. Do you guys have a statute of limitations for trustee liability? Any of you? Two years? Anybody else? One year? Is it from the date of an accounting? 
Okay, so that I like to use that as my my way to guilt the trustees into doing the accounting, so I know what's going on. Because most, I mean, let's face it, lawyers are not the most endeared people in the world. Um, and outspoken Greek women are even worse for engineers. And there's a lot of engineers that I work with in the Detroit area. Sorry if anybody's an engineer. But so the, when they're done, they don't want to deal with you anymore. They're like, I'm, oh, you're an engineer, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I knew that too. I'm sorry. Anyway, they're, when they're done, they so want to be done with the, with the lawyer. That's kind of how I feel about a doctor. I'm done. I'm well. Leave me the hell alone. I'm going to go do my thing. Okay. So then I send them a letter. Don't forget, you have this obligation to the beneficiaries. And one way you can achieve, you know, some size that you're not going to go to jail is by doing this annual accounting and sending it out and starting the statute of limitations to run. I still only get probably 5% of the people who do it, but at least I know I got it in my file to cover my rear end. If it comes back to bite me later, the trustee didn't do what they were supposed to do. Thankfully, in our state, we have to do an annual accounting to the Department of Community Health, so we can force the trustees to do an accounting. It is. It actually it is. Actually, you know what, Patty, you got it right on the button. <laughs> Question over here. I'm coming. To uh, provide for protection so that the these trusts aren't cleaned out. We have are having a real problem in our area of attorneys cleaning out uh, trust accounts. And we have three disbarred attorneys within the last six to nine months. And the court is requiring bonds on everything. Are you all doing anything like that in a trust? Where are you from? I'm from uh, north of Knoxville. Um, I'm not including a mandatory bond requirement in most of the trusts I draft. I, I, I always prefer that my clients hire a professional trustee because uh, the chances are high that I'm going to have to fix something they broke if they try to do it themselves. Um, so I'd rather them hire uh, a bank to serve as trustee. Well, another part of that, but, David, is anybody who's gone out and tried to shop for a fiduciary bond yeah, you can't for an one, individual right? as opposed to a professional corporation, the price is... Unbelievable. Yeah. Over the last uh, 12 to 24 months, it's gotten much harder for an individual to get a bond in North Georgia on guardianship cases and other uh, similar fiduciary cases. Well, I, one, of the, one of the benefits of, uh, at least in Tennessee, of appointing a bank as a trustee or any other fiduciary for that matter uh, we have a banks have a statutory exemption from posting bond, and as uh, Bill points out, the cost of a fiduciary bond is twenty dollars per thousand dollars of bond. Uh, our bank's minimum fee at two hundred thousand dollars, the bond cost equals our minimum fee. Did the do you know if the um, attorneys in those situations had insurance? Because the insurance carrier may have to pay for that. They did not have insurance. So, I mean, any, anybody who is an attorney who acts as trustee should make sure their professional liability insurance includes the definition of acting as a fiduciary in the practice of law so that they're covered so they're, they don't have to per, per se have the bond, but if they ran off or their employee ran off with the money, there'd be some coverage. Yeah, there was a period of time when I kept a separate policy for that. I was paying for two professional liability policies every year, and then I finally got a letter from my uh, my uh, legal malpractice carrier saying that it was included, so I was able to drop one of those policies. But if you're in a business that does it, you should consider also having employee dishonesty bond because what the what the court told me was, okay, we're covered if you do something, but what if your staff do it? So then what we did was it, when we would submit the annual accountings, we would submit the cover sheet showing the professional liability insurance was still in place and the employee dishonesty bond was still insured. Sure, then the bank wouldn't require the bond. That's a real case. There's, I think one of the cases that we looked at when we were planning for this program, a law firm ended up having to chase its employee who had uh, cleaned out a 
special needs trust. Well, here's another one for you, David. Years ago, I won't tell you which county, but in Georgia, there was a county guardian administrator, basically county fiduciary, who was in a solo practice, had one secretary that had been with them for years and years and years, did everything, okay? And after many years, cleaned out all the bank accounts. And of course, he was an attorney, malpractice insurance didn't cover it. You know, the DA's office got involved. Uh, there were all kinds of things that happened, but you know, you never know even what the most entrusted employee is gonna do under the right circumstances. Any other questions? We've got about a minute and a half left in this program. If there are no more questions, and I'm going to give you a taste of what's coming up with uh, Bill and whoever he's drafted to be on his panel. Um, some of the things you might want to have your questions ready about. Can the trust buy guns and ammo? Uh, can the trust buy porn? Uh, what about sex therapy? Um, marijuana. Uh, marijuana. So if you have questions about unusual distributions, after the break, uh, well, that's, that's going to be the focus of what we're going to do is let's get you all involved because really, from my perspective, that's where most of the day goes, are the questions about these off-the-wall distributions that the trustees are asked to make. If you can start moving back toward the room, um, we're waiting on Bill, but as soon as he gets here, we're going to give you a chance to... Um, Ask the questions about the hard distributions. Now, uh, Mr. Wright was just telling me a story about someone which might add even another layer to it. There was an individual that used his paycheck for uh, prostitutes. Uh, I'm not sure how that would go over as a special needs trust distribution. <laughs> yeah. Now the, the question is, is that, does that violate the sole benefit rule? Um, but anyway, if you've got questions, this is your time to ask them. And then make sure you stay around for the best practices uh, part. Uh, Al Secor is a bank attorney for Southeastern Trust Company. And uh, he will be able to give you that perspective I've asked him to speak about some of the things the bank would like to see from drafting attorneys and the type of communication the bank would want. And then uh, Bob Feckman uh, can also tell you his experience. So as soon as uh, Mr. Overman uh, gets his coffee or uh, water, whatever he's getting, we will start in. But... Make sure that you uh, ask him his hard questions. What are we looking for? All right, this is me taking over for a second. Excuse me for eating and talking at the same time, but oh, you're right, I am Greek, and I'm not doing shots of Uzo, so be glad. All right, everybody here having a good time and learning a lot of crap? All right. <laughs> hey, shut up. Anybody want David to do this again? Yeah. All right. If you look on your little centerpiece, there's a hashtag that says ELP's special needs. This is for social media. How many of you on social media? Raise your hands. Well, higher. It's something to be proud of. Use this hashtag and say, Patty Dudek's hilarious. Patty Dudek wouldn't shut up. <laughs> Porn for disability beneficiaries. I don't know. I don't care. Hashtag something so that we get some good publicity for David so that in future years we have lots more of our colleagues here that we can learn from. Okay? And do it at me because I'm going to watch for it. If not, I'm going to come at you. Thank you. I'm too old to do that. Thank you, Patty. <laughs> By the way, if everybody would please give David and his staff a hand. I know they have put in countless hours into setting this all up for us, and in fact, the, the one person in his staff that I think deserves the most credit is not here today, unfortunately. But, Bill, I'm going to conscript you again. Come on. Linda, where are you? Come on. 
we're going to have some fun here. Um, we're changing the program a little bit. What we're going to do with this particular section is I'm going to kind of moderate from the national level. So we're not going to talk about any particular state agency, any particular <clears throat> uh, trust program, anything like that. But we're going to kind of hit you with some war stories about some of the off-the-wall distribution requests that trustees have gotten that I know, okay? And what's, what's interesting about this mix here is you have Bill, who you've seen earlier from the corporate trustee standpoint, and Linda Byler is Secured Futures, which is one of the National Pool Trusts. So Linda, if you'll say something more about Secured Futures, then we'll go from there. Yes, um, I would just like to say that Secured Futures is a National Pool Trust. We have beneficiaries in 48 states. And unlike many pooled trusts, we are a payback trust. So we do permit, regardless of the state of residency, we do permit the beneficiary to name a remainder after repayment to the state. Thank you. Right. Okay, well done. All right. Now, what we're going to do... And if do... Bill had told me that I was going to be up here today, I probably wouldn't have come. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't surprise me at all. But that's... Are you going to be at Stetson, by the way? Are you Pardon? going this year, yes. Stetson? Yes. Good. Yes. How many of you are going to the Stetson Special Needs Trust Conference? Okay, we've got a good group here. We'll all have to look for each other while we're here. Well, it's interesting to me to see the mixture that we have in the audience because we do have attorneys, uh, trustees, in fact, trustees even from outside the state of Georgia. Hello, Donna. Hello over there. <laughs> okay, we have Linda Byler from Arizona. Okay, Secured Futures. Teresa or Gail, who would like to join us and talk about what you're running into with your beneficiaries? Here's a pool trust, Ark of Georgia. Okay. Okay, come on. What we want to do, like I said, is talk to you about the... <laughs> the come on down. <laughs> Well, let's see. I took the ramp over here, Teresa. Okay, I'll let you introduce yourself in the middle when you get up here. But I want us to just have some fun, and I want us to tell you about some of the issues that in my position as Director of Trust Services for HMS, I wound up discussing with trustees from all over the country. But first, let's get Teresa up here. Teresa, if you'll introduce yourself to the audience. Uh, I'm Teresa Witten, and uh, Gail and I administer Special Needs Trust at Southeastern Trust Company, a division of Atlantic Capital Bank and FSG Bank. And we, we have a pooled trust in Tennessee and Georgia. Depends on which one. <laughs> at lunch today? Yeah. You need to get your microphone back. This one. For those of you who don't really understand what these trustees are running into, here is literally the perfect example. I met a new trustee this week in Mobile, Alabama. Meaning beneficiary, not trustee. Yes, sorry, beneficiary. And we're a national bank, so we serve in all 50 states. So I uh, met a new trustee, a new beneficiary, and um, he's about 23 years old and was given a defective kidney. Uh, by the hospital they knew it was defective and so there's a, a large settlement and I'd never met him we're successor trustee to another trustee that's not here today um, and um, so went down just to we're gonna build him a house they're living in really bad living conditions um, he's 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 in pretty bad physical shape <laughs> but apparently not in bad enough shape we had had an hour and a half long meeting. The attorney was there. I was there. His dad was there. His sister was there. And, and the, the Benny had been kind of quiet through the whole thing. And dad had done a lot of talking. And there's a story with dad. He's been arrested multiple times. Lots of issues with dad. Uh, the beneficiary had been arrested multiple times. And so it's just a mess. But I put my hand down across from him and just kind of tapped, tapped him on the hand and said, is there anything that you haven't asked for today that you would like to have. And he proceeded to ask me to have sex with him. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that Full was just, yeah. just, just another really life, you know, another day in the life of a trustee, right? Yes. So when I tell all my friends in the room, they just come back and say, well, you do 
you do put yourself out there as the trustee that will do things other trustees won't do. <laughs> <laughs> so I have, I have changed my closing statement and my sales pitch. <laughs> so that's that's this this week's story. Okay, thank you, Teresa. And there's somebody else in the audience that I'm hoping will also join in because we've had some great conversations about some cases. Donna, hold up your hand. Donna Lacour from Argent Trust from Shreveport, Louisiana. Okay, I have to tell you, I think one of the pleasures of the work that I do is getting contacted by people from all over the country and hearing about these off-the-wall situations and working with them to try to figure out what in the heck to do with them. Uh, it's just amazing. Um, some of the examples, David mentioned one. This came out of one of the states in which um, I actually have a trust unit. We, call, we have names for some of our cases from the accountings that have been reviewed. And this particular one was called Guns and Ammo. And the reason was it was a small trust. The brother was the trustee. And when the first accounting came in, the trust had been almost completely depleted with the purchase of guns and ammunition. So, of course, the question that had to go to the brother as trustee is, what's going on here? And the answer that came back was, well, the only thing that my disabled brother enjoys is shooting guns. So, the bottom line for all this is, here's some of the considerations. I'd be interested to hear from you about some thoughts that you have. Number one, the determination was, okay, it was for the benefit of the beneficiary. This is what he wanted to do, okay. But then there was another consideration. What about the guns? Okay, let me hit the trustees over here with that one. Bill? Whether or not we would approve the acquisition of guns. Well, let's that's the, the guns that's the, they were already there I mean, in, the, in the property. I'm sorry, I was making notes for uh, when you were going to reach out to me. I didn't think you were going to hit me with guns and ammo right out of the gate. Well, you know, I, so you'd have to understand all the circumstances, of course. You'd have to hear the story. Is the person um, satisfied all the requirements? to obtain a gun, do they have the proper, uh, you know, what state was this? Okay, so did they, did they meet all the necessary criteria? Were they competent enough to handle a gun? Was there good um, gun handling procedures that were established uh, in place? Um, you know, I think it's a, it's a tough call. If, if they live in an area where hunting is part of the the family culture, uh, then you'd certainly want to entertain it. I mean, we had one um, here in South Georgia. It was a, uh, it was a young man. He was a minor, and his and his parents wanted to take him hunting. He had um, cerebral palsy, very limited use uh, of his body, so they wanted to get a sip and puff air rifle mounted to his wheelchair, so that they could go out and sit in a deer blind. Uh, and we absolutely did it. We absolutely did it. Um, I mean, this is a, it, it's a rural South Georgia family, and this was very important uh, for the, the, the dad wanted, has always wanted to go hunting with his son. The son was very much interested in learning how to hunt. And so we went through with the care, uh, with the case manager, and, you know, kind of outlined the, the, the process of what we'd want to do in order to see this. And he went hunting with his dad, and it was one of the greatest times he ever had. So, you know, in that case, yes. I mean, so I think it just depends on the circumstances. Um, if there's if there's a, a, a cultural um, slant to it, that's what that's what really did it. That's what put it over the top for us in this situation. Teresa and Linda. Here's the question for you. Okay, now Bill's talking more from a corporate standpoint. So we know he's probably talking about a larger trust. Pool trust accounts, which we know tend to be more nominal. The request comes in. Um, I, if I look at my portfolio right now that I have in both states, I might would approve it for one or two people. It's so, it would so, I echo what Bill says, it would so depend on the beneficiary. 
uh, and their situation because honestly, a lot of these beneficiaries in the pool trust, um, unfortunately, they're just, they're not in a situation where they could be trusted with it. Got it. Okay. Linda? Uh, we actually have a policy about that. We will not purchase firearms or ammunition. We really? Just, well, Interesting. We'll, Interesting. We'll, yeah. we'll buy cigarettes. Well, <laughs> wait a minute. Now, wait. Since Linda's brought it up, Patty, David, have you still got a microphone? Okay. Go ahead, Patty. So, I, we had this come up where the person already had the guns, and we found out about them after, and I got a little nervous because of the, I, the diagnosis. So what we did is we hit, had the care manager go out there, make sure they were all licensed and so forth. But then what the trust ended up doing, because th there was no, in Michigan, unlike down here, we can't just go out shooting or else we're going to get shot. So we paid for a membership at a gun club and for the staff to take him to the gun club once a month so he could go shoot. Um, and so there, there are other creative ways to do it because he was not going hunting. It would have been dangerous for him. Well, and I would see that as recreational. Yeah. Absolutely. Completely. I mean, Absolutely. It, it, see, that was the discussion we had internally was that, okay, it was for the benefit of the beneficiary, that's what he liked to do. Now, what was unusual about this particular case was how many guns there were and how much they were worth. So the point that I had to make to everybody was, you know, these guns are trust assets. So what we did was we had the brothers, the trustee, and the brother who is the beneficiary, who was also competent, sign a written agreement acknowledging that those guns are assets of the trust, they cannot be pawned, they cannot be given away, they cannot be sold, okay, unless the proceeds go into the trust, and that they understand that at the death of the beneficiary, those assets are subject to a payback claim. Bob? Uh, How is well, that I'm just curious on the with your reaction to that, to, to say that they must be benefit, uh, assets of the trust, why not let them be assets of the beneficiary except that you're trying to preserve the payback? Okay, I'll, I'll buy that. I'll buy that. At the time, it was better to have them in the trust for obvious reasons. How Gives new meaning listen? to the term gun trust. <laughs> uh, absolutely. I wonder about the responsibility of mental health screenings and some of the things that, especially in light of what we've been seeing around the country, um, what is the responsibility of the trust to make that an issue or is it not the responsibility of the trust? I'll let the trustees talk about that because from my perspective of the person who sees the distribution on the accounting, okay, how would you well, determine? What well, you think? I think for us, part of the reason that we have the policy that we do is because, I hate to say this word, but it's liability um, because we don't really know what the um, situation might be or what the d specific diagnoses might be. I mean, generally, we have a pretty good idea of the disability, and we deal with these people day in and day out, but that's why we're comfortable with that. I mean, I, I think all of the cases that we've talked about where people have done it, it's been compelling. I mean, totally, but... I think there are a lot of situations where it would be very compelling, and, and I think Bill described a perfect situation, um, but I do think, you know... I. Gil and I, every day, at the end of the day, what we ask ourselves is, was that reasonable? And can I explain that to a court? And at the end of the day, again, I have very few clients, you know, that don't have a mental disorder or something going on that I, there, there would just be no way I could justify buying them a weapon. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the world of gray that fiduciaries live in. It's, um, it's not as though, you know, there's, one, there's a request for a gun, it's carefully reviewed, and then all of a sudden it's the next request for a gun is, oh, well, we bought it for this person, we're definitely going to buy it for that person. It's just not going to happen. Um, I mean, you raise a very good point, I mean, especially with what's going on around the world, uh, or, or, you know, throughout the country right now with, with you know, the guns and, and, and everything that's coming with it. I mean, it's not, just a, it's not just a slam dunk. And the mental illness factor that comes with it, I mean, if there was even um, a tinge of mental illness or anything that 
would make you pause, then I can't see how, I mean, it would have to be in extraordinary circumstances and very compelling. I mean, the case that I described, it was, it was very clean. It was a very clean and compelling arrangement. Um, okay. Let's lighten things up a little bit. Oh, question? So this is a different area. I've had clients talk to me about, this happens mostly in the developmental disability arena, about their kids being, uh, having sterilization or um, allowing them to marry or not marry, and what the special needs trust would do in that case. And it's not, a, it's not an easy area. There are people in, um, in the metro Atlanta area that live in group homes with Downs that are married. So it, it, it comes up. It's a, it's a difficult question. I don't know how to answer my clients. I can only help them maybe go through the discussion of it. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting that you raise the question in that, you know, Georgia, I don't know how many people know this, used to have an involuntary sterilization law. And the involuntary sterilization hearings were held in the probate court that back in those days was called the court of ordinary. And that's back in the days when I was down the court. The, those were horrible, horrible cases, let me tell you. When you think about what was being asked for. But let's say the parent came to the trustee and said, we think it's advisable that our child have a sterilization procedure, and they asked the trust to pay for it. Had it happen. Really? Okay. Had that, had that come across. And the ultimate, the ultimate answer was no. Um, we, we could not get comfortable with the circumstances. Um, regardless of what the, the, the family, the, the case that they were making. Um, we consulted with, um, had a case manager involved, reached out to different um, professionals to get as many different opinions as we possibly could that we felt were reasonable and logical. And based on the set of circumstances and conclusions that other professionals reached, our ultimate decision was that we weren't going to do it. Bill? It was a very tough, very, that was a really, really hard situation. I had a case, too, where we asked that the young beneficiary of the trust, over 18 but young, be allowed to get a vasectomy. He wanted a vasectomy, but he wasn't a mentally competent adult. And so this brings me to my point, which is I think whether it's the the voluntarily or not voluntarily sterilization thing or the getting married, I feel like we need to be consulting with attorneys who are knowledgeable about these things. Uh, if you look at the marriage question, there are issues. Sometimes you might end up causing the person who gets married to lose their child disability benefits through Social Security if they marry somebody who's not disabled. So you've got to be aware of these kinds of issues. And then you may or may not know that there's an SSI rule. I, I used to counsel people, if you want to get married, don't actually get the marriage certificate, just you know have the ceremony or whatever. But there's actually a Social Security Palm site on this. And it says that if you hold yourself out as being married, if people think of you as being married, then they're going to treat you as if you are married. So these are technical, legal issues that uh, I think a trustee should should consult with a professional about. Patty? We, I, some of the thorniest fights I ever got in were um, with parents, because in Michigan it's illegal. You cannot sterilize your children who are perceived by the law to have never been able to consent to it. It's specifically excluded even in the guardianship law. So. It, 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 the parents hate it a lot of times, so we've had some nasty fights about it. But where I've also had some fights was where the beneficiary of a sole benefit of trust wanted to use the trust to purchase their engagement ring for the fiancé and pay for the honeymoon. Um, so I'd like to hear how some of you trustees have addressed that. How'd that happen? <laughs> <laughs> We, uh, and you'll love the outcome of this because it's, it's an answer, but yet it's dodging it. No, they got married. We convinced them to spend $10 on the ring. They well, were, you they were more were. persuasive than we were. They asked for 5000 and we said 150 oh, <laughs> 10 bucks. $10 ring. And uh, they got married. 
and it's been less than a year. This is relatively fresh. They did not request the honeymoon. They did not request the honeymoon. You're going to think we're Grinches. We didn't pay for the honeymoon either. <laughs> Well, ac actually, they didn't get married because we convinced them that um, their benefits would be in jeopardy. You talked them out of getting married? Pardon? You talked them out of getting married? Well, we explained that they might lose their benefits, and then they decided not to, but that was after we told them the ring could only be 150. <laughs> we are. <laughs> hey, but I just want to go back to this. <laughs> we had a, a request for fertility treatments from a... Um, yeah. They weren't declared incompetent. They had, they did not have a guardian, but there were some serious issues. And uh, I'd be curious to know what other people thought. It was something we really struggled with. And in the end, we never had to answer it because she moved on to something else. So I don't know if anybody else wants to comment on that. We had that same request because, of course, Medicaid would not cover it. Um, and instead of paying for the treatments, what we did was we purchased a supplemental insurance policy that had that as a coverage, and it delayed the time frame for a little while, and by the time we got the coverage in place, the desire went away. So we were lucky because we determined it would be more cost-effective to pay for the policy be because uh, th it was just easier than paying outright. That's a really good idea. And then the, yeah. one other thing I'd like to hear you guys talk about is how about... Um, uh, transition services to transition sexually. That's a, you know. Been there. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, Linda, come on, come on. Let's go, let's go, come on. <laughs> Maybe I'll redeem myself. We did actually pay. <laughs> we had, um, I think it was about ten or $20,000. I'm not, don't, don't, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but, um, but it was with a lot of consultation, a lot of doctors, a lot of... It wasn't something that was taken lightly. <laughs> I, I just don't want you to send us any more beneficiaries, Bob. <laughs> All of these difficult conversations come back to the fact that even as the trustee, it takes a team. It, it takes those other experts, those case managers, the attorneys. Um, it, it takes everybody to take care of these people and their needs. Let me lighten the, the, the tone of this thing even a little bit more because we were laughing a little bit at lunch about this, but this is a real question. It has been around, has been answered, but I think you'll still find it interesting. Porn. Sole benefit. Okay. Yep. Yes. Linda. Won't pay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about you, Linda. I mean, <laughs> we look at it. You do. Close. <laughs> Put yourself out there for that one. <laughs> I, that, this has been Good my one. week to just walk right into it. <laughs> Apparently, um, we we have a particular beneficiary who uses his credit card, and um, you know, and Gil and I had this conversation a couple of weeks ago when we got the bill. He appears to only visit the establishment once a month, and you know, it's it, he doesn't get out much, and. <laughs> It's just, it, you know, I really think it makes him a better person. <laughs> so, you know, I just, you know, again, if he were, if he were, if it were thousands of dollars a month or if it were, you know, a, it's a, it's a, it's a can he afford it kind of thing. And um, I'm trying to decide yeah. whether to redeem myself or not. <laughs> but in this particular case, it was a very small trust and we just felt like there were other things that the funds could be used for. But it's not a typical request that we get. Well, Not like yeah. cigarettes. So it fits right into the last comment, is that uh, when you are, as a trustee, making decisions about whether you're going to authorize something, by authorize, I mean that you get 
you get to have a discussion about it before you get the credit card bill. Is um, if you have a trust that clearly is not going to sustain itself as a trustee, how do you triage and prioritize what you're going to pay for and what you're not, whether it's basic needs or things that the grantor clearly intended for, um, you know, probably the mother and father didn't plan for salacious behavior, but, um, you know, how, how do you decide what you're going to pay for and what not uh, when, when you know that the money's going to not last? So that's the million dollar question, right? I mean, that's, the, that's one of the biggest challenges that any trustee is facing, particularly if it's a, you know, obviously I'm biased, but if it's a special needs trust, obviously you've got this um, ultra task of making sure that the assets last as long as possible without compromising the well-being of the individual. And so there's a series of very similar thoughts and questions that come into discretionary distribution requests. Um, and it's, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of things that you would expect. Um, and then some that may, maybe not so much. Um, age of the individual, anticipated life expectancy, market value of the trust. Um, what is, what's the typical burn rate of the distributions on an annual basis? Um, any opportunity for outside funding? Is there an annuity paying into it? Um, is there, you know, let's look at the life care plan. Is it contemplated there? Uh, recommendations from a case manager, getting their input. I think those are all the um, those are all the logical things that would go into it. Um, but then you've got um, some situations where it may be a. And this is a and this is a real example. Um, we have a trust for a gentleman. Um, it's a it's a it's a for us, it's a reasonably sized trust. I mean, it was, it's probably about a million and a half dollars. And he has a, he had, because we did it, but he had a, a bucket list trip. And he was planning this trip um, with his wife prior to the injury. And it was that set of circumstances that led us to really um, going with it because it was a it was a massive trip I mean it was something we would never agree to um, ordinarily I mean it was it was a, a massive massive trip relative to his injuries and all the other circumstances that came in um, we went so far as to have them sign off on the fact that you know this is a once-in-a-lifetime trip we're not gonna have we're not gonna you can't come back to us okay you can't have two lifetime trips um, it's a this is a trip of a lifetime. It's one um, And you're not going to come back and try and burn us on it um, Because we understand that this is a bucket list item that you were planning with your wife before it happened um, so it's it's um, It's a challenge and it's something that you you are it, it's it's one of the most important challenges that come as being as a fiduciary as far as I'm concerned is you are being tasked with trying to find that balance um, between what you should spend money on and what you should not. And you are constantly doing battle with families. Um, you are constantly having um, crying on the other end of the phone. And you are trying to find that reasonable middle ground of what is the, uh, what, what's the underlying goal here and how can we achieve this goal um, in the most cost-effective manner without sacrificing the quality. Um, so, in answering your question from a pool trust perspective, I really try to focus on long-term things. If they can drive, what's the, what's the condition of their car? Can I, you know, things that will last past the money running out, uh, computers, special equipment, uh, but it, you know, if you're dealing with somebody that's got fifty or sixty thousand dollars, you're very limited <clears throat> on what you can help them with. And so we really try to focus on when this money's gone, what can we spend it on that's going to five or six years, seven years from now, they may still have. And that that's the way we try to do it. And I would just mention that um, 
you mentioned about the grand tour and what their wishes were. Most of the funds that we're dealing with by overwhelmingly are first party funds. So it's, their, it's the beneficiary's own money. So we also take that heavily into consideration. What do you do about the destructive beneficiary who has wrecked several cars or destroys apartments and no, you know, is constantly getting evicted? We lose a lot of security deposits. <laughs> <laughs> Breathe deep. I mean, we've got clients that do that just like everybody else does and it is frustrating and there's always a case there's always uh, the, the justification. There are, um, we've had some where we've reached the end of the line and the answer is it's just absolutely not. We, we just, we will not do this again. We're not gonna go down this path. Um, and some, it just depends on what it is that keep, like, we've got someone where we, I think we're on our fourth set of tires in two years. Tires. Are they selling these tires? Do they live on a bed of broken glass? I mean, but it, it, it say, I've got to get to my therapy appointment. I've got to get here. I need, I need tires. And so the tow truck will come out and say, yeah, tires are, tires are flat. They're ruined. They, they, this needs new tires. How, what, what do you do? You buy tires, cheap tires, expensive tires. You start with expensive because you want them to last, and then after two sets of those, you go to cheap tires because you know they're not going to last. I've told this story to some of you before, but I have a case where I'm the trustee, and I found out that the house that I owned in Evansville, Indiana, had burned to the ground. And I was very anxious to talk to the trust beneficiary, of course, make sure everybody was okay. And when I got her on the phone, the first thing she said is, I don't know how the house burned down. The meth lab was outside. <laughs> so, to, to give us... Meth your, labs. You've had meth labs, too. All right. And we've had, you know, they're, they're uh, breeding these dogs, and they're disturbing the entire neighborhood. You could go on and on with these kinds of lists. But seriously, in that case where they burn the house down, we got the insurance money, and thank God we got the insurance money. Uh, but I told her, you're not going to live in a house anymore. You're going to live in an apartment. We take, we've taken driving privileges away. We've taken cars away uh, for DUIs. I mean, multiple DUIs. And, you know, we've, we've just said, you know, you're not going to be able to have a car. We're going to uh, hire people to take you to the grocery store. We're going to, you know, I mean, we had a client that the town of Hilton Head will not let her back in. <laughs> <laughs> they booted her over to Bluffton and now Bluffton's responsible for her, but she had so many DUIs in Hilton Head, she's not allowed back over there. So, you know, they're just, you know, she doesn't drive anymore. Well, here's an issue that we see a lot when the accountings come in, when you're dealing with family member trustees. So this will be interesting to see how our professional trustees feel about it. Loans to family members. No. 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 <laughs> Boy, that was fast, wasn't it? <laughs> How about giving the beneficiary a debit card? A debit card. We use TrueLink. Okay. Uh, we like TrueLink. Uh, As, we can how many people it. have heard of TrueLink? That's why I wanted this one to come out because I'd like you all to hear about this. If you'll go ahead and talk no, about it. Uh, we we love it because we can see exactly where they're spending their money. Uh, we can open up, in a rural area in Albany, Georgia, I can open up a pharmacist that, you know, that particular pharmacy. Um, we can shut down places. They can't use it for liquor. They, they can't use it for porn. They can't use it for gambling. Um, and we can open up Walmart, uh, even though they can buy food at Walmart. When we, when we have a, and we don't open up Walmart to everybody. It depends on the beneficiary and how well they can be trusted because if they use it at Walmart, we require a receipt within 24 hours showing what they spent at Walmart or we turn the card off. 
So, so it's so easy to control. Do you require receipts for every purchase at TrueLink or just... We, we use TrueLink as well. We don't. Uh, if it's a pharmacy or, um, you know, Walgreens, CVS, I don't. Now, if DCH is going to, you know, yeah. ask me for those, <laughs> uh, we will start doing that. But if the general... What I've seen from most trustees is they're not, unless it's a Walmart or something like that. If it's like clear that. on a statement. Yes. If it's clear on a statement. Yes. What that company provides, I'm okay with that. Yeah, well, I guess we're the Grinches again. Uh -oh. We uh -oh, require we receipt. Well, I mean, Social Security has asked for them. Right. So, right. And I've also had state Medicaid agencies ask we for all We tell them the to receipts. keep them. We, we have them. We'll, we'll send them an envelope, a large manila envelope, and say, put the receipt in here. If we need yep. it, we want to be able to get it. So yeah, we do have them keep it. Yeah, don't get me wrong. We, we, we ask for documentation, and we're, we're very firm about it. There are certain situations where you can very easy, it's very easily identifiable on, uh, without having to make them go through the, through the motions. So. Okay, now Linda did say one thing I want to follow up on. Okay, so you see the true link statement. And all you see are cigarettes and lottery tickets. Oh, yeah, alcohol. Let's throw okay, that well, in we too. do have a somewhat liberal alcohol policy. <laughs> 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 we permit no, it for special occasions, one bottle, if you're having an That's anniversary liberal. or a. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we, uh, we can block TrueLink for um, lottery, and we would not permit that. Um, but yeah, we do buy cigarettes. We do. We do, too. People smoke. <laughs> hey, good answer. All right, here's one that came out as kind of related to the porn thing, but it's one I really hadn't run into before. And I don't think in any of the states we've seen a request for approval of this kind of disbursement. Prostitution. I've never run across prostitution personally or professionally. <laughs> <laughs> we have seen... You we haven't have, been to Mobile, Alabama, have you? <laughs> <laughs> I hear it's prevalent in Michigan. <laughs> really? Okay. <laughs> um, we have had requests for... A uh, stripper for an 18th birthday. Really? Okay. And what happened? It was satisfied. <laughs> so it was, it was approved? <laughs> I didn't say it was satisfying. I'm not going there. <laughs> I said it, the request was satisfied. Um, it, was a, it was a young man. I, was, I, was, I started talking about this with David earlier, McGuffey. Um, it's my very first special needs trust. Yeah. Very first account. And I'd seen this then kid grow up. Okay, okay? so it's um, it had been fourteen years. And now you have to understand that Bill keeps a whiteboard in his office where he has all kinds of photographs of all of his various beneficiaries. Thanks, Bill. <laughs> um, but the. Uh, so he, he had transitioned into a personal care residence, which was the best thing for him. His, his parents were not, um, did not provide a very healthy environment. And the other people who were running this personal care home, when he was turning of age, they wanted to get him a stripper. And, you know, legal. Soul benefit, birthday. I mean, he's a kid. He's 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 uh, paralyzed from the neck down. Um, he asked for it also. Okay. So it wasn't just them asking for him. I wanted to make sure that he was on board with this. Um. And yeah, we we fulfilled okay. that request. Well, well, let's let's ask Mrs. Vader here, um, Linda. Oh. <laughs> well. I don't believe we've ever had that request. The closest thing we did have was from a woman in New York City who lived in a group home, and she asked for a hotel room um, 
one, two nights a month because she wanted some privacy out of the group home and she needed to study for her schoolwork. We decided that was perfectly legitimate. We weren't sure whether it was sole benefit or not, but we did get her a hotel room for a couple nights a month okay. on a regular right. basis. Bill? Okay. Earlier this year, I sent a guy out to the chicken ranch outside of, outside of Las Vegas, and I paid for it. And okay. And he's a mentally competent adult who's in a wheelchair, and I don't know if you'll think this is as funny as I do, but my trust administrator, who's a lady, <laughs> really got into this whole project of ours. She went on the website for the chicken ranch, and she looked at all the ladies that were available, and she found out that two of them specialize in taking care of disabled individuals. And so she called him up, and she talked to a lady named Brandy, and they, <laughs> they organized the now, whole you, thing. You're sure it wasn't Bambi, it was Brandy. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was Brandy. Okay. Yeah. It made me totally forget what I was going to ask you guys. <laughs> um, no, I know what it is, because this, this is a real case. And this came from a state in which we do not offer trust services. But states have heard about what we've been doing in the various states, and it was really interesting. I think I got a call from the Medicaid agency about this. They were having a real struggle with it. Young lady who was in a personal care home, okay, and she wanted to be outdoors, but there really was not a good outdoor area at this personal care home. But it was designed around a courtyard. So the trustee of the Special Needs Trust, who was a family member, wanted to have a gazebo built in the courtyard so the beneficiary could enjoy it. Okay? I think you can see where the Medicaid agency was coming from. But they're like, but this is a big expenditure from this trust, and you have all these other people who are going to be using it. That's really tough. We, a similar situation to that that we had was a person in a nursing home, a younger person who was much younger than most of the residents and wanted a large screen TV and some other electronic equipment that we were fairly certain was going into the lounge area for the rest of the residents. We did because it was compelling. Um, we talked to the staff, we talked to, I believe there was a care manager involved in that one as well, and they just really felt that it would be a good use and would bring her pleasure to be able to be out of her room and to be in the common area and to be able to watch movies. And I would take into consideration the size of the trust and can, you know, is, if it's a $50,000, $75,000, $80,000 trust, no, I'm not going to even ask about a building one. a gazebo. And uh, Donna, it was in your jurisdiction. Yeah, but if it's... If there's enough funds there to justify it, and and there's that's their way of getting outside and enjoying it, um, I, I would strongly consider that. I've we have ran into people being at personal care homes, uh, a, a young beneficiary uh, who wanted internet, and they didn't have it at the home. And uh, so you know, there's there's lots of situations like that where you know she doesn't go anywhere unless someone takes her. Um, she's got an iPad, but and she's at a place with no internet. So again, I, I'm going to weigh that against how, how big is the trust. And if someone else is getting benefit on the side, you know, I'm looking at my beneficiary and is it benefiting them in that okay. situation? Depending on the situation, I'd want to try and uh, get a case manager's input or a doctor's note if it was... Um, or, or doctor could come in any form, whether it's a medical doctor, psychological doctor, what have you, um, where you know it was very clear that uh, for the health and well-being, physical, mental, or otherwise, emotional, um, that having some type of arrangement where the individual could sit out and gaze upon yonder pastures, um, that it would be, I, I could make a case for it. You know, it's funny, the state wasn't particularly happy about it, but these were the conversations that I had with them, you know, because where they were is they were stuck on the sole benefit rule. So we talked about it, and during the conversation, it was interesting, talking to the lady, I said, well, you know, if you think about it, this is something that is really for the benefit of this beneficiary, 
It's just that this particular beneficiary just happens to be in a setting where it would be available to other people, but it certainly is not intended to be that way. We would, they eventually approved it, by the way. We, we would charge the parents rent to sit on the gazebo. Oh, okay, good. All right. <laughs> that sounds like a Linda Byler. Uh, yes. Hey there, I have a question. I'm kind of surprised it hasn't come up. I have two files where young adult male cognitively impaired uh, wards, their parents are the trustees of the Special Needs Trust and are initially agreed to pay for on-site dating, uh, coupons, tokens, prescription, you know, memberships. In both cases, the allowance of that led to predatory behavior on the part of the ladies that their sons met online. Uh, the ladies would pick the sons up, take them elsewhere, bad things then happen. And so I would be interested to hear, does anybody else, are you having these difficulties? And in both cases, my parent trustees are now trapped, having given permission and not really anticipated uh, terrible outcomes. The closest that I've come to that is having um, at-home caregivers um, start labeling household goods when the beneficiary was clearly going to pass away within the next month. And he would, um, depending on his mood, our beneficiary would change his mind on a daily basis as to who would get the personal effects that were remaining. And so we had, um, you know, I, I had to take that up obviously with the agency that the caregivers were working for because they would actually bring stickers and go and label what they were going to get when our, when our beneficiary died. And it turned into just a, a really horrible and very vulturous situation. Um, but that, that's, that's interesting. I can see how that would be the case. I mean, and, uh, predators are, are out there in all different scenarios just looking for opportunity and that's certainly an, op an opportunity for an opportunity. I've had caregivers have their family come and peek in the windows at night to scare beneficiaries to so that we would then pay the same family member who was peeking in the windows to do security around the house. So it was very creative, a very big scheme, and luckily, um, it, it, they were, they were um, too good to be true from the very beginning. So we kind of had our eye on them from the very beginning they walked into the house. And uh, within a month, they had developed that scheme, and you know we had them gone within a couple of months because it was pretty bad. And I've had a, a quadruple amputee who was a victim of internet um, predator. And, um, you know, I, I had a good relationship with her. She was 20, 21 years old, and, uh, you know, she actually told me about it. Oh, you got me stumped. I, we fortunately or I mean, we haven't had those issues. Now, I mean, obviously people prey on the beneficiaries, but it's usually the person standing in the room yelling at them, telling them what to ask for from their trust or something. It's pretty blatant. And so, you know, we don't, but those types of situations and even online dating, I don't think we've had any requests for that. Well, here's one I know is very common because I get calls about this all the time. The family members call you and tell you what the beneficiary wants. Okay. I'll be happy to address that. <laughs> <laughs> You're just going to say no, right? <laughs> well, we, uh, if I want to distinguish between competent adults and minor children or minor beneficiaries, but for competent adults, we will only speak or divulge information to the beneficiary themselves or to someone that they have authorized in writing to speak with us. So um, other people can call, we'll listen to them, but we won't. We won't engage with them. Now, with parents, um, if they're the natural, I mean, parents are natural guardians, so yes, we will talk with them. Um, in the case of a divorce, where the parents aren't living together, we usually ask for um, a custody order to prove you know, which parent is providing the support, and then that's the parent that we deal with. 
But we just feel like there's so much opportunity for fraud and for uh, people will call and say, I'm so-and-so's neighbor and he told me to call you and you know, write him a check for $1,000. Well, you know, we're, just, we're not going to go for that. So we make them sign in writing who they will permit us to speak with. And it changes frequently. Well, until last week, I always would ask the beneficiary what they wanted and needed from me, but I'm going to rethink that. But uh, I would echo exactly. It depends on the competency of the beneficiary, and, and that comes to visiting the beneficiary and knowing the caregivers and knowing what the beneficiary needs. Well, there, there's one naughty one I'd like us to get into before we get to the end of the, the program because it's one that's just been, been a lot of discussion about it for years. You get a call from the beneficiary, okay, either I'm in jail or I've been hit with a lien for past due child support. Well, the I'm in jail, it's really easy. You lost your benefits, so we can put money on your green dot card or send money to commissary, <laughs> which we will do. But the other one is, I, I don't know that I'm going to touch that one with so many elder law attorneys in the room. <laughs> Uh -huh. we, uh, we actually had a beneficiary in jail a couple months ago, and I knew he was there because I kept getting these collect phone calls from some county institution in Georgia, and you know my phone at the bank would, wouldn't let me accept them, and I could hear him you know, yelling, I'm in jail, and you know, accept the call, well, I couldn't. <laughs> so I got in touch with his sister and let her know he was in jail, and... Um, you know, we, um, he, he, uh, how did he put it? He, he knifed a man. And um, um, he, um, he actually did not want any trust money at the time. He was taking his, you know, I guess taking his chances with the public defender. And um, we did pay, I think it, it ended up eventually paying a retainer to an attorney who's, who's trying to get him off. He's on probation now. So, um, you know, we sent, we sent money and, you know, did what we could to help him. Did you have any reservation about paying legal fees? I did not. Okay. I did not. Bill? I would like for one of the attorneys in the room to create a jail trust <laughs> <laughs> so that we can make distributions to that trust. Um, yeah, we've got people that are in and out of jail often. I, um, okay. I mean, we, we, we've got a, we've got, I mean, we've got a, a, a large number of accounts and so you've got all different personalities and, you know, the one that I wrote down, I had a, you know, was writing down a list was legal services for one of our clients who was arrested for, for false imprisonment. Okay, it's a man, he has no arms, he has prosthetic arms, and he was arrested for taking a, a minor girl to his house and locking her in his bathroom. So we'll take it you know, a little, little step farther. And that was um, clearly very awful, but the document and through multiple committee discussions uh, resulted in, in paying for the legal services. Okay. Um, Have you been hit with the child support issue? I, I can't recall a situation where we've had child support come across our desks. Um, I, I would have to look it up. I'd have to do some research. I mean, I, I remember actually being at Stetson and the primary focus was on the child support, so I'd want to go back and revisit that. I, I don't simply don't have that answer off the top of my head. We I, have. Have you? Yeah. Okay. I love to see it in the court order, obviously. You know, if it's a, if it's a you know, self-settled personal injury suit, and everybody knows that this is outstanding. I love to see it in the court order that establishes the trust. That's ideal. Um, but most of the time, that's not what happens. And, you know, I've, I've, I've taken the perspective that the beneficiaries you know, if I, my beneficiary is in a position where they're going to go to jail if they're not paying it, um, I've paid it and kept them out of jail. Well, we distinguish between whether the beneficiary wants us to pay it. I, I think it's something that we really haven't been consistent on. I think there are cases where we have paid it. But at the moment, 
we, um, there is a, the beneficiary is the father, and there is a mother who's trying to invade the trust for, um, and it's in the courts right now, to, for uh, child support, claiming that the, you know, the father has the duty, he wa- had this big personal injury suit, and it all got put into trust, and some of that money should be available for his daughter. So we'll see what happens with the, with the court. Patty? So I, I have a couple comments about that. The first thing was, at least my personal experience is, is if they're in jail for short term, they don't lose their benefits. Sometimes their benefits do stay in place. So like if it was a DWI or something, a driving... Oh, yeah. No, I'm yeah. talking about people who are okay. there for years. Okay. So what we would frequently do is not pay for a lawyer if that's what they want. But a lot of my folks have um, medication they need. And the folks with the jail won't always make sure they have access to that. So we have paid for um, a caregiver to go and take the medication to them. And then if it was really an issue, the lawyer will assist in trying to get jail diversion services, which is a covered service under our um, MI waiver, which has really helped. Um, But I wanted to go to the question about the jail trust because... From my experience, all special needs trusts are exempt from being reached by the jail folks. So although you could put money in their phone thing, I mean, they it, can't it, reach it. It was more of a joke towards the commissary account. Okay. Cause you, but you can put in the commissary account. We do. Account. Okay. I was good. <laughs> I was a little nervous. Like, I'm like yeah, No, no, no. We do. I've been doing it all the time. What do you mean we can't do it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we are out of time. We are... Next break will be 10 minutes, and then we'll come back for the last session. Thank you. And we're going to have Bob Feckman and Al Secor and anyone else Bob drafted uh, up here. Uh, but we're, I'm also going to have the microphone, so we will, as we have so far, take your questions. Now. Because this is the last session, I want to make sure that we announce a couple of things. If you're wearing a lanyard, <coughs> we borrowed these lanyards from the Chattanooga Autism Clinic, so we need them back. There's a box by the door on the way out, and we'd ask that you drop those lanyards in the box. Uh, if you did not get your uh, certificate of attendance, uh, that's something you need, that you need to take with you. It was on the table. Uh, when you came in, what we need you to do is sign the sign-in sheet. You can take the uniform certificate of attendance with you. Uh, when you leave, feel free to take as much of the candy off of the centerpiece as you would like. Uh, if you don't take it, we just have to haul it back to my office. So feel, feel free to take as much as you'd like. And if you don't mind helping us out with this, after the session, if you have any empty cups or bottles on the table, uh, if you don't mind helping us get them to the trash cans, we would appreciate that. Without further ado, we are going to turn it over to our expert panel. Well, while Bill gets back up here, uh, I'd like to make a couple of comments as uh, David lets you know. Uh, I'm on both sides of this business. I uh, practiced law for a number of years and then uh, switched over and became a banker. Um, The first thing I guess I would say uh, from a point of view of best practices, uh, if you have never, uh, if you draft wills and trusts with trust provisions in them, and you have not taken that document and talked to the trustee you're going to, particularly professional trustees like us banks, and you haven't talked with us about how that trust operates, uh, you are making a serious mistake because what you think your trust means and what we do with it once you fund it uh, are like the North Pole and the South Pole, they're about that far apart. So the other thing I guess I would say, just a couple of things, one, in helping your clients, most all of you are draftsmen of special or trusts and wills and trusts and stuff, but you know, you need to network with your 
not with the rest of the lawyers in your community, there are a hell of a lot of lawyers who should never draft any document, will, trust, or anything else. And uh, I guess the last thing I'd say just in uh, a sort of an idea is uh, when you draft this document, let us see it. Let us see it preferably before you get it signed so that we can help you fine-tune it or help your clients understand what's in this document. You know, when I was in private practice, you know, clients, when I first started, we barely had automatic typewriters. Uh, we don't, certainly didn't have computers back then. And, you know, now we whip out 45-page documents because we can. And, of course, your clients always want to know, or my clients always want to know, well, can't you make this shorter? And I always said, yeah, if you'll tell me two things. They'll, their eyes light up like, oh, good. I said, well, if you'll tell me exactly when you're going to die and exactly what you're going to own and how you own it when you die, I can make this in one page. I've only ever had one death threat from somebody who was the beneficiary of one of my trusts, and it's kind of a funny story, so I'm going to tell it. Uh, he sent me a long fax, and the fax said over and over again, in his own handwriting, you have my money and I'm going to come and kill you. You have my money and I'm going to come and kill you. It was six or seven pages. And then at the very end he wrote, have a blessed day. <laughs> Which kind of took the sting out of the death threat. But it does make you realize that, especially in the case of the self-settled special needs trust, you're managing what somebody else sees as their money. And it is their money in the sense that they have a beneficial interest in it, but of course it's not their money for a whole bunch of reasons, including the fact that if it were their money, they'd lose all their public benefits. So the epiphany that I had some years ago, and it was actually pointed out to me by the trust director of the Ark of Indiana Master Trust a long time ago, but recognizing that, especially again in these self-settled special needs trust cases, you do not have this beneficiary signature on anything. Maybe in the D4C cases you do because they signed your joinder agreement, but in my D4A cases, got my signature as the trustee, and I have the judge's signature establishing the trust, but I do not have the beneficiary signature on anything. So I've started doing something, and I've been doing it for a long time. I call it a memorandum of understanding. And again, this was pointed out to me by the director of the Ark of Indiana Master Trust, which is our main D4C trust in Indiana. So those of you that are affiliated with pooled trust should think about this too if you're not already doing it. But like we talked about a trustee instruction letter earlier, and I think with that, that I keep adding paragraph after paragraph every time I have a new experience. It's like, don't eat the daisies. Did anybody read that book? Oh, yeah. uh, Mom, every time she leaves the kids, they do something else crazy, and so she leaves them a long list of things not to do when she's away from the house, and I think it was finally that when she had to say, don't eat the daisies, that she knew it was a bad problem. I'm the same way with my trustee instruction letters, and I'm that way with the memorandum of understanding. I'm learning new paragraphs to add to that memorandum of all, all the time. One of the things I've always put in there is the fact that I, as trustee, have complete and total discretion over the use of the trust funds and that there's nothing they can do to make me use those funds, especially for something that wouldn't be in their best interest. And I have a paragraph, something about how if I'm gonna buy a house or a car for them, we'll probably have to get approval from the court if it's a court-ordered trust, and if I have to do accountings. And I even added a paragraph, I realize this is actually in the D4A trust, but I added a paragraph reminding them that there's a payback to the state or states that provided Medicaid services, because I almost had a death threat over that issue when the beneficiary of the trust died and the mom was very, very, very angry that she wasn't gonna get the money. It was a relatively small trust. All the money was gonna go to the state of Indiana. And of course, we had had that conversation multiple times. The court established the trust. We'd had that conversation with the judge. And the trust has a paragraph in it that's all about the payback. I don't know whether she can read or not. But now I have all of my trust beneficiaries or their legal guardians or their parents if they're a minor 
sign this memorandum of understanding and I have their signature indicating that we've discussed these things and that they understand them. So I don't have any real witty stories like that. That was fantastic. Um, have a blessed day. Love it. Um, but when I look down at the notes that I've been writing throughout the day for the different aspects of today, um, if anybody found these, they would be so confused because I've gotten one section, weed and strippers, with memorandum of understanding in another part. Um, so if these ever got in the wrong hands, people would wonder what the, what, what's going on. Um, so I would say, um, you know, at the top of the house, uh, I, I will echo what's been sent, what's been said, um, in so much as uh, it pertains to the documents. Um, there's a lot of best practices that fiduciaries want to have in place, uh, and we all learn from one another. Um, I, I, I really appreciated hearing the memorandum of understanding as an example. Um, as, as trustees, one of the biggest things that we'd like to make sure that, that I would suggest doing is review the document in advance. You want to get your hands on it. You don't want it to be given to you, executed. You don't want it to receive something where you've already been appointed um, and then it's almost too late and it's just a matter of um, if, if you did not accept it, then uh, you're going to kind of ruin the deal, so to speak. Um, so having the opportunity to get your hands on that document in advance and really go through it with a fine-tooth comb because um, as fiduciaries, we are married to the terms. And if we accept it, then we accept it. And there's plenty of times that, go, that, that we'll be sitting around um, looking at a situation that's come up and we'll all look at each other and we said, who accepted this thing? Okay? And so, you know, it's, um, it's definitely a two-way street when we've got the attorneys that we're working with that are drafting these. If we have to go back and ask for a provision to be changed a little bit or add some language here or omit this or, you know, whatever the feedback may be, um, you know, I know that there's, there's definitely some pride of ownership that comes with the, on the drafting side uh, and that uh, there could be the sentiment of, you know, well, this document is perfect. How could you dare ask me to make any changes to this? Um, well, the experiences that we have um, lead us to making those suggestions for a reason. And so um, with all the open-mindedness that you could have, please entertain our request and let's discuss it um, so that we can get to a point where everybody's comfortable with the terms of the trust. Um, I, I've got the, the good fortune of working with attorneys all over the country and it's funny, you can see the personalities um, of the different uh, attorneys in different regions. Uh, and you know, once you hear that there's a case that you, or, you know, have an opportunity to get involved with, depending on the state, you can almost, you know, nail to the wall what's going to be the, uh, the, the interaction with, with the attorney. Um, so trying to set the, set the stage on the front end for that, um, in, in my estimation, is um, very important. Um, as we go through this, um, Discussion. I mean, I'll, I'll kick it off with just a couple of some of the best practices, you know, that just at a very high level. Um, communication is key. I think we'd all agree with that. Um, I'd be interested to hear, you know, the different, how you interpret that in terms of communication. Um, in our world, depletion scenarios are common. And communication on depleting trusts is critical. And I think we'd all agree with that. Um, you can avoid a lot of heartache and strife uh, by having ongoing dialogue early and often and documenting um, the, these different scenarios. Um, understanding the benefits, absolutely. Um, establishing budgets, you know, I'm, I can't see how out there because um, the lights are just, they're very dim. Uh, but uh, I want to get my hands on that budget uh, because I think that that's going to be much better. You know, I've got a good budget now, but that, that was, a, was a very good budget. Um, and, 
you know, as, as fiduciaries, we're always going to run into those situations where there's benefits in place and distribution requests are going to be made that will clearly impact benefits. And you've got to weigh um, those distributions against the impact of benefits, uh, as well as communicating that it's going to have the potential of impacting benefits and how you document that. So <clears throat> those are just a few that I wanted to kind of throw out. One of the things I think that uh, Bill's comment about the depleting trusts, um, my experience over the years has been that all trust beneficiaries think that no matter how they spend, God is going to come along periodically and refill their trust fund. Uh, so that, you know, as I used, usually say, you don't have a multi-million dollar lawsuit settlement trust because you had a hangnail. Uh, you got hurt pretty bad. And I was, this probably isn't so much from the trustee point of view, but from the you, you special need lawyers out there. You need to talk with the PI lawyers and get them off the hook of structured settlements and more into any of the special need trusts we, we talk about here because there's much more flexibility. Uh, if you let the money go out right to the beneficiary, uh, they will squander it in no time. Uh, there is a case out of Texas where the plaintiff's lawyer got sued for malpractice because he didn't put the money in trust. Uh, his malpractice case settled for $4 million, and I guarantee you that second lawyer uh, put, his, put that $4 million in trust. The other thing I'd say from a uh, lawyer point of view from this, and this may not be what you necessarily all want to hear, but if you have clients that are thinking about family member s serving as trustees, I strongly suggest to you, if you can get it done, that you have a family meeting with the parents, the prospective trustees, and you discuss in detail what's really involved in managing this disabled person's funds. One, you'll probably find that the, I mean, my experience has always been that, you know, parents never, they've kept little Johnny at home. They have no idea how expensive it is for little Johnny to be cared for when they're not, when he's not living with them. Uh, so one of the things it seems to me we need to do is have some discussion and maybe when we're talking about setting up that trust, some financial planning discussion about, well, mom, dad, can you qualify for some life insurance or something else to provide enough funds for little Johnny to be taken care of? So. I think there's a lot of stuff that the drafting lawyers can do to help us trustees, one, by hopefully helping you select a trustee like us, just not because we all like business, but just because we'll probably do a hell of a lot better job managing the money, taking care of the beneficiary, making sure that they don't spend money on stuff that's going to screw up their benefits. Uh, and. We're going to be there long after the parents are dead. Uh, may not be me sitting in the chair, may not be either of the bills, but there's somebody there at the bank that's going to take care of that beneficiary throughout his or her lifetime. I have a couple more items that I think will help you as trustee if, if you're the trustee, if you're not already doing these things. But another thing that I do, once I've got the trust all up and running, is I send them right away what I call my policies letter, and it's gotten to be five or six pages long, and it goes into a lot of detail about all my different policies on things, and just to name a few, like if you're going to buy a house or a car, we're probably going to have to petition the court, remember what it says in the memorandum of understanding, so you need to let me know in advance if you're even thinking about doing something like that, and then I have rules for we use the TrueLink card like a lot of the other trustees do, and I've got rules about that. I tell them in the policies letter I can't give them any cash, and we talk about in-kind support and maintenance if they're on SSI. I've got all these different policies in there right down to a reminder that 
Unlike the other trustees, I don't pay for tobacco, and I also don't pay for lottery tickets, and I don't, well, I do pay for prostitutes, it turns out, but I, <laughs> I, I don't pay for lottery tickets, and I don't pay for alcohol. So I've got all this stuff in the policy letter. I send that out once a year. Uh, so I send it initially, and then I send it once a year after that. And when I change a policy, I put that paragraph in a bold typeface that year so that if they're not really reading the whole letter, I hope that they will read those bold paragraphs and see what the new policies are. And then one of the things I ask for every year when I send out that policies letter, and I send them an envelope with a stamp and my address on it and everything, but I have another form that I call the Status of Public Benefits form. And I ask them to fill it out for me every year. I should probably do it more often because they're always going on and off of these benefits and they never tell me. You know how that is. So now I've got a form in my file for each of these people where they've signed every year, and I have them sign it, indicating what benefits they're on that year. And I've laid out the form to help people that don't really know because, I mean, how many of your trust beneficiaries know the difference between SSDI and SSI? Not very many, right? So I have a little paragraph explaining that. And then maybe they're getting the child disability benefits that used to be called the DAC benefits. Uh, they don't know how that relates to their public benefits like Medicaid. And so I've got questions about all of those. And then most importantly, at least in Indiana, I find that the Medicaid waiver can be a major victory for these families. One of the things that happens when the child is on a Medicaid waiver, the parent's assets and income doesn't count anymore for their Medicaid eligibility. It would if they were eligible for SSI, but a lot of these kids wouldn't be eligible for SSI anyway because their parents already make too much money or have too much money. But in the case of their Medicaid, with the Medicaid waiver, the parents can have money and they can make money. And that plays into something we talked about earlier because I can more easily pay a parent as a caregiver if it's not going to cause the child to lose their benefits because I'm paying the parents. So you might think about a policies letter every year. I'm thinking about having them sign that too, but I definitely have them sign the status of public benefits form. So it's, it's interesting. I mean, a lot of this, a lot of what was just said um, is I think there's a lot of commonality among fiduciaries. It's just a different approach, um, but it's all centered around setting expectations. Um, and going back again to communication. Um, <clears throat> for a lot of the families that we're working with, this is all very new to them. They don't know what they don't know. They have the expectation again, as everybody understands, this is their money. They, they're going to have access to it for any purpose at any time and for and, and, and in any amount um, without question and without rules and without you know, compliance with, with um, what the processes and procedures are, um, and and if you do not, then we're going to be on the phone with our attorney in a heartbeat, and we're going to have you removed as trustee because you're the most awful person in the world. Um, so trying to have the, 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 the conversations on the front end around the expectations of how this is going to work can help eliminate this, and it'll have to be reinforced over... Uh, you know, periodically, whenever people kind of step outside the bounds a little bit and kind of have to point back to that letter, hey, you remember when we sent this information? Well, this is one of those times that we talked about. We were going to bump heads a little bit. We knew we are going to, um, and here, here we are, but I'm sure that we can find our way through it. Um, you know, I, I, what we've really found um, a lot of value and in, in receptiveness from our from our clients um, is one, maintaining a good relationship with uh, the drafting attorney um, so that we can go back and ask questions. Um, I mean, there's having an understanding and admitting to yourself that you're not going to know everything, you're not going to understand everything, and that it takes a village of people to work in this industry. Um, is critical and if you don't recognize that then I think that you're setting yourself up not only for failure but a disservice to the beneficiary uh, and opening yourself up for liability so I mean I think that it's it's very important that um, you know as a, as a best practice to develop a robust network of professionals of all different types that serve in this industry 
um, so that you can do your level best and bring, bring the best and brightest to the situation. Um, and again, maintaining an open dialogue with the, uh, with the drafting attorney or even a network of attorneys, uh, depending on you know, where the case is, you're gonna have to reach out to different states anyways. So the more you can network uh, and, and build those relationships, I think is, is only gonna serve you in the long run. Um, but you know, finally, I'll, I'll, the thing that we see the most, and I know I touched on a little bit earlier, but um, the, the communication around the assets of the trust and the path that is, is going on. Um, you know, earlier in the day, I was talking about it being the, the, the biggest challenge of a fiduciary is trying to balance the, the needs of the individual and the distribution requests against the long-term um, long care needs, the longevity of the trust, and the life expectancy of the beneficiary. And that's one of the most difficult aspects of balance that, that fiduciaries have. And, you know, combine that with the perception that there's an unlimited pool of funds and the Lord's gonna bless my account when it's running out of money, um, which I have actually had that statement made to me. The Lord blessed my account. I said, no, that was a bank error. Do not spend the money. Do not spend the money. No, my friend told me that the Lord blessed her account and she told me that this is just the Lord blessing my account. This was a checking account, not a trust. Um, I said, I assure you, it is a mistake. And it was a large amount of money and it was definitely a bank error. Sure enough, she spent the money. Sure enough, two weeks later, um, it was tracked down. And sure enough, we had a very long conversation about that and had to figure out a solution. But that's a, that would have been better for the last session than this one. Um, communicating and documenting, documenting and putting together depletion scenarios if you do have, find yourself in a depleting trust situation, the earlier you can do that. I mean, if you're going to be exceeding 4% in distributions annually, that is kind of, you know, at least from what I've heard from other professionals and, and information I've received from uh, various investment managers, 4% is a general level of sustainability. No more than five. Are you including the administrative costs in that? I'm talking about distributions from the trust. Okay. And that combined with the administrative costs, um, you know, we're, we're, we try to look at four, no greater than five, in, in terms of being a sustainable amount. Um, when you have a trust that is $500,000 uh, with serious need, 4%, you can just chuck that out the window because it's never gonna be. And so it is critical to put together some information. Uh, we've got, uh, I've got the good fortune of having some excellent financial planning partners uh, within our organization that we can leverage our software to put together these depletion scenarios that will um, graphically, not only uh, will it graphically illustrate um, the going off the cliff, which really sends a message home, um, but it, it kind of gives that target um, at the end and opportunities for adjustment and the impact of what that adjustment will have. So it makes those conversations easier when you go into the family and you say, okay, look, we're gonna review the last year of distributions. We wanted to be here, we were here, your account's going here. And if we can kind of bring it down to here, then you have a better chance of, of staying flat. And while it's not, it's never gonna be perfect and you're never gonna, gonna be able to reduce those distributions, you're at least communicating that and then you can start developing those contingency plans as best as possible um, for when you, you're reaching that point. Let me ask you something that uh, Mr. Wright brought up. With many of our individuals that we're doing uh, long-term planning for, there are going to be points in their life where we have to make adjustments. They might be uh, moving from a situation where they're living with parents to living independently. And if you're thinking linear, in a linear fashion, 4%, how do you take into account the change in spending during those transition periods? So that's an excellent question. And fortunately, we've got um, modeling software that will 
It will allow us to enter the different assets that are being held in the portfolio so we can get a reasonable expectation of returns through Monte Carlo analysis that's going to run those various scenarios of, of investment returns. But then you can also um, plug in different scenarios in terms of those future uh, future changes, whether it's going to be uh, a lump sum distribution for the purchase of a van um, or an outlay for a home or improvements to the home um, or any other type of situation where there's going to be a, a change uh, in the norm. And you can work that in and get some reasonable level of conclusion around what that impact is going to have and then have the conversation with the families. Um, before those expenses hit so that we can if we've got to shift our course a little bit in preparation to absorb that type of hit down the road then so be it um, if the trust is uh, receiving a uh, is scheduled to receive a deferred annuity to, you know it hasn't kicked in but it will in another 15 years then it's well we got to tighten our belt a little bit now and we might be able to loosen our belt a little bit when that deferred annuity comes in um, but we'll just have to see and it's you know fortunately we, we've got that available to us and if you don't um, then I would suggest finding someone that does so that you can leverage their resources uh, and bring them into the fold so that you can get the information that's needed um, to give a, a, a very clear as clear as possible picture of what the future holds for the account and uh what Bill says is is important, and it's it's almost more important for us because the beneficiaries sort of never pay any attention. It's you know it's this inexhaustible supply of money, and you know those old bankers are just stingy old bankers. And but uh, the communication, the documentation of the fact that you've warned this beneficiary or the family that you're going to be at the end of the road here, uh, you know, probably before you are out of life, and that we're going to have to make some other arrangements for that. Uh, one other thing on the list of sort of best practices, as we talked about the first uh, or in the session about the uh, Howie session, um, one of the things I think all trustees ought to have is a very good list of resource persons and firms to do evaluations. Um, I, you know, I'm a lawyer. I've been a lawyer most of my life, uh, but I am not a doctor. I'm not a you know physical therapist or an occupational therapist or any of those things. You know, I can go visit my client and see that she's in a wheelchair and doesn't get around very long, very well, and she doesn't remember, remember stuff very well. Now, beyond that, what her needs are are something well beyond my capability as a trust officer. So it behooves the trustee to have those resources and get them on board early. As soon as you've got that trust uh, that's funded and you've got the beneficiary that you know has some uh, disability, you need to, the trustee needs to get out there, hire those professionals to do the evaluation. I've, we've got one where we're a court-appointed conservator, hired a care uh, coordinator, Bought my uh, we we just bought my lady a brand new wheelchair that's much more satisfactory than the one that she had in the she, and she's in a care facility. The other thing I guess I would say from the trustee point of view is just because they're in a care facility and one that that's well respected and generally considered to be a very good care facility. Don't simply rely on the fact that the care facility is there and you think they're doing a great job. With my care coordinator, we found out that the care coordinator, in addition to getting a better wheelchair, uh, rearranged this woman's uh, space in, her, in the care unit so it's much more accessible to her. 
checked up on medications. Uh, my lady doesn't really remember too well, although if she walked up or wheeled up to you and talked to her, you would think she's perfectly fine, except that 10 minutes later she wouldn't remember what she told you uh, 10 minutes ago. So you need to have those professionals, whether it be a corporate fiduciary like any of us, or even more so if it's a family trustee, somebody's got to do the evaluation of the beneficiary to really let you know what's involved, what, what levels of care do they really need, what other equipment, facilities, et cetera, are important to providing this beneficiary with a good, as good a quality of life as they can have. J.P. Morgan Chase's comment that they just didn't have the expertise, that's a crock of shit. Both of you guys for have, the for the record, both of you guys, both of you guys have mentioned structured settlement annuities at one point or another, and it made me think of a case I had recently. Just a couple of warnings to you about stupid things that I've done, but you know I've been doing these trusts for a long time, and I'm I'm making an effort to keep a better file on these structured settlement annuities for a couple of reasons. First of all, I had a case recently where the the beneficiary of the trust turned 18 and there was a structured settlement annuity that made his first payment at age 18 and I wasn't keeping track of this I didn't realize that the payment was going to go directly to her and that caused problems for us for a couple of reasons and not the not the least of which was the fact that her parents had their eye on that money coming in and they knew it was coming in they just hadn't told me and they had already planned on how they were going to spend it so getting that check from them and getting it into the trust was difficult. And then, of course, we had to go, in this case, it, the court was involved already, but we went back to the court and we got the payee on the future annuity payments changed, so I will receive those. Another problem we had is where I wasn't keeping track of the annuity payments that were supposed to be coming in by an automatic deposit into the trust account. And so we went some period of months with no payment coming in. When I finally figured out that the payment wasn't coming in, we looked into it, and the bank had been making the, the deposit into the wrong account. Some lucky couple in Cleveland was getting the money instead. The Lord blessed them. <laughs> they, <laughs> they did. They the did. Lord blessed their account. And uh, all I know is that when the bank went to get the money out of their account, it wasn't there anymore. So. So the insurance company had to pay us that extra money because they had made the mistake. But it's just something to keep an eye on. And then one other thing about structured settlement annuities, if you don't know this, for somebody who has a lot of medical problems, when they go to evaluate the structured settlement annuity, the insurance company is placing a bet on how long they're going to live. And you can take this information or leave it as completely up to you, but I find the insurance company's bet to be interesting to me when I'm thinking about how quickly we can afford to spend this money. So it may be a 20-year-old, but if the insurance company thinks they're only going to live for another 20 years, that's going to be a much different scenario for me as the trustee than if I think they're going to live to be 80-plus like your average person. So you might take a look at those structured settlement annuity policies and communicate with the insurance company about what their idea of the life expectancy was. And, and speaking of the structured settlement stuff, one of the things if you are, as a lawyer, if you'll go out and talk to your PI uh, buddies, one of the things that needs to be focused on if, if you can't convince them just to get the whole lump sum put in trust to start off with, not as a structured settlement, but just, you know, $3 million for the fact that your dump truck ran over my person. Um, think about working with that uh, PI lawyer to make sure that there's a pretty substantial sum on the front side, you know, the idea that they're going to get three or four thousand dollars a month uh, sounds wonderful, but they, you know, the injured person needs a fifty thousand dollar medical treatment that's not covered by the Medicaid, Medicare, or something like that. Well, 
all of a sudden, you know, you don't have $50,000 sitting in your trust because you're getting four grand a month. Uh, and the first big lump isn't coming until they're 25 years old or something. So structured settlements are designed by the insurance company to benefit them, not the beneficiary. I wonder what Hal thinks about this. Maybe you'd weigh in on it. I talk to financial planners all the time about these structured settlement annuities, and the best comparison that, that I've heard from multiple financial planners is that the structured settlement annuity is comparable to the bond portion of your portfolio. So you would say, okay, I've got a five-year-old child. The personal injury attorney wants to put 95% of the money in the structured settlement annuity. Would that be a good idea from the investment perspective? Of course not. But would you use that comparison that I've heard so many times before about the bond portion of the portfolio? I'm not really competent, I don't think, to deal in this area. When I, uh, I've never actually took a client with a structured settlement because there's a colleague of mine or a friend of mine in Colorado that could do much, more, m much better than that. But the, I have reviewed two life plans and a structured settlement because the client came to me after the settlement. And what I found was left out was uh, all the medical needs were addressed but not quality of life needs. On the other side of the coin, I am not competent to do the medical plan for someone who's medically challenged. Is not the profession that does that well is the nurse life care planners. And that's one reason I don't do medically challenged clients is I'm not competent to. And where I've encountered nurse life care planners is in the world of uh, uh, tort lawsuits, property settlements. But to answer your question directly, uh, Bob, I, I don't think I'm qualified to really comment to that. But uh, I, I was out when you were, took the stage, so I didn't hear you introduce, but you made a good comment that used to frustrate the heck out of me as a parent. What we needed as parents was a yellow pages of resources, and, there's, and that's not out there. I wanted to be able to look up uh, who were the life coaches in my community, or who are the, uh, uh, the companies that provide residential support. That is something that parents so much want, is resources. They want to know where to go. They want to know who to talk to. And, and that's a real, uh, that's one reason why some communities have disability navigators. The role of a disability ma navigator is to get somebody to the person that can provide the help needed. And, um, you know, that's, we still need to work on that as communities. No, I, I would definitely agree on that last point in that um, it's more than just investment management and in, in trust administration. You have got to... If you are going to be a successful trustee, um, I think it's in your best interest to go and build a very robust network of as many different providers and types of providers um, as possible. Um, because you're, you're absolutely right. The, the vast majority of the parents that I encounter, um, that is what they are craving for, is resources. They're overwhelmed and overburdened and to be able to bring something to them to help ease that burden uh, is very welcome. And oftentimes, um, in our world, on the, the investments are secondary to being able to um, ease that burden. It's not that they're not important, it's just that they are typically not as important um, because that's a, uh, the, the resources and the ability to provide that relief valve um, is something that can be felt every day and setting the expectations on the investments front um, in terms of you know long-term investment strategy etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, you know that's that's where we've really added value I the other thing I guess I'd say uh, is as part of the planning and maybe one of the um, reasons that I suggest getting the client in front of the trustee as well as along with the lawyer is we have so we're sort of in the ugly position of we've been down this road before many many times we we probably know better 
what that parent is going to ex parent or that beneficiary is going to expect long term, and we can ask some of those questions. Um, I mentioned about if you're not going to have a corporate trustee, or even if you're just thinking about a corporate trustee, and you're going to, it's us versus a family member. You know, I don't have a bit of problem sitting there with the client and saying, well, you know, tell me about your daughter that you think is going to take care of your handicapped daughter. Uh, you know, is she married? Does she have kids? Uh, does she have a job? Does she really have time to take, in other words, you've devoted your whole life to your handicapped child. Your daughter's got a family. What about, you know, what does is, what is your daughter's spouse feel about having your handicapped adult female in the house who may have a bunch of issues? I've had lots of clients with all sorts of issues that could be very disruptive to the family. So there are a lot of uh, things like, is the family member really appropriate as a trustee? Is a family member really appropriate as the caregiver providing a home for your disabled beneficiary? Because in lots of cases, the answer to that is no, no, no. And just because you think, uh, as the parent, that everybody gets along and everybody loves little Janie who's not, uh, not all together, uh, doesn't mean that that other family, that ch other child wants to take over managing that child, finances, all the other issues. And again, I think we as professional trustees have the ability to ask some of those questions because we've done it. We've seen it. We know what the heck's going on. Uh, you know, the family members are absorbed with taking care of the family member that isn't fully there. Is that a couple of questions or comments on annuities as a credential planner? Um, I would offer a couple things, whether it's a structured settlement or not. My observation is there's some pretty biased uh, opinions about annuities in the world. Some, some people are annuity happy, and some people are adamantly anti-annuity. <clears throat> so I think the important thing is, you've got to step back and say, what are, we t what are we trying to accomplish, and what's the right tool for the job? Sometimes the annuity would be appropriate. Other times, it's like trying to loosen a bolt with a Phillips set screwdriver. You know, it's just not the right tool. It's, it's not the right decision to make. So I think you got to keep that in mind. Uh, the other thing is that the annuity is only as good as the credit quality of the insurance company that's issuing it. <clears throat> and if you're looking at a child that is a medical malpractice suit when they were born, and they're not going to die in the next few years, you got to step back and say, are these guys going to be around the pay over the life expectancy of this kid? And, you know, there's been numerous times when insurance companies have fallen on hard times. Generally, somebody in the industry, the NAIC will cajole other people in the buy in the company and keep everybody solvent and, and, and the bills get paid. But, you know, there's things that are disconcerting, like you get an annuity from General Electric capital, it morphs into gen worth, and all of a sudden the credit ratings go down. And you may be holding a piece of paper that you would not embark on and buy today. The, uh, the last thing is that I think you're on the mark about, it, you could describe it as a bond, because it's, it's a promised um, string of payments. But for, you look at the age and the, the expenses that might need to be made, um, unless you want to fo follow similar to statutory requirements for conservatorships um, and have a bond, albeit maybe not a treasury bond or FDIC insured, um, probably an investment professional would make a different decision than 95% fixed income. So I think you need to step back and say, well, 
do we just want to let the um, you know the payer to be off the hook and buy the annuity and have some kind of comfort as far as knowing that it's going to get paid and they're not going to you know run off with the money and do silly things that we don't want them to do um, that may not be the best option for the beneficiary you know following up on that I and and a comment that you made Al um, I have turned down trust cases before <clears throat> if so much of the money is in the structured settlement annuity that we're not going to have the money necessary to pay for the things that we're going to need to pay for over let's say the next 20 years because I'm probably only going to practice law for another 20 years I don't want to have this angst with the family for the next 20 years because there's no money to pay for anything they need so you know I don't know who ends up being the trustee of a case if I say I won't but you got to pick and choose those cases that you feel comfortable with and and, and we've got a hand in the back she'll do it yeah, <laughs> Um, I just wanted to add to what Hal said, I think, is that um, if, if you act as a trustee or represent trustees or work with parents or siblings of people with disabilities, I think it's incumbent upon you to have something similar to what you said, which is a benefit checklist. Here are the major benefits. Here's how you get them. And do you have this? And if you don't have it, here's how you get it. You know, and I use ours is very long um, because we have a lot of local things, like we have local prescription drug coverages, we have local programs for seniors and people with disabilities that the municipalities do. So I have this pretty lengthy checklist that I then give the trustee or the family to fill out. But then I also use that to refer back to. So when they call, so for example, if they call for dental, dental is a real problem for us frequently because if our state runs out of money, they cut state plan dental services. The problem with that is that's the only thing that everybody hears in the media, but our waivers don't cut dental, and our waivers also will call cover sedation and or a hospitalization if it's necessary in order to provide dental services for people. So you have to be very specific before you pay for a distribution to know what kind of benefits are. And if you think it's hard getting a beneficiary to know the difference between SSI and SSDI, try to t get what Medicaid program they're on, especially now we have expansion Medicaid as well. So I would encourage all of us to share that information. I would love to see your letter that you have them sign off on, and let's try to share that so that we are improve the quality of the information we get. But I also would encourage us all on our own websites or resource lists to create that robust referral list and give that to the families. If you're having a special ed issue, here's some special ed lawyers or advocates we've worked before who might be able to help you with this dispute. If you have someone who is a child who is opposition, op op I can't say the word. Fake oppositional defiant disorder, something my mother accused me of a lot when I was younger. Um, <laughs> and so you got in trouble with authority a lot. Um, you, you could get someone who could help interact with the school district so you don't get suspended because it's really a consequence of your disability and that kind of thing. So I just wanted to encourage everybody to share that information. And I would love to see the letter where you have them sign off because I would love to have them tell me yes, this is what I have, and I sign it, because if I find out later, and I made a decision based on what they told me, and I paid for dental when I really shouldn't have, then I feel I have some cover. So thank yeah, you. That, that is um, specifically why it exists. I mean, when we've got the, the, the requests that come in, and you know it's needed. It's, it, it's clear, it's obvious that it's needed, and it's clear and obvious that they don't have funds for themselves to pay for it. Um, no matter how much you tell them about parental obligation of support, um, that's, those are just words that evaporate once they come out of your mouth. And, it, you know, so trying to cover bases, because unfortunately there has been the liability claim that comes back saying, my trust is gone, how, why, did you give it, why did you give us the money? You know, and that's, and, and those, those are not small lawsuits. Not small claims. They'll never see it. They'll never see a courtroom. Those will never see a courtroom. 
Just so people know, for dental work in the metro Atlanta area, there is some very good free dental clinics available to this population. So if you need more information about that, let me know. I work with a lot of dentists as well. You know, I, I don't know if this is what you're talking about, but you just made me think of something that happened in my office recently. We had a trust beneficiary who needed a whole lot of dental work. I think it was going to be $10,000 or more. <clears throat> and having just been through an experience with my wife where she needed a dental implant and she went on one of these prepaid dental plans, it saved us a whole lot of money. So I suggested this to the trust beneficiary and I think they ended up paying less than $1,500 for this $10,000 worth of dental work plus the premium of $120 for the year of the prepaid dental plan. So just accumulating these kinds of ideas and you can just throw your ore in or whatever you could put, put your ore in on these cases and sometimes save these people money. And then they love you even when you say no. <laughs> so is there, from, a, from the drafting attorney standpoint, is there a wish list of things you want fiduciaries to be cognizant of to to do better at to I know I mean I know it's a that's a that's a loaded question um, but I mean we're, we're sitting up here saying all the things that that we do and what we like in our best practices but I think we all improve if we understand how to play better in the sandbox I I would have one wish list you spoke about communication being important going to the trustee but it's also important coming back to the drafting attorney it wasn't that long ago that I was getting the equivalent of those death threats because I had the audacity to refer someone into a situation where they had a trust. We ended up helping them get to a different trustee after the then trustee was refusing to pay for sneakers and you know, school clothes and books and things that you would expect a special needs trust should pay for, and yet their customer service was so poor that I was getting the calls. You had a question? Well, uh -huh. I, 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 maybe just the, the sort of idea is for the drafting attorneys, you know, you need to talk to the banks in your area and find out, you know, which ones uh, actually understand what a special need trust is. Uh, uh, do you know? It's sort of it's sort of like the surgeon that you you know go to for your heart transplant. Uh, you don't want to go to the guy that's doing the first heart transplant he's ever done. Uh, you'd like to go to the guy that's done 500 of them and really knows what's going on. Well, you know, we banks are no different than. You lawyers, except for some of the ones that advertise in the Yellow Pages in Chattanooga that will uh, defend you for a murder, but also draft your will. Um, uh, you know, if they really will defend you for murder, don't let them draft your will. But I'm just saying, you know, there are banks that, like uh, SunTrust, Southeastern Trust, where we're in the business of dealing with special need trusts. You know, we know what we're doing. Uh, there are other banks in, in our area that may have one or two special need trusts, but it's not something they do on a daily, you know, on a da daily basis. So, again, just like, as I said before, the lawyers that don't do special need stuff all the time don't need to be drafting any of these documents. Uh, don't name the bank that doesn't do any special need trust work. Uh, well, this may have been a question for the previous session, but uh, we, I've had a client ask me if a trust can, any type of special needs trust, whether it's a self-settled or a third party, buy life insurance on a sibling or on a surviving parent. And I wasn't sure that this could be done. I think the answer to the question, to a certain extent, is what does the what does the document provide? You know, can you invest in that? Uh, 
One, of my, one concern would be, from <clears throat> at least my point of view, would be are we taking money, investing in a benefit in, in, in a policy that's not likely to benefit your beneficiary? Uh, could be. I mean, you might want to buy in a policy on the parent of the special need beneficiary so that when the parent dies, presumably ahead of the beneficiary, you can, you know, the sort of quasi-God coming along to fill up your trust. Uh, that might be... Or, that, or the grandparent. Yeah, a grandparent, parent. Well, and I think Patty mentioned this, didn't you? Uh, that when you're paying a parent as a caregiver, that's the perfect time to think about insurance for them because they're the caregiver. So if they die, the insurance money would certainly come in handy. I wonder if any of you have done what I've done. I've got one case where I'm paying for health insurance for the parent. I do that all the time. All right, David told me I got to have the last word. Just kidding. I just would like to know from those of you who work with um, banks, um, prior to, uh, I would say, 2008, if my clients had a trust that was, um, their funds were in the bank, we had an easier time securing a mortgage in the name of the trust. But since then, we've really had to struggle with that. I'm just wondering if either of you have been able to get your financial institution to uh, give a mortgage in the name of the trust. I will say that we do not get involved with mortgages in the name of trusts particularly special needs trust. I've done it, Patty, but only once. And I think it might have been before 2008. Is there some reason for that date? Okay. Well, the, 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 the basic answer is that a trust, you, if, if the bank makes a loan, uh, a, a mortgage loan to the trust, they can't sell that in the secondary market. So basically, the, tr the bank has to have some policy of they will make the mortgage loan and keep it in-house because the reason you can't get a bank to make a mortgage loan to a trust is the fact they can't sell it anywhere. Well, I think there's a host of issues that come with it. Um, I think there's conflict issues. Um, it, so we're sorry we can't pay for that therapy because we have to pay the mortgage and it's a it's a bank bank mortgage that doesn't play well um that that's a biggie i think we're getting the hook yeah so thank you everyone yes. thank you for coming the man in black has come <laughs> Thank you everyone for coming. I do want to thank my staff. My staff worked very hard to put this program on for you. If, if you liked this program, if you want to see a program like this again, uh, we would appreciate hearing from you. If there are things you think we can improve on, we'd also like to know that. You can send, send me an email or you can post uh, to the hashtag or uh, generally let people know. Um, it was our pleasure doing it. We enjoyed putting this on, and I thank you for coming. Um, as I said earlier, feel free to take as much candy off the table as you would like. Keeps us from having to haul at home. Uh, and if you can help us uh, with the uh, empty bottles and cans, that, that would be appreciated. Thank you very much. <laughs>